is touching the truth. In the vast expanse of the Starry River, a pair of eyes slowly opened. Transferred. Ryan remembered that he had been watching short videos just a moment ago, but he didn't anticipate that in the next moment, his surroundings would turn black, and he would then awaken in this mysterious place. Stars shimmered in the dark cosmos, and a myriad of colorful galaxies painted a stunning spectacle. However, Ryan noticed something peculiar, even though he was seemingly in the universe, he could breathe normally, and his body didn't experience any discomfort. At that moment, an emotionally synthesized mechanical voice chimed in. Host meets all criteria perfectly. Loading. Sky projection system activated. Ryan wore a perplexed expression. As if able to read Ryan's thoughts, the mechanical voice resounded once more. This system allows the host to connect to worlds of movies, television, including anime, sci-fi, and American comics, making characters watch clips featuring the host. Through this, you can harvest emotional value from various emotions like shock, panic, and sadness. The more emotional value gathered, the higher the host's evolution. Unlimited possibilities exist for the accomplishment of the Lord God. In just a few sentences, all the information was conveyed. Lord God. The sudden revelation left Ryan in utter astonishment. This wasn't just a cheat, it was a path to becoming a god. Soon, he composed himself and began contemplating which scenes to create. Before long, Ryan's eyes lit up. Since the goal was to gather diverse emotional values, the initial choice was clear. Ryan contemplated and settled on a title. Heavenly Powerhouses Chronicles, Top 10 Famous Death Scenes. Meanwhile, in different worlds. Pirate World. Sengoku, seated within the Marine Headquarters, abruptly halted the document he was reading. Simultaneously, Garp, seated across from him while munching on a rice crackers, suddenly looked up. After a brief exchange of glances, Sengoku furrowed his brows and spoke, You heard that too? What sort of devil fruit power is this? Communicating thoughts to others. Bizarre. Garp finished his snack in one bite, then pointed ahead, Whoa, seems like something news afoot. As he said that, a transparent screen materialized out of thin air. The words on it were peculiar and unfamiliar, yet both of them understood their meaning at once. Heavenly Powerhouses Chronicles, Top 10 Famous Death Scenes Sengoku frowned while Garp's interest was piqued. A similar scenario unfolded across various corners of the pirate world. Straw Hat Pirates Luffy, still in his teenage years, exclaimed with excitement, Wow, this looks so cool. Nami interjected from the side, You fool. If this is real, you're probably gonna be on that list, you idiot. Luffy rubbed his head and muttered under his breath, Nami, didn't you see? It's the strong ones who died. Zoro, observing from the sidelines, comprehended Luffy's emotions. In the Whitebeard Pirates, Whitebeard burst into laughter, Gura Gura Gura, I'm truly eager to see the deaths of heavenly powerhouses. Hope I make an appearance too. Somewhere on an island, Akainu's gaze turned sharp, death scenes. I'll be the one executing those pirates. Of course, some trembled with fear. Certain celestial dragons were horrified by the prospect of their names appearing. Others remained unaware, lost in their own worlds. Hokage World In the afterlife, though Uchiha Madara was taken aback, his expression remained composed. I certainly won't be in one of those famous death scenes. After a pause, he sighed. In his old age, death was inevitable. A pity. Yet, for the sake of his ultimate aspiration, such trivial matters merited only a sigh. On a mission led by Kakashi's team, Naruto jubilantly yelled from the water, Deaths of the strong will definitely have the most epic battles. Sasuke retorted, Idiot. Yet, a glimmer of hope gleamed in his eyes. Would there be a scene of him slaying that man? Little Sakura. Death frightened her, but Sasuke kun was so handsome. Hokage's office. Sarutobi Hiruzen furrowed his brows, an ominous premonition settling in his heart. Was there a death scene involving him? Or something else entirely? In the world of hunters, the Ant King Maruam's face was devoid of expression, his eyes devoid of emotion. Death is a consideration for lesser beings. 
my destiny is solely to rule. Soul Society. Aizen, perched atop Hueco Mundo, exuded the pride of a king in his eyes. Something intriguing has occurred. Simultaneously, in countless other worlds like the Demon Slayer world, the Akame Ga Kill world, the Inuyasha world, similar screens and sounds manifested. At that moment, numerous screens flickered in unison, displaying a countdown, 9, 8, 2, 1. Swish. The gray and white screen abruptly gave way to brightness, unveiling a new image the following second. Amidst flames, a youth with blonde hair and sharp features donning a brown uniform stood tall. His lips curved into a smile, eyes gleaming brightly. Heavenly Powerhouses Chronicles. Tenth place, Demon Slayer World, The Demise of Flame Hashira, Kaijuro Rengoku. Demon Slayer World Demon Slayer Core Headquarters. Mitsuri Kanroji, known as Love Hashira, with her long pink hair, knelt on the ground, tears streaming down her eyes, her composure shattered. Why is this happening? Although she was one of the Hashira, she had once been part of Rengoku, Kayajuro's step-sibling, before she became a Hashira. Kayajuro's father had taught her. Her flame-based breath of love had evolved from the flame-breathing technique. They had grown up as close as siblings. Seeing the first image, depicting Kayajuro's death, was a blow that her heart found hard to accept. Despite being a member of the Demon Slayer Corps, she had steeled herself for death, but this was too sudden. Kayajuro was also present. He walked over and gently patted Mitsuri's head. His eyes held no fear, and he spoke with a smile, I must have fallen in a fierce battle against demons. Mitsuri, there's no need for sadness. Seated on the porch, Oyakata-sama of the Ubuyashiki family wore an expressionless face, but his heart was heavy with sorrow. Another life was slipping away. Within the Rengoku family mansion, a man with a wild beard and unkempt hair slowly sat up. He was Kayajuro's father, the previous flame Hashira, Shinjuro Rengoku. Tears welled up in his eyes as he murmured, Ruka, is he going to join you as well? In the Infinity Castle, Muzan dressed in women's attire, was brimming with excitement. The demise of Kayajuro. This is only the beginning. The Demon Slayer Corps will fall, one and all. In the world of One Piece, Sengoku furrowed his brows, death caused by demons. Is it truly another world? And that young lad, his eyes hold unwavering determination and justice. Damn it! Has evil truly triumphed over justice? Screen transition, a speeding train starts moving, three teenagers rush to catch it and sneak aboard. Tanjiro at the Butterfly Mansion widened his eyes in disbelief, not expecting to see himself depicted in the scene. On the other hand, his companion, Zenitsu, had tears streaming down his face, his voice a mix of worry and tears as he wondered why he would take such a dangerous risk. Inasuk, in his excitement, clenched his fists and exclaimed, yeah, that's the spirit. Charge on, you pigs. Not long after, Rengoku Kayajuro appeared like a blazing flame. The three of them sat together, and Enmu devoured eleven lunch boxes in a row. In every world, powerful figures frowned simultaneously. Heh, what a glutton. Sasuke chuckled, disdain evident in his eyes. He looks like an average, slightly powerless individual. Wasn't this scene a bit off? Luffy scratched his head in puzzlement. A bit disappointing. Aizen's eyes drooped. Many had the same notion, while others were left baffled. Scene continues, the train began ticket inspection, but an underhanded scheme unleashed the blood demon art. Sleep now, and know no pain in your dreams. At the front of the carriage, one of the twelve Kazuki appeared, a twisted smile adorning his face. Is this the demon from that world? It seems feeble and repugnant. But to ordinary people, it might spell disaster. Sengoku's eyes bore an icy glare. A demon? Not a soul, but a being with unique abilities and traits. Their components would be invaluable. Orochimaru, from an underground lair, had eyes that burned with desire. Oh. So I'm the one who took down Kayajuro, huh? Lord Muzin, did you witness it? Enmu, one of the next in line, blushed. After Rengoku and the other three comrades fell asleep, four manipulated humans emerged, connecting them one on one using special ropes. In the ensuing dream, the core of Tanjiro's pure spirit connected with another person. 
Zenitsu fell into a trance with Nezuko, unable to break free. Inasuke dominated the dream as a boss, terrifying the intruders who entered. Within Rengoku's dream, the intruder found the spiritual core. Yet, just as the intruder prepared to destroy it, the body of Kaijuro, who lay asleep beyond the dream world, stirred and he rose, grabbing the young girl linked by the rope. Kaijuro was still asleep, but his instincts roused him to action. It's a good instinct, and it hints at his potential for greatness. Garp secretly nodded, recognizing the young lad's promise. Many from various worlds also nodded discreetly upon witnessing this, though their sentiments varied. Enmu, who hadn't yet ascended to become one of the lower moon, bore a brooding look, useless humans, you couldn't even find the core. Scene continues, the four escaped the dream unharmed. The carriage transformed, nightmares amalgamated, devouring the train as numerous fleshy tentacles emerged in the carriage. Rengoku Kayajuro wielded a flaming sword to protect the passengers, while Tanjiro and Inasuk confronted the demons. Fire, water, lightning. Weak as it may be, it's intriguing. Aizen finally displayed a modicum of interest. What a cool move. Naruto exclaimed with excitement. Tanjiro was repeatedly incapacitated by the blood demon art in his dreams, only to awaken through self-inflicted harm. This scene etched the young man into the hearts of many across the worlds. Even though it was an illusion, few could fathom mustering the courage to swing a blade at oneself without hesitation. At last, the two severed the head of one of the lower Kazuki, causing the train to overturn and halt. Tanjiro collapsed to the ground, blood oozing from his abdomen. Kayajuro began teaching the art of breathing to facilitate self-healing. In that moment, the ground quaked, and twin golden lights pierced the dust and smoke. As the haze dissipated, a short-haired demon, its muscles streamlined, emerged. Entwining, three. The potent aura radiated from the screen. Though it failed to phase someone like Sengoku and Aizen, it commanded their respect. However, newcomers like Naruto and Sasuke, fresh from graduation, felt the weight of the pressure. Boom! The earth trembled. The three Kazuki struck Tanjiro, who lay on the ground, with a ferocious blow. Suddenly, flames erupted, and a long blade ablaze with fire swept upward. The third of the entwining Kazuki withdrew, his right arm severed from palm to forearm. Yet, in the next instant, he nonchalantly fused it back together, leaving no trace of a scar. This kind of regenerative ability is something I desire more and more. Orochimaru extended his tongue and licked his lips, his eyes filled with greed. Swift regeneration. Or a similar capability. Aizen pondered thoughtfully, acknowledging that the other party's level wasn't of low caliber. Inside the butterfly estate, Tanjiro's forehead glistened with sweat, his anxiety palpable. Is this the pressure emitted by Kazuki? It's intense pressure. Zenitsu quivered, while Inasuke clenched his fists silently. Continuing the scene. Rengoku Kayajuro remarked, why attack those who can't move? Akaza wiped the remaining blood off his arm and calmly explained, I figured he'd hinder my conversation with you. That's all. Following that, Akaza tried to recruit Rengoku Kayajuro as a demon, only to be firmly declined. After introducing himself, Akaza elaborated, do you know why you can't reach the highest level? It's because you're not a demon. You can't attain eternal life. Otherwise, if you lack a hundred years, it will take two hundred. If you can't achieve it in two hundred, it'll take five hundred. Success will come eventually. Eternal life? Orochimaru was thoroughly excited, his body trembled, and he yearned to enter this world at that very moment. People across various realms were equally astonished. Even though their own world boasted higher power levels, the allure of immortality remained undeniable. To think a small world harbors secrets of immortality. I wish to conquer it. Exclaimed a certain blonde figure from a certain world. Rengoku Rengoku raised his long sword. I decline. Noticing a faint smile on Akaza's lips, he raised his hands. So be it. The technique unfolds. Destruction and slaying, rending flash. Suddenly, an icy crystal-like pattern gleamed beneath his feet, erupting with intense and rich demonial energy. A thunderous boom followed as the two figures clashed, stirring countless plumes of smoke. On screen, the figures became entirely indistinct. 
a cacophony of roars resonated as red and blue flashes darted like lightning in every direction. I underestimated it. The physical prowess is comparable to a jonin, if not stronger. And I doubt the flames on his blade are ordinary. Kakashi felt a tinge of fear. Judging by the opponent's speed, typical jonin techniques were nearly ineffective, unable to make contact. The power level of this world wasn't as low as initially thought. Whistling through the air, blocking, slashing, twisting and turning, each sought the other's weaknesses. The two perfectly showcased the essence of taijutsu. Breath of flame, form of stubbornness, dance of the sacred flame. Sudden surges of flames erupted from his blade, akin to a massive wave countering the transparent fists. Observing this, Akaza ceased his barrage and landed on the ground. In the next instant, Rengoku Rengoku traced a fiery arc, appearing before Akaza and slashing down with his blade. Thunderous, echoing booms resounded. Two colossal forces collided anew. Akaza paid no mind to using his fists against the razor-sharp blade, his third form, the breath of winding, showcasing remarkable regenerative abilities. If he were to study at the marines, he could become a vice-admiral. Sengoku lamented, wishing that such a noble individual would join their ranks. Akaza's eyes were a mix of complexity. Why not become a demon? Then the two of us could continue to clash. Continuing the scene, after dozens of exchanges, Akaza remained unfazed, whereas Rengoku started to falter. Anyone discerning could see their different constitutions. A demon's physique far exceeded that of a human. Rengoku did not yield, the flames from his breath of flame continued to surge towards Akaza. However, after a few rounds, Akaza punched Rengoku Kayajuro's left eye. Blood dripped as Rengoku Kayajuro's left eye lost sight entirely. Undeterred, he pressed on, relentlessly attacking. Breath of Flame, Five Forms, Flame Tiger. A fierce, fiery tiger materialized, roaring and lunging at Akaza. Destruction and killing, chaotic void. A massive explosion of icy blue demonual power manifested before Akaza, promptly neutralizing the flame tiger. The two collided in an instant, swords and fists interweaving before separating once more. The battle abruptly halted, the two stood opposite each other. In the world of demon slayers, Tanjiro leaped off his hospital bed, urgently crying out, Mr. Kayajuro. Run. Leave us behind. Within the demon slayer corps headquarters, Mitsuri was already sobbing. But Rengoku Kayajuro remained composed and unshaken, as if the person in the video wasn't himself. Inside Hueco Mundo, Aizen leaned on his hand, speaking lightly, Is this the victor? In the live stream, Naruto clenched his fists, wordless. So feeble, a mere failure. Kizaru murmured, eyes unmoving. Many were disappointed. Although the battle was exhilarating, it wasn't unexpected. But just then. Boom. Severely wounded, Rengoku ignited an immense aura again, flames enveloping him in a blaze of glory. It was like a sun bursting forth in the darkest night. Rengoku Kayajuro raised the sun-breathing sword once more. At that instant, his eyes ignited anew. That spark represented the absence of fear, a determination to triumph regardless of death. The music crescendoed. I am Flame Hashira, Rengoku Kayajuro. I shall fulfill my duty. None here shall perish. Breath of Flame, Profound Truth, Ninth Style, Rengoku. In the world of ninja, within the depths of the pure land. Uchiha Madara's eyes gleamed with admiration, yes, even with such a grave injury, you still possess audacity and mental vigor. You adopt an impeccable stance. I, Uchiha Madara, acknowledge you. In the One Piece world, Sengoku and Garp's eyes also sparkled. This young man is truly impressive. Indeed. That's the way to go. Overcome your opponent. Naruto brimming with vitality, cheered. Kakashi on the side shook his head discreetly. The outcome has been decided, this man is destined to fall. Yet, across various dimensions, many observers watched with approval. Though the power level in this world might be modest, the other side can undoubtedly be called mighty. Pure power alone is insufficient. Countless dimensions harbor potent abilities, but are these individuals truly formidable? No. 
Irrespective of being just or malevolent, true strength is derived solely from spirit, conviction, and heart. This marks the authentic source of one's might. The scene continues. Meanwhile, Akaza is also brimming with exhilaration. Akaza laughed heartily, that's it. This is the battle I've been anticipating. Destruction and Annihilation Extermination Style Flames akin to molten lava surged from the core of Rengoku Kayajuro. Legs, arms, and eyes. A deafening boom. Immense force erupted, causing the ground beneath the column of fire to shatter instantly. Rengoku's form vanished, and amid the rising flames, a roaring fire dragon hurtled towards Akaza. A continuous rumble echoed. Upon impact, the ground sank instantaneously, soil rolling like colossal waves. At the epicenter, akin to a sea of fire, Rengoku Kayajuro executed a resolute blow with unwavering conviction and unparalleled might. Akaza's eyes brimmed with frenetic exhilaration. Simultaneously, a punch imbued with potent ice-blue spiritual energy surged forth. In the ensuing second, Akaza's entire arm cleaved apart, the sunlit blade of flames persistently slashing at his body. Rengoku roared, mightier power surged from his being, the solar blade cleaved through the opponent's chest before inverting once more. Within the roar, flames erupted anew, giving rise to a fierce and fiery tornado that ascended into the sky. Curiosity pervaded, had this blow vanquished the adversary? The dust cleared, and the katana was lofted high in the grasp of Rengoku. Before him, Akaza's arm had fully regenerated, piercing through Rengoku's chest. As anticipated, I've fallen short. But it was a splendid battle. Aizen smiled, akin to one enjoying a satisfying spectacle. What a pity. Were it not for his physical constraints, the humans would have undoubtedly triumphed. Sengoku's gaze dimmed slightly. Damn demon. Naruto was already weeping at this point. Ant King Maruam, casually seated on the ground, gradually calmed, remarking, the human form is truly frail. Tanjiro couldn't fathom this scene where the demon wrecked havoc upon the world. Beside the overturned train, Tanjiro struggled to grasp the unfolding scene. At that moment, Akaza bellowed anxiously, turn into a demon. Hasten to announce your conversion into a demon. You're one of the select few strong ones. Become a demon. In becoming a demon, you evade death. What's reason for your refusal? Speak. Within this roar, Rengoku Kayajuro fell silent. Well, the juncture between life and death has arrived, suddenly becoming intriguing. Aizen sat up erect, his spirit soaring. Sengoku's gaze remained unflinching, he believed the figure before him would never assent. Orochimaru offered a wry smile. Hee hee, death is a profound terror. I speculate he'll opt to become a demon, thereby being pronounced dead in human terms. Impossible. Elder brother Kayajuro will never yield. Tanjiro's tear-filled eyes brimmed with resolute determination. While all secretly speculated, the scene abruptly reverted to the past. The scene shifts to daylight. A gentle breeze wafts, rustling wind chimes. Within a quaint abode, a graceful woman with ruby eyes akin to Kayajuro's uttered, Rengoku Kayajuro. Yes, mother. The lad, Kayajuro, sat up attentively. The woman spoke solemnly, you must ponder carefully, as your mother is about to pose a question. Do you comprehend why you possess greater strength than others at birth? The boy earnestly and clearly responded, I do not know, mother. The woman gazed at the boy intently, it is to aid those less fortunate than yourself. One endowed by nature with more aptitude than others must employ their power for the world and others, assisting the feeble at any juncture. Kayajuro, this is your duty as a stalwart individual. It is the mission you must fulfill throughout your life. You must never forget this. Gazing into his mother's eyes, the boy nodded solemnly, pledging his concurrence. In the subsequent moment, the woman enfolds the boy in her arms, profound compassion within her gaze, and utters, Mother's time is scarce, I fear. Yet I am immensely content to be the mother of a child as kind and powerful as you. Tears welled in the woman's crimson eyes, as if she imparted her final sentiments, I entrust the future to you. Tears filled the boy's identical eyes, a sense of disbelief mingled with restraint. He couldn't burden his mother with worry. Within another instant, the scene reverted. 
Kayajuro, who had grown feeble, bore blue veins in his hands. Faced with demise, he not only resisted succumbing but channeled every ounce of power into his actions. In the ensuing instant, the rose-red blade descended heavily upon Akaza's neck. Excellent choice. This situation is ripe for a clash that will lead to a fierce battle. What a commendable warrior. Aizen nodded from his throne. Go for it. Take him down. Naruto cheered, as though his shouts could grant the opponent strength. Whitebeard's eyes held admiration. It's a shame, he could have been my son. Very well. Sengoku concurred, with just one word carrying significant weight and gravity. It was a brief statement, but a weighty one, brimming with profound meaning. His eyes showed not pity or sadness, but acknowledgement and respect. Such individuals were a rarity in the entire pirate world. Even Garp, who was known for his stubbornness, sat up straight at that moment, acknowledging this person. In the world of hunters, the Ant King's expression shifted, and he murmured to himself, a wholly different human being. The sorrow of the demon slayers in the demon slayer core transformed into anger. In the Rengoku mansion, Rengoku Kayajuro's father stood up, a surge of pride emanating from him. He exclaimed, Kayajuro, my son, I'm proud of you. Your mother would be proud too. However, there were those who harbored disgust. It's mere stubborn resistance. The fight is already lost. Enmu sneered. On a rooftop under the moonlight, Akaza shook his head, disappointment evident in his eyes. Is this all you can muster in your final moments? What a shame, you were a worthy adversary. The scene continues. Akaza hadn't expected his opponent to still be capable of striking back. Nonetheless, he reacted instantly, tilting his head and firmly clamping down on the blade, preventing it from severing his head further. Simultaneously, he launched another punch, aiming for Rengoku Kayajuro's head. If you're not gonna be a demon, then die. Had that punch landed, Rengoku Kayajuro's head would have exploded. But in the next second, something unexpected occurred. Akaza was taken aback to find that his wrist was tightly held by his opponent, rendering him immobile. What is this? Akaza's golden eyes widened in shock and puzzlement. My right hand had fully pierced his chest, so how does he possess such incredible strength? In that moment, the corner of Akaza's eye caught a hint of brightening on the horizon. A look of terror overcame him. No, I need to finish him off swiftly. Yet, Akaza was horrified to realize that the arm impaled in his opponent's chest couldn't be withdrawn. He was immobilized. No. 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 Akaza's initial composure had vanished. His face contorted in extreme madness and panic. But regardless of his might, Kayajuro continued to hold his arm fast. He couldn't break free. In this moment, it wasn't only Akaza who was shocked, observers from other worlds also wore expressions of astonishment. To possess such strength in the face of impending death was astounding. What fearsome willpower and incredible conviction. Perceptions were heightened, even surpassing those of individuals much stronger than Rengoku himself. Even in the One Punch world, Saitama, who had been lying on his room and perusing discount posters in the supermarket, lifted his head, his eyes showing a hint of movement. And in that boiling moment, in the world of the ninjas. Fight, my friend. Fight until your last breath. Fight to the very end. Let your life bloom. Inside Kanoha village, Mike Guy blushed, nearly shouting with all his might. He then embraced Rock Lee tightly, tears streaming down his face. This was a warrior, a bond formed without ever meeting face to face. Kayajuro's eyes were bloodshot, his unwavering determination exuding immense strength. He roared, absolutely. I won't let go. As the sun began to rise, victory was within reach. In that moment, among the demon slayers in headquarters, Kayajuro clenched his fists, his heart resounding with one voice. That was himself on the screen. Don't release the grip. Absolutely not. Tanjiro staggered to his feet. He wished to aid, to sever Akaza's head. Meanwhile, Inasuk was roused by Tanjiro's shout. He dashed forward, leaped into the air, the serrated sun blade whirling as he aimed for Akaza's neck. Akaza had already noticed this turn of events. The threat of decapitation, the threat of the rising sun. Amid the shadow of death, his eyes grew wild. 
get away. Yet, Akaza's plea was futile. Instead, it fueled Kayajuro's strength further. The sun will knife cut through flesh and nearly severed Akaza's neck. Excruciating pain surged. In the next instant, Akaza snapped. He no longer exhibited the might of a strong individual, nor the honor of a warrior. He tore his arms away in a desperate bid. Inasuk's attack went in vain. Akaza ignored the sun blade embedded in his neck. He regenerated his arms and fled into the dark forest in a state of panic. Upper Moon No. Akaza vs. Flame Hashira Rengoku Kayajuro. Akaza fled. Heh, is this a demon? It's utterly ridiculous. Aizen's eyes were brimming with disdain, not even bothering to get angry. However, deep down, he had already recognized Kayajuro. If such an individual were in his own world, they'd undoubtedly be an immensely powerful captain, even in death. Trash, trash, trash. Zaraki Kenpachi shouted in fury. Initially intrigued by Akaza, he had wanted to engage in a brawl with him. But now, he found Akaza repulsive, like a stain on his vision. To fight amongst themselves felt like an affront to his very being. Boom! A building within the naval headquarters suddenly erupted, and an immensely powerful pressure descended upon them. As expected, a malevolent entity caring not for the dignity of strength. Sengoku stood up at this moment, eyes seething with anger. If he were in the world of pirates, he'd hunt down this entity to the ends of the earth. On the flip side, Luffy seethed with rage, his body seeming to burst, almost triggering his second gear prematurely. He pounded the deck, speechless. The Ant King lowered its gaze, looking at the earth below, and smirked condescendingly, a being inferior even to humans, how pathetically low. Why didn't you turn to ash from the start, gripped by your fear of death? Enmu, previously noisy, narrowed his eyes. They now glowed scarlet, his face stinging with a burning sensation. And beneath the moonlight, Akaza seemed to struggle with the unfolding scene. Blood surged within him, his muscles bulged, and his teeth rattled. The scene continued. Tanjiro's eyes burned with intensity at this sight. He chased after with all his might. He inhaled deeply, drawing in air through his mouth's corners. He harnessed the breath of Kagura, the god of fire, converting his inner fury into power. Boom! The sun blade blazed like a javelin through the air, striking Akaza's chest in an instant. However, the demon's heart was not a weak point. Akaza merely felt pain, withdrawing his long knife and continuing his flight. At that moment, Tanjiro's voice echoed through the deep forest, Don't flee. You cunning demon. Don't flee. Akaza turned back in surprise. He wore an expression of bewilderment. Frustration growled within. Flee. Am I running away? What absurd nonsense was that brat spouting, what sort of lunacy had gripped him? I did not flee on account of the demon slayer team, I fled from the sun. Moreover, the outcome was already decided, that guy was going to meet his demise. He would never admit defeat. In the next instant, without hesitation, Akaza plunged into the depths of darkness. As though he could hear Akaza's inner thoughts, Tanjiro cried out, regardless of the battle, the demon slayer team shall forever fight under the shroud of the night, in your favor. We are beings of flesh and blood. Injuries persist, our bodies do not heal instantaneously. Even the severing of limbs does not grant us swift recovery. Don't run away. Asshole. Coward. However, regardless of Tanjiro's roars, Akaza remained silent, vanishing without a trace. Heh, refusing to concede even in defeat. Truly unsightly. Brother Ming, presently villainous, laughed mockingly. While rebellious, cruel, merciless, and unscrupulous, one could not help but acknowledge Doflamingo's grandeur. He adhered to the law of the jungle, and even if he escaped, he would never stoop to shameless denial. Seated on his throne, Aizen smirked contemptuously, since you cower from the sun, then the sun is your adversary's ultimate weapon. Wouldn't your defeat be imminent as day breaks? How pitiful and pathetic! Within the ninja world, Naruto's eyes blazed red. It was as though he resonated with the sentiment, roaring in fury, damn it. You've lost. Brother Kayajuro safeguarded over 200 lives without losing a single one. He fulfilled his duty. 
he fought until the end, while you ran away in shame. Big Brother Kayajuro emerged victorious. With that declaration, Naruto clenched his fist, I'll always be proud of Kayajuro and strive to protect everyone just like he did. Kakashi, observing nearby, felt a warmth surge within him at this scene, melting his icy demeanor. Did Naruto truly think that way? This child bore such immense burdens from such a young age, yet still retained this spirit. The scene continued to unfold. Tears streamed down Tanjiro's face, while Inosuke, who had never cried before, quivered, struggling to hold back tears beneath his hood. Kayajuro knelt weakly, his gaze fixed on Tanjiro, who roared with a heartrending cry. His expression softened, and he spoke gently, ease your shouting. Hearing the voice, Tanjiro turned, facing Kayajuro's tender gaze, and he heard, your stomach wound could reopen, your injury is not light. Even at death's door, Kayajuro displayed genuine concern for others. Come, approach me, there's something I must impart before the end. Tanjiro's eyes brimmed with tears as he obediently complied. Then, Kayajuro calmly elucidated that Tanjiro could find clues about fire breathing within his home. Time elapsed, the sun ascended, and the arm of Akaza, embedded in Kayajuro's chest, crumbled into ash beneath sunlight's touch. Without obstruction, torrents of blood suddenly surged from Kayajuro's chest. Seeing this, Tanjiro felt lost and panicked, desiring for Kayajuro to halt the bleeding using his breathing techniques. Kayajuro shook his head, fear absent from his eyes, as he calmly spoke, time eludes me, let me utter my final words. Instruct my younger brother Senjuro to heed his heart, to tread the path he deems righteous. Also, implore my father to prioritize self-care. Within the Rengoku manor, Kayajuro's father recalled his distant relationship with his son, estranged due to his disease. Unable to hold back, he succumbed to tears, his murmurs incessant, You don't hate me, do you? Please tell me you don't. Finally, he sank to his knees, crying out loud, I'm sorry, my child. Furthermore, Tanjiro, I recognize your sister as a member of the Demon Slayer Corps. I witnessed she shed blood for humans on the train, risking her life to battle demons. In the real world, all Demon Slayer team members affirmed the girl's status. All saw her bleeding for humanity's sake. Stand tall, live on, no matter how often your weaknesses assail you. Ignite your heart, grit your teeth, and march forward. Stagnation grants no reprieve, time waits for none. Kyojuru gazed into Tanjiro's eyes, a soft smile on his lips, pay no mind to my demise here, if I am a Hashira, naturally I'd be a shield for the younger generation. Henceforth, you must become the pillars that uphold the Demon Slayer Corps. I, I believe in you. In the Demon Slayer Corps, mournful of Kayajuro's death Mitsuri clasped her hands, weeping without end. The other Hashiras too stood solemnly. This was Kayajuro's legacy to the youth. After these words, Kayajuro was spent. Hazy, he seemed to glimpse a familiar figure, his half-shut eyes widening. A woman, faintly luminous, emerged, it was Kayajuro's long-deceased mother. Sad, gentle music played. Rengoku Kayajuro's voice joined in, Mother, Mother. Have I fulfilled all my responsibilities? Have I undertaken all I should and practiced all I must? In this moment, Rengoku Kayajuro resembled a child, addressing his mother with a blend of nervousness and hope. Had he lived up to her expectations? The woman's eyes brimmed with compassion, and she nodded, offering a gentle smile, Kayajuro, you've done splendidly. Hearing his mother's validation, Rengoku Kayajuro's heart soared. He beamed with joy before slowly lowering his head. Hopeful music played, within the cool breeze, amidst the warm first light of dawn, having illuminated the entire night, Kayajuro Rengoku Kayajuro departed with a dawn-tinged smile. At that moment, a comment to Rengoku Kayajuro appeared on the screen. Rengoku Kayajuro is truly deserving of the Hashira title. Some join the Demon Slayer Corps to save their lives, while others seek revenge. But Rengoku Kayajuro joined the Corps to aid others. He upholds justice in his heart, unwavering against the world's influences. He is passionate, considerate, and generous with his praise. His life has been dedicated to following his mother's teachings, ultimately sacrificing for the moral principle of protecting the weak with strength. His life is lived with brightness and righteousness, no regrets carried into the afterlife. 
Within the butterfly estate, Tanjiro's eyes welled with tears. He vividly recalled the time when, at the Nine Hashira's meeting, he had uttered the words, I wish to defeat the demon Muzan Kibutsuji. Most of the Hashiras had either dismissed it or responded with mockery and laughter. Only Flame Hashira, known as Rengoku Kayajuro, had responded with a sincere smile, saying, Excellent. Boom! Suddenly, a pig's head crashed into Tanjiro's forehead, causing him to stagger back a few steps. Inasuk shook his own head, then wisely approached and grasped Tanjiro's collar, shouting, You fool, what's done is in the future, we'll have another chance. Train, train with all your might. As the door swung open, the three pairs of eyes lit up. It was Shinobu Kocho. Shinobu Kocho stood at the threshold, her purple eyes scanning the room before revealing a mischievous grin. Come on, I've designed specialized training for you, free of charge. In the world of One Piece, Sengoku removed his cloak with the word, Justice, on it. With a solemn expression, he carefully folded the cloak and spoke slowly, a person's worth isn't solely determined by their strength, but by their actions in life and the strength of their heart. Even when some people pass away, the spirit they leave behind can endure for eternity. Sengoku then turned to Garp, speaking in a grave tone, I will erect a statue of Mr. Rengoku at Marine Headquarters, documenting his deeds for all Marines who come here to witness. I hope his spirit will inspire every Marine. From today, this cloak belongs to him. While Garp agreed in his heart, he expressed concern, the celestial dragons might not approve. Sengoku's mind was filled with Rengoku Kayajuro's dying smile, his resolve unwavering, perhaps it's time for the lackey who endured countless scoldings to stand strong. In the bleach world, Aizen's eyes brimmed with admiration, having truly recognized the other's character. He paid no heed to the concepts of righteousness and evil, but the other's unyielding determination and never-give-up attitude genuinely impressed him. This was a man to be honored, a true exemplar of strength. In the Siri IDI, the commander-in-chief slowly closed his eyes. It was regrettable that such a mighty soul couldn't find its way to the Soul Society. In the Naruto universe, Naruto found himself breathless, his heart heavy after watching the final scene of the video. He retreated to the shore and wept silently. Rengoku Kayajuro's life had touched him deeply, yet the appearance of the other's mother's soul had shattered him. He longed to see his own mother, even if just from afar, to etch her image into his heart. Kakashi didn't follow, letting out a quiet sigh. His gaze then shifted to the Hokage's office. At that moment, he couldn't help but feel that the third Hokage had been harsh. In the realm of the afterlife, Uchiha Madara's determination grew stronger. He was resolved to create that ultimate world. At Marine headquarters, nearly a full day passed as the video played out. Kizaru had returned and was now seated in the conference room. The proposal for a statue had been rejected by the Celestial Dragons. The notion of erecting a statue for an outsider from another world at Marine Headquarters seemed weak and unimpressive, unfit for the grandeur they desired. Sengoku was now attempting to pressure himself, Garp, and the other admirals by seeking their collective agreement. Kizaru had been taking a back seat, but he couldn't decline this matter. Suddenly, the vanished screen reappeared. So soon. Has he returned? I wonder who it is this time. Sengoku's gaze turned serious. Sure enough, the grayscale screen transformed into vivid imagery. None of the faces were directly visible. What could be seen were the backs of individuals. One held a massive sword, possessed a formidable physique, and emanated an aura of indomitable strength. Before this figure stood a colossal tower with the word, Marine, etched upon it, a word that had been severed in half. In the conference room, the pupils of Sengoku and the other two narrowed as they recognized the individual before them. On the grand ship of the Whitebeard Pirates, Marco exclaimed in disbelief, It can't be. This must be a mistake. Whitebeard erupted into hearty laughter, Goo la la la, this is what I've been waiting for. To die in a battle of valor, that's the most exhilarating thought. And now, the title was displayed on the screen. Iconic death scene, no. Pirate world, I may die, but I won't fall. Edward Newgate, Whitebeard. Support me on my KOFI account and read up to 15 early chapters by joining the membership. https colon slash slash ko phicom slash aaume the tower. The naval headquarters. 
Sengoku slammed his hand on the wooden table, exclaiming in disbelief, how could you attack Marineford? Whitebeard, you're audacious. In Holy Land Mariehua, the celestial dragons roared in disdain, fools. Utter fools. Pirates invaded the navy to marine headquarters. How disgraceful. In the world of the ninjas, Danzo and Sarutobi Hiruzen exchanged glances. Sarutobi Hiruzen's gaze turned grave. This individual is completely different from the one in the previous video. Just standing there exudes an immense aura. Danzo's eyes were clouded with worry. The global power level seems much higher now. I sense impending danger, Hiruzen. Sarutobi Hiruzen was slightly puzzled. It's alright, whatever happens in other worlds doesn't concern us. Danzo looked directly at Sarutobi Hiruzen, revealing his thoughts. If videos can be transmitted to our world and forced upon us, do you not think individuals from other worlds might arrive one day? Seeing Sarutobi Hiruzen furrowing his brows, Danzo seized the opportunity. Hiruzen, you should entrust that fox to me. With Root's training, he'll thrive. He might become crucial for the village's salvation in future crises. After a while, Sarutobi Hiruzen sighed, let's watch the video and discuss this later. Danzo nodded, a glimmer of triumph in his eyes. He knew he had shaken Sarutobi Hiruzen's resolve. The screen comes to life. Seagulls soar against the blue sky. The camera descends, revealing a massive island with artificial traces and a circular port. A towering structure stands in the center, bearing the word, Marine. This is Marine Headquarters, Marine Ford. As the camera continues its descent, an army of soldiers and fifty massive ships come into view. Along the port's edge, resembling city walls, eight colossal figures emerge. These eight wield an array of weapons, from guns to spears. Then, from the front of this group, a horrifying aura unfurls. Five more figures appear. Respectively. Bartholomew Kuma. Gecko Moria. Don Quixote da Flamingo. Dracul Myhawk. Boa Hancock. Interesting, I'm actually here. Da Flamingo smirks wickedly, a newfound intrigue in his expression. Look at what the future holds, even the seven warlords of the sea have gathered, Sengoku grimaces. In the ninja world, Sarutobi Hiruzen's eyes narrow. This unmasked malevolence is brazen. The governance in this world must be incompetent to harbor such individuals. Danzo remains silent, in stark contrast to Sarutobi Hiruzen's sentiments. Evil, when properly harnessed, can prove advantageous. In the bleach world, Aizen grins. This world appears more captivating than before. Who knows what surprises await me? The scene continues, on the imposing city wall, three side-by-side -side seats come into view. Then, three individuals in white cloaks take their places. Respectively, Marine Admirals. Akiji, Kuzan. Akainu, Sakazuki. And the yet awake Kizaru, Borsalino. With their appearance, a stifling aura emanates from the screen. Aizen's eyes gleam, even he feels a trace of pressure. In the Demon Slayer world, Akaza, having experienced the video, vigorously trains his fists, momentarily halting. As a warrior, the dread piercing his soul renders him incredulous. Damn it! How can there exist such an entity? His mere presence is enough to overwhelm me, it's an insurmountable gap. On the other hand, Demon King Muzan Kibutsuji breathes a sigh of relief, having been frightened. Luckily, this isn't his world, otherwise, his self-proclaimed title of Demon King would become a mockery. In the Hunter x Hunter world, the Ant King rises, puzzlement in his eyes. Why do humans possess such overwhelming momentum? In the world of pirates, Luffy, now resurrected with a fervor, shouts enthusiastically, are those the marine admirals? I'll defeat them someday. Meanwhile, at marine headquarters, Sengoku is equally perplexed. What's the meaning of this lineup? Could they have learned in advance of Whitebeard's impending attack on Marine Ford and are thus prepared to counter it? This isn't their typical style, is it? The scene progresses, then, the screen darkens abruptly. A clinking sound of chains dragging emerges, and the next moment, a detained prisoner appears. This man. Adorned with a crimson bead necklace, sporting black hair, a regular complexion, a bird-shaped mark adorns his cheek, and a ASCE tattoo marks his left arm. Impossible. 
How can it be ace? Ah. Lies. All lies. Luffy erupts into rage, unwilling to accept this sight. On the Moby Dick, Whitebeard's one smiling face gives way to intense fury. The Marines dare to capture my son. They court death. Just then, a realization strikes Whitebeard, Ace had left alone to pursue Teach just yesterday. At Marine headquarters, Sengoku chuckles, finally comprehending Whitebeard's motives. Still, he's puzzled. Is such a grand spectacle necessary for executing a notorious pirate? And usually, he'd never contend with Whitebeard, one of the four emperors, over a small pirate. Could there be a hidden agenda? Knowing in advance might enable him to decide his actions more astutely. Sengoku's mind whirls with thoughts. And Garp, seated diagonally across from him, clenches his fists, understanding the situation. Continuation of the scene, not long after, in a somber atmosphere, Ace was brought to an execution platform. Amidst the intense attention, Fleet Admiral Marine Sengoku stepped forward. He picked up the transponder snail, and after surveying the crowd, he spoke loudly, Port Gas D, Ace. Let us discuss the significance of this man's death here today. At the naval headquarters, Sengoku noticed that something was amiss with Garp. But he refrained from asking, knowing that everything was about to be unveiled. With confidence, Sengoku calmly began, Ace, tell us your father's name. Ace initially remained silent, but after ten seconds, he shouted with great fervor, My father is Whitebeard. No. Sengoku immediately interjected. There's nothing wrong. Ace retorted, his face sullen. Sengoku disregarded Ace and began to narrate a tale of struggle involving an infant. To everyone's surprise, the baby's mother endured twenty months of pregnancy to dispel suspicion, only to succumb to exhaustion and perish. The battle was lost, yet the mother emerged victorious, and the baby survived. Turning his gaze toward Ace, Sengoku uttered coldly, that baby carries the most evil blood in the world. And you are that baby. Sengoku continued, as for your father. One Piece, Joe L.D., Roger. As the live broadcast reached countless marine personnel and viewers, their expressions underwent drastic changes. In the pirate world, the revelation shook countless individuals, they had believed that everyone tied to Roger was eradicated. Unforeseen was the existence of a surviving child. The mother's determination was beyond imagination. At the naval headquarters, Sengoku instantly grasped the intent behind this execution. It was to set an example, to execute the son of the pirate king, instilling fear in all pirates. Simultaneously, it aimed to elevate marines' prestige and bolster their morale. Meanwhile, Garp hunched over, appearing to age several years in an instant. Out at sea, aboard a small boat, Ace clenched his fists. He harbored resentment, no, he detested that name. Sengoku issued a final decree, Ace must be executed today, even if it meant a full-scale war with Whitebeard. Just then, the gates of justice swung open, and through the dense fog, forty-three enormous pirate ships emerged. And these colossal ships that resonated across the new world all belonged to Whitebeard. From the depths of the Crescent Harbor, a massive bubble surfaced, revealing a dark silhouette. A thunderous boom echoed. The waves churned, and a gargantuan-coated pirate ship burst forth from the depths. It was none other than the vessel Whitebeard commanded, the Moby Dick. Subsequently, two more ships emerged, carrying the 1st Division commander, Marco, and the remaining 14 Division commanders. Confronted by a force several times their own, the pirates' expressions varied, yet they displayed no fear. Metal clanged against the deck, and a figure ascended gradually. Finally, a tremendously burly figure holding a massive blade stepped onto the deck. His footsteps seemed to resonate within the hearts of all, causing great discomfort. This sensation persisted until he halted and spoke, We meet again after decades, Sengoku. Sengoku's countenance darkened, and he uttered the other's name slowly, Whitebeard. So it's Whitebeard, huh? He's really here. Doflamingo chuckled, brimming with excitement. As pirates launched an assault on the naval headquarters, a multitude of pirates were stunned, cheering, and shouting. In the world of the Soul Reapers, Aizen's lips curled into a smile. Indeed, as expected of someone on the list. Fearlessness shines in his eyes. 
In the world of the Hokage, Naruto buried his face in his hands, feeling lost. Two sides, one seemingly malevolent pirates, the other seemingly righteous marines. But the current reality was a group of pirates unafraid of death, striving to rescue their comrade. Their indomitable spirit deeply moved him. He didn't know whose side to root for anymore. Upon hearing the name from Sengoku's lips, marine soldiers' expressions underwent drastic changes. They understood the gravity of that name. Just as the title implied, he was the emperor of pirates. Is my dear son unharmed? Whitebeard spoke calmly, yet his tone held a tinge of guilt. It conveyed his sentiment, how dare you execute my son, Whitebeard's heir. In the underworld, Uchiha Madara nodded in acknowledgement. This hockey was akin to his own. Sengoku remained silent, beads of sweat forming on his forehead. I never anticipated an invasion this close. According to his calculations, the melee shouldn't have commenced so early, thereby diminishing Marine's advantage. In this moment, Whitebeard looked towards the execution platform and stated, Wait a moment, Ace. His words were composed yet resolute. With his Murakumajiri, Whitebeard struck the ground. Whitebeard squatted, arms crossed over his massive chest. The next instant, Whitebeard bellowed, swinging his arms wide. A thunderous boom followed. Though he struck empty air, it felt as though he struck something solid. A terrifying spectacle materialized. The atmosphere shattered like glass, unleashing two colossal waves akin to a tsunami. Marines beneath gasped in awe. This was Whitebeard's might, one of the four emperors. A single blow altered reality. In the world of the Hokage, the Kages of each village frowned simultaneously. The man wielded such power in a single strike, a feat far beyond their wildest imaginings. Meanwhile, in the world of One Punch Man, even the heroes of the Hero Association were taken aback. Nonetheless, Tornado still retained her Tsundra attitude, treating this minor wave as a trivial matter. It was a piece of cake for her. In the world of the Shinigami, the Commander-in-Chief's eyes widened in astonishment. Generating a tsunami of such magnitude, this power had already reached the level of a captain. And this was just a simple strike against the opponent. I've underestimated this world, the Commander-in-Chief muttered to himself. However, for a world with power levels as low as that of the Demon Slayers, the scene before them resembled nothing short of an apocalypse. They struggled to believe that humans could possess such incredible power. In the world of Demon Slayers, Oyakata-sama clenched his fists tightly. Even to the blind, the display was clear, yet he still seethed with envy at this moment. If the Demon Slayer Corps wielded this kind of power, Demon King Muzan Kibutsuji would have perished long ago. In the world of the Rurouni Kenshin, many with less fortitude had even forsaken their swords, feeling their efforts to be utterly meaningless. However, there were exceptions. Enter the world of Gintama, where Jintoki, Shinpachi, and Kagura remained unfazed, applauding and cheering excitedly. Wow, Nana, that was an awesome movie. Kagura's clapping was more a mischievous slap, as she quickly snatched the last remaining bag of potato chips. The immense tsunami surged forth from both sides of the island, obscuring the sun in the blink of an eye. Though the marine soldiers below were already in a state of panic, the three admirals in command seats remained strikingly composed. As the tsunami rose to its zenith, it was met with a potent surge of energy. At this moment, a black silhouette instantaneously soared skyward. Akiji's countenance remained serene as he thrust his palms outwards, two slender ice threads hurtling toward the tsunami. The disparity between the two seemed vast from a visual standpoint. Yet, the outcome was exactly the opposite. The moment the tsunami grazed the thin ice threads, a resounding click filled the air. Ice Age. Terrifying coldness swept forth. The tempestuous waves congealed, and azure ice propagated rapidly. Within mere seconds, both the monstrous tsunami and the sea below were ensnared in ice. In an instant, the entire inner bay transformed into an ice-bound world. In the world of the Shinigami, Ranjiku hopped to the rooftop next to Toshiro, clicking her tongue a few times before speaking, Captain, can you achieve freezing of this caliber? Toshiro's expression remained solemn, I haven't tested it, so I can't say for sure. But once I unleash Bankai, it should be achievable. His confidence was unsure because this wasn't akin to a placid lake or even a roiling river. This was a tsunami, 
bearing a staggering amount of kinetic energy that was truly fearsome. However, Toshiro harbored no doubts about emerging victorious. After all, his Bankai, Daguren Hyrenmaru, held more than just freezing abilities. Whitebeard's expression showed no annoyance. In fact, he seemed on the brink of laughter. This spectacle before him aligned perfectly with his intentions. This was the freezing effect he'd been aiming for. It would facilitate pirate assaults. Marine forces initiated shelling at this juncture, prompting the pirates aboard the ship to abandon the ice and charge ahead. In the blink of an eye, marines and pirates confronted each other, plunging into a brutal battle. Amidst this, Hawkeye Myhawk took a sudden step forward. His fellow Shichibukai shared bewildered glances. They had pegged this swordsman of great repute as merely an observer. Now, it appeared their assumptions were off the mark. Well, are you joining the fray? Da Flamingo inquired with a smile. Hawkeye's unwavering gaze remained fixed on Whitebeard, as he responded with calm resolve, just to test the waters. I want to see how far the man before us can stand up to us. With deliberate precision, Hawkeye drew the massive sword from his back, the infamous black blade, Yoru. In the ensuing moment, the ambience dimmed, pale and foreboding, as a verdant sword aura brimming with razor-sharp intent surged forth. The ice in its path shattered, and none dared impede it. The blade cleaved directly toward Whitebeard positioned atop the ship's prow. In the world of the Shinigami, Zaraki Kenpachi was about to erupt. Such sword intent. Such a presence. Zaraki Kenpachi's golden riatsu erupted ferociously as he bellowed, why must these things occur in different worlds? Damn it. I really want to cleave you into oblivion. Within the fourth division, Unohana Retsu's gaze narrowed. She sensed the blood, dormant for ages, stirred by the sword aura, its pulse beginning to quicken. A trace of crimson essence emanated, and at that very moment, Kotetsu Isane collapsed to the ground. Her captain's visage bore a demonly pallor, her eyes brimming with terror. Unohana Retsu subtly gathered her aura, once more fixing her gaze on Kotetsu Isane. With an air of placid nonchalance, she spoke softly, You saw nothing, understand? Although her tone was gentle, in Kotetsu Isane's eyes, the scene around her had vanished. All she could perceive was a terrifying scarlet specter lurking in the shadows. Death's breath drew near, yet she fought back tears, nodding rapidly like a frightened lamb. The scene endures. Just as the sword aura was poised to reach Whitebeard, a dark shadow plummeted from above. The sword strike collided, causing the wielder considerable pain. Yet with a resounding roar, he caught the imperceptible blade energy with both hands, hurtling it skyward before triggering a tremendous detonation. The frosty haze cleared, revealing a figure transformed into diamond, who had thwarted the strike. It was Jozu, bearer of the diamond fruit ability. Observing this turn of events, Hawkeye sheathed his blade with a trace of disappointment. If Whitebeard refrained from engaging, there was no point for him to intervene. Chaos endured, and Kizaru, seated in the command positions, could no longer hold back. He transformed into light and vanished, supplanted by a dazzling radiance in the firmament. Yada no Kagami. Kizaru's tone remained casual as he folded his hands, prompting a deluge of luminous bullets to converge upon Whitebeard. Yet, a fearless azure flame emerged to intercept. The storm-like barrage was effortlessly thwarted. Observing this, Kizaru's inaction persisted, and he gazed upon the scene with evident surprise. Within the blue flames, Marco's body mended its wounds, bit by bit. In the ensuing moment, the azure flames enshrouded Marco's form. A piercing cry resonated as a blue phoenix emerged from the inferno, hurtling towards Kizaru. Several exchanges followed, culminating in Kizaru being repelled. Huh, seems I won't get a direct shot at the Whitebeard after all. Kizaru quipped, reverting to his human form. Among the marine's admirals, two had already moved. Yet at this juncture, a stalwart pirate thrust his fists into the ice. The ensuing instant saw the ice shatter, propelling a colossal iceberg towards the marines. Impacted forcefully, this iceberg had the potential to render countless marines into mincemeat. Seeing Kizaru's lack of participation, of the three admirals, only Akainu could no longer be restrained. Launching himself skyward in a single bound, he erupted, desertion without authorization, once again. 
his wrathful right hand transmuted into a titanic magma fist, colliding with the iceberg in a single blow. Terrible heat surged alongside overwhelming force, instantly annihilating the iceberg. Simultaneously in the sky, the magma fist summoned forth by a kainu expanded dramatically. Heat radiated prodigiously from its core. However, the spectacle was far from over, the magma suddenly ignited, culminating in a detonation the subsequent second. Volcanic bomb. Meteor-like fire rain plummeted, heralding an apocalyptic finale. Panic-stricken, the pirates atop the ice scrambled for safety. Few hit by the assault stood a chance of survival. In this moment, a volcanic bomb hurtled towards Whitebeard. Observing the rock fireball rapidly closing in, its searing heat palpable, Whitebeard remained stationary. Witnessing this, Naruto of the Hokage world shouted anxiously, Take cover, Grandpa Whitebeard. Elsewhere, those in other worlds eagerly anticipated how this behemoth would avert the crisis. Then came the unforeseen twist. With the fireball an arm's length away, Whitebeard remained unperturbed, blowing softly in its direction. Instantly, the act seemed as effortless as extinguishing a candle atop a cake, causing the flaming rock to halt abruptly before being snuffed out like a mere wisp. In the realm of Hokage, Naruto found himself awestruck. The might of that magma fireball was starkly evident, the residual attack alone was enough to capsize and harm numerous pirates. Unpredictably, at this very moment, Whitebeard intervened, piercing through the flames like a fork through a potato and extinguishing them with a single exhale. Sasuke looked on with yearning, murmuring, with such power, I could surely take down that man. Whitebeard raised his gaze slowly, a smirk curling his lips, this fire could light birthday candles, kid. Akainu looked down, why avoid a grand spectacle, Whitebeard? Their eyes locked, brimming with deadly intent. Amidst the chaos, a colossal silhouette emerged from behind. As it gradually materialized, a giant with an eccentric appearance appeared, two horns sprouting from its head, elongated fangs protruding from its mouth, and pallid green skin. Odd creatures seemed to be increasing, Orochimaru muttered, consumed by his research. Of this display. I wonder what sort of evolution this being might undergo, Aizen pondered, deeply intrigued. In the scene, Little Oz rampaged, even top vice admirals fell. As he neared Ace, a sudden mutation materialized. One of the Shichibukai extended his palms, conjuring a massive transparent bare paw between them. Upon complete compression, the paw struck a devastating blow, gravely injuring the colossal Little Oz. Capitalizing on the moment, Gekko Moria launched a shadowy projectile, piercing Little Oz. In his final moments, the severely wounded Little Oz summoned his last ounce of strength, crashing onto a city wall, shattering it with his own massive form. Observing the video of the alive yet lifeless Little Oz, Ace, seated alone on a boat, shed tears. In this instance, his desire to reunite surged uncontrollably. Luffy, too, was deeply moved, vowing to reconnect with them as comrades in the future. Meanwhile, Moria was elated. Converting this giant into a zombie could yield incredible power. The scene progressed. A giant clad in marine uniform boarded the pirate ship, cleaving at Whitebeard with a colossal axe. Fueled by rage, Whitebeard pivoted and swung, obliterating space and instantly shattering the steel giant axe. Simultaneously, he pressed the opponent's head onto the deck. Boom! Utter annihilation. With a single strike, the marine vice-admiral, a behemoth, was flung from the ship like a rag, his fate uncertain. Gazing upon little Oz's remains, Whitebeard reigned in his emotions and unleashed a commanding assault. In the midst of this, a figure strolled toward the execution platform. Garp seated himself beside Ace. After a while, the elderly man's floodgates burst, shoulders quaking uncontrollably, and he bellowed at Ace in exhilaration, You rascal! Why plunge into piracy? Why defy my arrangements? Ace grit his teeth to suppress his tears. At this juncture, he truly comprehended the depth of the old man's affection. The visual was even more brutal, a marine hero forced to watch his grandson's execution, powerless to intervene. This was akin to thrusting a sword into Garp's heart and vigorously twisting it. Staring at the deeply lined visage drenched in tears, even Luffy succumbed to weeping. Once heartless, he had never fathomed such torment. This agony was utterly beyond his imagination. 
At Marine Headquarters, Garp stifled his sobs. Sengoku, seated beside him, remained silent. Yet, for absolute justice, he'd repeat this ordeal if given a chance. In the world of Hunter, the Ant King shook his head, muttering, the constraints of humanity. However, the visage of a grubby child flashed across his thoughts, silencing him anew. The scene persisted. Inadvertently rejoining the fray, a party descended from the sky. Before their figures arrived, their voices heralded their arrival. A.I. C. It's me. Ha. I knew it, how could I not save Ace when he was seized? Luffy brushed away his tears and pumped his fist in elation. On the boat, Ace's lips curled into an involuntary smile. In the scene, the involvement of Luffy and others seemed to tip the balance toward victory. Yet, the Shichibukai crocodile pursued Whitebeard. Without moving an inch, Whitebeard quipped, some people never learn their lessons. Crocodile sneered, brandishing his golden hook without hesitation. Boom! A figure rocketed toward Crocodile's hook like a cannonball. The sand crocodile was taken aback, not expecting Luffy's interference. Amidst the Whitebeard pirates, Whitebeard sneered. Luffy's intervention likely saved Crocodile. Otherwise, the pirate might have been critically wounded or even killed. You're Ace's younger brother, aren't you? Whitebeard uttered icily. Luffy nodded. You're here to save him, then. Absolutely. Whitebeard wielded his massive sword, his presence surging as he bellowed, do you comprehend, just like him, you could perish. However, Luffy remained undeterred, proclaiming his intent to become the Pirate King. On the Moby Dick, Whitebeard laughed heartily, goo la la la. Good lad, consider yourself my son from this moment on. But an epiphany struck Whitebeard like a bolt. Ace referred to Garp as, Grandpa, while Luffy called Ace, Big Brother. This. Whitebeard suddenly felt a fervent urge to cleave Garp in two. At the naval headquarters, Sengoku cast a contemplative gaze toward Garp. You two grandkids are truly courageous. Garp wiped his tears and pretended not to notice. Simultaneously, relief surged within him. Armed with this video, Ace would exercise greater caution and ideally avoid capture again. The conversation between the two continued, and Luffy revealed the secret that Marineford's execution of Ace was going to happen sooner than expected. The Whitebeard pirates were all taken aback by this revelation. Shock also reverberated throughout the world. The inhabitants of the pirate world found it hard to believe their eyes. The fact that a young boy with a straw hat could hold an equal conversation with one of the four emperors, Whitebeard, was truly unbelievable. But Luffy didn't share this astonishment. Meanwhile, on one of the boats, Shanks laughed heartily, knowing that Luffy's attitude was one that Whitebeard would approve of. After all, did anyone really think that Whitebeard, one of the four emperors, was easygoing? The battle rages on. Confronted by formidable adversaries, Luffy's gaze was resolute as he fearlessly charged toward the execution platform. Despite the attempts of Kizaru, Moria, Hawkeye, and others to halt Luffy's progress, they were all thwarted by the intervention of Jean Bay and his companions. Ace, from the execution platform, looked at Luffy rushing towards him. He cried out and yelled to Luffy, My adventures are mine alone. You have no right to interfere. However, only Luffy's unwavering cry echoed back to him. I'm. Your brother. Being your younger brother, I can't stand by and watch my older brother being executed. Because I am your younger brother, I'm willing to sacrifice my life to save you. Your life is more important than mine. In the world of Hokage, Sasuke trembled, his teeth clenched as childhood memories flooded his mind. There was a time when he had a bond like that too. Somewhere within a cave, Itachi lowered his head slightly, his gaze clouded. Mr. Itachi, does it hurt? Do you miss your brother? Kisame inquired with a grin while stirring the bonfire. Itachi lifted his head, his expression unchanged. I was just considering how far he has come with his Sharingan. Did he disappoint me? Really? Mr. Itachi, you're quite cold-hearted, Kisame chuckled, as if he had already anticipated this response. In the world of pirates, Whitebeard nodded, satisfaction gleaming in his eyes. After watching the video, he had made up his mind. First, he would rescue Ace, and then he would turn to Luffy. 
he intended to take them both under his wing. With Luffy's assistance, the chances of success were considerably higher. As for Garp. Well, it was best not to dwell on that for now. The scene continues, inspired by Luffy's bravery, Whitebeard issued orders for his crew to support Luffy wholeheartedly. He also assigned Marco to provide comprehensive protection for Luffy. At this moment, Luffy was knocked down by Smoker. However, Empress Boa Hancock came to Luffy's rescue just in time. Simultaneously, she extracted a key from her sleeves and handed it to Luffy. It was the key to Ace's handcuffs. Elsewhere, Ivan learned that the bear had been transformed into PX-0, losing its consciousness and forcing him into a battle with the Orge. Luffy pressed on, but his path was blocked once again, this time by Hawkeye. After a few exchanges, Luffy sustained injuries. Jean Bay, who rushed over to help, was also knocked into the sea. Hawkeye gazed at the determined young man, his eyes devoid of both joy and anger. Then, he swung his black blade once more. In the midst of his attack, Luffy abruptly halted. In the crucial moment of his first awakening, he bent down to evade the strike. At that instant, the surrounding space turned bleak, and an abyss-like black sword energy erupted from the dark blade. Suddenly, an overwhelming sense of dread pervaded the area, causing nearby pirates to tremble, their faces frozen in terror. The atmosphere shifted. In a matter of seconds that felt like an eternity, the environment returned to its original state. However, the colossal wave, hundreds of meters high, which had transformed into an ice sculpture in the distance, disintegrated with a single slash. This sight left Zaraki Kenpachi in awe. In the world of samurai Deeper Kyo, Mibu Kayashiro's eyes widened. He closed them, meticulously recalling the sword strike he had just witnessed. In the Hokage's world, Mike Guy mused thoughtfully, is it a kenjutsu that combines intent and strength? In the world of pirates, is this the power of the strongest swordsman strike? Zoro's eyes glittered, his blood boiling with excitement. In the midst of all this, the 5th Division captain, Vista, engaged in combat with Hawkeye. Luffy continued his advance towards Ace, protected by the efforts of his allies. Seeing this, Sengoku decided to halt the live broadcast, intending to execute Ace immediately and activate the surrounding walls. Yet, due to the interference of the clown buggy in his live Den Den Mushi, one screen remained active, and the broadcast persisted. The camera then shifted back to Whitebeard. A bald and rather unattractive man stepped forward. It was Squared, who had been missing for a long time. He was also one of Whitebeard's sons. Before Whitebeard could express his joy at Squared's return, the latter plunged a blade into Whitebeard's chest. This shocking scene reverberated throughout the world. The screen indicated that Squared was one of Whitebeard's sons, so why had he attacked his own father? Betrayal. Inside the Whitebeard pirates, confusion and turmoil abounded. At this moment, as Akainu had yet to contact Squared, he remained unaware of his actions. Squared found himself surrounded by a group of enemies. For the first time, Marco's expression turned furious, and the blue flames surrounding his body danced with intensity. Dad, let me take care of this traitor, he shouted. Whitebeard shook his head, remaining silent. Memories appeared on the screen. It was revealed that Squared's pirate crew had been destroyed by Roger in the past. Fueled by his hatred for Roger, he was deceived by Akainu. Akainu cunningly manipulated Squared, implying that Whitebeard would trade the lives of all his crew members for Ace's safety. Is this the so-called righteous marine? Naruto's expression twisted in disgust. Among the Whitebeard pirates, the flames around Marco extinguished, and he yelled, Idiot! Fool! As anger consumed Luffy, he felt his body swell with intense emotion. Pirates everywhere were abuzz with discussion. This red dog, Akainu, is truly wicked. Hee <laughs> hee, the marines are exactly like this. That's why I've chosen the pirate path. On a weathered white pirate ship, Akainu hung his head, his face obscured in shadow. In the face of absolute justice, I've done nothing wrong. Just when everyone anticipated Whitebeard's retaliation, an unexpected turn of events unfolded. Rather than attacking Squared, Whitebeard embraced him with his massive arms. Squared, who had prepared himself to die, lifted his head in disbelief. Sweat glistened on Whitebeard's face, and his golden eyes, so rarely displaying tender affection, 
held firm as he spoke, squared. Even if you've acted foolishly. I still love you, my son. It's not just Ace who is special. You are all my family. Dad. On board the Moby Dick, Squared was on his knees, weeping uncontrollably. He wasn't alone. Among the Whitebeard pirates, even those who had never shed a tear had red eyes at this moment. Whitebeard had never articulated it before, but now they finally understood. It wasn't just Squared's mistake. It was a realization that within Whitebeard's heart, every member of his crew was cherished and loved equally as family. No favoritism, no bias. Whitebeard's face showed a tender smile, reminiscent of his youth. My sons, having you as my family has also been my good fortune. In the Hokage world, Naruto longed for this kind of warmth. Knock knock. A sudden knocking on the door, and Kakashi entered. Kakashi squinted and smiled, placing a carton of milk and some fresh vegetables on the table. Naruto, I don't have any plans, and I find myself alone. Would you like to have dinner together tonight? Kakashi-sensei. Naruto was taken aback. After a few moments, he turned his head suddenly, whispering through held back tears, stay if you want, but I won't. Watching Naruto's trembling shoulders, Kakashi regretted not reaching out sooner. Yet, until he became Naruto's teacher, no members of the third Hokage faction of ninjas were permitted to approach him. Kakashi recalled the scene of his father's death and a different thought surfaced. Third Hokage, I think you've been mistaken. On the ship's deck, Squared realized the grave error he had committed, kneeling on the ground and weeping with his face in his arms. Whitebeard's eyes held no reproach as he tightly pressed the wound on his side, staunching the bleeding. But this was just a facade, his internal injuries remained. However, now wasn't the time to linger. He cared not whether he'd make it out alive. If you're going to follow me, don't cling to life around me. The next moment, Whitebeard grabbed a massive sword and joined the battle himself. The pirate's morale surged unexpectedly. High above, Aizen's half-closed eyes widened fully. Oh. Is it finally beginning? Boom. Whitebeard suddenly collapsed, and a powerful gust swept around him. The pirates charged once again. Yet, at that moment, dozens of cannons began to fire, dealing devastating blows to the pirates. Simultaneously, a marine giant raised a colossal ten-meter-long blade and struck at Whitebeard. Boom! The colossal blade shattered with ease. Concurrently, the entire icy terrain shook, an immensely dreadful aura emanating from Whitebeard. In the next heartbeat, Whitebeard swung the large sword in his grip high, splaying his fingers and fiercely cleaving the air before him from top to bottom. The space itself bore five finger marks like deep ravines. Amid countless terrified eyes. The ground tilted, a monstrous earthquake engulfing the expansive island. And the sea, even more cataclysmic. The entire ocean seemed to split into sloping segments under the impact. In an instant, heaven crumbled and earth shattered, mountains rumbled and tsunamis roared. This instant mirrored doomsday. In the world of Shinigami, Aizen's eyes glinted with intrigue. In the Hokage's world, the village Kages were aghast. An ability capable of raising an entire village to ruins with a single strike. An earthquake that left nothing standing. Atop the tower in the village hidden in rain, Nagato furrowed his brow. This power surpassed the Shinra Tensei. In the world of hunters, the Ant King stood, disbelief etched on his face. How can humans possess such overwhelming might? In the world of pirates, countless jaws dropped. Was this the strength of one of the four emperors? It was as if the world itself could be obliterated. However, Shanks, also among the four emperors, shook his head with a sigh. Whitebeard was still aged, not in the peak of his form, and injured to boot. Otherwise, the force of this blow would have been even greater. And the observers from lower-powered worlds remained silent, their scalps tingling and souls trembling. A singular question echoed through their minds. Could this truly still be considered human? The scene continues. The terrifying earthquake persisted for several minutes before ceasing. A chilling realization dawned as most of the structures on Marineford lay in ruins. At that instant, the towering Vice Admiral lunged at Whitebeard, only to be defeated in a single clash. Simultaneously, the horrendous shockwave obliterated anything in its path, 
relentlessly assaulting the island. The shockwave proved unstoppable, halted only when the three Marine admirals intervened, moments before reaching the execution platform. Marine activated the surrounding fortifications, a multitude of cannons poised to obliterate the pirates. However, hindered by Little Ors Jr.'s massive body, an impenetrable wall arose. Seeing this, a Kainu erupted in rage, launching magma bombs at the pirate group, the resulting smoke of gunpowder darkening the sun. Simultaneously, Sengoku ordered Ace's execution to proceed prematurely. As Jean Bay intervened, a surge of water hurled Luffy beyond the barrier. Facing the trio of admirals, Luffy attempted to create smoke and slip past their interception. But Luffy was still inexperienced, kicked away by Kizaru. And as the executioner's blade descended, suddenly the sand crocodile materialized, ending the executioner's life. His motive was simple, to spare himself the sight of Marine's haughty expression. Luffy and his allies began another rescue, Little Ors Jr. awakening, breaching the perimeter wall aboard a ship filled with pirates and arriving at the square. At that moment, Whitebeard and company finally overcame the blockade, stepping onto solid ground. The intensity of the ensuing battle would escalate even further. Boom! Facing the densely packed marines in the plaza, Whitebeard raised Murakuma Jairi in his hands and slashed with great force. Suddenly, the sound of cracking echoed, and dense cracks appeared in the air. In the next second, a terrifying shockwave followed. The incredibly tough ground of the plaza shattered, sending countless marine soldiers flying, only to fall like dropped dumplings. And right at that moment, Admiral Akiji descended from the sky. With a wave of his hand, a fearsome glacier surged toward Whitebeard, engulfing him in an instant. The cold mist cleared, revealing Whitebeard encased in a massive dark blue ice, frozen like a statue. Completely frozen. Defeated. Numerous individuals in the pirate world found it hard to believe. Seated on his throne, Aizen chuckled lightly, seemingly not worried in the slightest. On board the Moby Dick, Whitebeard appeared composed, while Marco curled his lip in disdain. Indeed. The pirates were tense, yet in less than a second, a clicking sound resonated. Boom! Countless ice fragments soared, and Whitebeard reappeared and scathed. The next moment, Akiji was beside Whitebeard in an instant. And Whitebeard seemed to have anticipated it, raising his sword at the precise moment and piercing Akiji in an instant. Excited smiles appeared on the faces of the surrounding pirates. According to their understanding, even if you possess the Logia fruit, a sword infused with hockey passing through your heart renders you vulnerable. Akiji was defeated. However, Whitebeard didn't smile. In the Shinigami world, Aizen's eyes shimmered with interest. What a cute perception. He preemptively evaded danger and carved a substantial opening in his chest. It appears to penetrate, yet no harm was done. In the world of One Piece, Akiji, who observed the scene, sneered. But there were also many weaker observers, baffled by the seemingly foolish act of the Marine Admiral thrusting himself onto a large sword. Luffy, standing on the deck, furrowed his brows. He sensed something was amiss, though articulating it was elusive. At the naval headquarters, Sengoku nodded with satisfaction. The use of Kenbunchiku Haki is impeccable. The screen continued. Confronting the wound piercing his body, Akiji laughed instead of displaying anger. He gripped the broadsword firmly with both hands, and ice promptly extended from the blade, covering Whitebeard. Simultaneously, four ice spears exuding an unending chill materialized and lunged at Whitebeard. At a critical juncture, Diamond Jozu, whose timing remained uncertain, slammed into Akiji with his head. The ice structure crumbled, and Akiji emerged, a trace of blood escaping his lips. Evidently, Diamond Jozu had managed to wound him this time. At the naval headquarters, within the conference room, Sengoku furiously addressed Garp, Borsalino is at it again. At that moment, Kizaru on the scene hadn't the opportunity to intervene. But this mess resumed. Garp appeared helpless, as if it weren't the umpteenth time he'd encountered this. A sigh escaped him, followed by a swing of his hammer. As for Kizaru. Well, he had already disappeared once he recognized the situation was awry. With Diamond Jose departing and dragging the injured Akiji along, Whitebeard pressed forward. In the sky, Marco unfurled his wings of flames, intending to descend and rescue Ace. Yet, 
Gark promptly struck him with a punch. At the naval headquarters, Sengoku nodded in satisfaction. Garp remained dependable. Meanwhile, Luffy was overpowered by a vice admiral and was sent tumbling into Whitebeard's vicinity by Kizaru. Sengoku was rendered speechless. Luffy could be easily defeated, yet this predicament persisted. Elsewhere, Garp heaved a sigh of relief. The scene was quite pleasant. Whitebeard entrusted Luffy to another and raised his sword, striking once more. Simultaneously, a dark red light materialized, with a kainu standing atop the blade's edge, preventing it from being swung. The immense momentum transformed into a gust, and in the subsequent moment, the two simultaneously thrust their fists forward. Scarlet met white. The aura emitted by the two tore through the air, distorting the world's colors. The terrifying energy centered on their fists erupted, sweeping outwards and igniting waves of intense explosions. In this instant, both marines and pirates fled in terror, fearing entanglement. An astounding battle. I yearn to join. Zaraki Kenpachi sat cross-legged on the ground. Such a battle, observable but unparticipable, proved torturous. Yet, he found himself unable to look away. In the world of Demon Slayer, Musen Kibutsuji's face turned pale. The mere momentum displayed on the screen caused profound discomfort. And within, Hueco Mundo, eyes inside, the human physique remains frail, vulnerable to aging. The screen continued. At this juncture, Whitebeard's body trembled suddenly. The power emanating from his fist rapidly waned, and he collapsed. Observing Whitebeard's old ailment resurfacing in blood seeping from the stab wound, Akainu seized the opportunity. In the blink of an eye, Akainu was beside Whitebeard, delivering an incredibly forceful magma-infused punch that instantly pierced the opponent's chest. Numerous pirates found it hard to believe, yet some powerhouses acknowledged Whitebeard's substantial strength. The wound that the sword had driven through his internal organs proved dire. Simultaneously, due to their concern for Whitebeard, Marco and Jozu fell prey to Kizaru and Akiji's onslaughts, enduring severe blows. While he was vulnerable, finish him. Countless marine soldiers attacked as if their lives depended on it, aiming to inflict further damage upon Whitebeard. For a moment, Whitebeard was engulfed by marines, his surroundings obscured. Then, a thunderous sound erupted. Just because you all want to kill me. I am Whitebeard. Boom. The earth shakes violently. Amidst a furious strike from Whitebeard, countless marines around him cried out and were sent flying, leaving an empty space several hundred meters in radius. Mixed in the terrified screams, thousands of marine soldiers plummeted from the sky like dumplings, either dead or wounded. A wounded lion is still a fierce beast, and it's foolish for prey not to seize the chance to escape, Aizen remarked with disdain in his eyes. In the world of the Hokage, how can one endure such a blow and still stand? What immense strength and determination! Might Guy exclaimed in admiration. If he read the situation correctly, the punch by Akainu's blow had dealt a heavy blow to Whitebeard's body. Some of his insides might have even been charred. At this moment, using Ivan's hormones, Luffy pushed his body to its limits, reaching the pinnacle of his strength. Simultaneously, Sengoku ordered a new executioner, aiming to execute Ace directly. Whitebeard, in his state of impatience, coughed blood as he clutched his wound. Seeing the executioner's blade descend, no one could intervene at this moment. In the background, Garp clenched his fists, trembling with emotion. Suddenly, Whitebeard stood up, causing the entire Moby Dick to shake. Sengoku's lips curled into a smile. However, in a sudden turn of events. At the critical moment, Luffy's blood surged, and he roared with all his might. You all. Get out of my way. As his voice echoed, a formidable blue aura erupted from Luffy's body, sweeping through the surroundings in an instant. Boom. Though no sound was produced, it felt as if lightning had struck everyone's ears. Sengoku's eyes widened, witnessing something incredible. On the execution platform, the two executioners collapsed instantly. Not only that, a multitude of marines on the square also fell, their eyes rolling back as they lost consciousness. Within marine headquarters, Sengoku shot to his feet in disbelief, impossible. Conqueror's hockey. Garp's back was now drenched with sweat, a mixture of relief and pride overcoming him. Back on the Moby Dick, 
Whitebeard settled back down, laughing heartily. Within the pirate world, those in the know were left in shock. Conqueror's hockey was not something they could associate with a seemingly weak straw hat youth. That was the Conqueror's hockey, a hockey that only emerged in one among millions of individuals. It marked the bearer as having the potential of a king, standing above others. Somewhere else, a proud smile crossed the hideous face of Monkey D. Dragon. In Shinigami world, merely his aura can stagger others. Aizen's eyes showed surprise for the first time. In those lower-level power worlds, many might not have noticed, yet they were trembling, gripped by terror. As Luffy's conqueror's feet unfolded, Whitebeard promptly commanded everyone to protect Luffy and fend off the marines. Even Crocodile re-entered the fray, blocking Hawkeye alongside Mr., ultimately, under everyone's combined effort, a path to Ace was finally cleared. Yet in that moment, Garp intervened to block Luffy. In the conference room, Sengoku nodded to Garp, acknowledging his praiseworthy actions. At the same time, he admonished Admiral Kazaru, who had returned underhandedly. Look at the example set by others, they could sacrifice family for the sake of justice. However, Garp sighed, feeling a profound discomfort. The grandfather and grandson had been apart for many years, it was unexpected that their reunion would be shadowed by life and death. Garp gritted his teeth and swung a punch at Luffy. Luffy, in turn, unleashed his power without reservation, his crimson form radiating a tremendous force as he threw a punch. The scene abruptly shifted, showcasing Garp's memories with the two youths. The interactions of the three generations were heartwarming. The scene returned to the battlefield, but now Garp had closed his eyes. Boom! Luffy's punch landed on Garp's chin, sending Garp flying with a heartrending cry, until he crashed into the ruins. After a few feeble kicks, Garp was effectively out of the fight. Inside Marine headquarters, Garp adjusted his stance slightly, feigning indifference as he made his exit. Abruptly, a furious roar echoed from behind. Garp. Sengoku's face burned with anger. This was no longer about showing leniency. It was akin to doing nothing itself. Unacceptable. Only moments ago, he had praised the other party, only to now slap himself metaphorically. And there was Spandam, laughing away. What right did he have to laugh now? In this moment, Sengoku wished he could transform into a benevolent deity to clarify the situation. Finally, Sengoku sighed, massaging his temples as he contemplated how to justify this to the celestial dragons. On the deck, Luffy celebrated, jumping and cheering. On a small boat, Ace's eyes became gradually moist. Luffy finally arrived at the execution platform. Yet, at that precise instant, a ranged attack from Kizaru shattered the key that Luffy had just obtained. Fortunately, Mr., disguised as a marine, emerged at this moment, utilizing the wax wax fruit to recreate the key. Seeing this, Sengoku made a decisive move. Suddenly, an enormous golden Buddha materialized and struck Luffy with a punch. Countless figures in the pirate world marveled, it was their first glimpse of Sengoku's abilities. But even through the screen, the weight of that power was palpable. At this juncture, Garp too was tense. He understood the force behind Sengoku's punch, even he had to be cautious of it. Faced with the attack, Luffy placed his thumb in his mouth. The colossal fist descended, and Luffy's form expanded dramatically, his belly transformed into a rubbery balloon. Meanwhile, Mr. erected a barrier behind them. At this pivotal moment, the golden fist collided with Luffy. Suddenly, ripples danced across the surface of the balloon, and the next second, it rapidly deflated, causing the entire execution platform to collapse. Simultaneously, several shells hurtled towards the trio below. A succession of explosions erupted, engulfed in towering flames. All eyes turned to the scene, tension thick in the air. Suddenly, an unfastened handcuff fell to the ground. The ensuing moment saw a fierce blaze spring forth from the dense smoke above, forming a fiery passage. Witnessing this, the marines desperately bombarded the passage anew. Then, a ferocious column of fire materialized, withstanding every assault, before plummeting into the mass below. Boom! The earth quaked. In this instant, the flames transformed into colossal waves, surging with staggering energy, scorching many marines and propelling them skyward. Among the pirates, excitement flickered in every gaze. 
exceeding expectations. Emerging from the flames was a figure adorned with a bird-like insignia on his face. It was Fire Fist. Ace. Although the future remains uncertain and subject to change, the Whitebeard Pirates are still roaring. Good job, Rubber Boy. Great job, you've exceeded everyone's expectations. On the deck, Luffy was bursting with excitement. He was eager to reunite with Ace, determined to make Ace thank him properly by eating a hearty meal to his heart's content. The atmosphere of the ninja world felt a bit off. Hey hey hey. Naruto chuckled to himself after his excitement settled down. In his thoughts, he had already begun to imagine a scenario where Sasuke is captured by sinister villains, and he sacrifices his own life to rescue him. The battle was so intense that it turned the world upside down, even Jonin couldn't approach it. In the end, Naruto's relentless efforts paid off as he pushed Sasuke to his limits despite his own serious injuries. Rescued Sasuke wept tears of gratitude, bowing profusely to express his thanks. Little Sakura blushed, embracing herself and continuously praising Naruto's greatness. Eventually, she even closed her eyes, puckering her lips in his direction. Boom! Kakashi retreated, his expression filled with disgust. He couldn't erase the repulsive scene from his mind, it was utterly revolting. Scene continues, the flames gradually dissipate, and Luffy and Mr. reappear. The pirates cheer, while the morale of the marines drops. Next, the two brothers display astonishing destructive power. In the midst of the chaos, Ace's fire melts Akiji's colossal ice bird. Simultaneously, in the distance, Squad steers his pirate ship towards the heart of the battlefield with a resounding roar. It becomes clear that Squad intends to make amends for his mistakes, sacrificing himself against the marines to buy Ace time to escape. Dear foolish son, I've already forgiven your recklessness, Whitebeard sighed in helpless fondness. At that moment, the other pirates gazed at Squad, who still knelt on the ground, and conveyed their forgiveness as well. Boom! The massive pirate ship abruptly halts. Just as Squad is baffled, the dust beneath the ship settles. A brawny figure halts the immense ship with a single hand. It's Whitebeard. Such immense power still remains. Aizen's eyes narrow as he observes the man whose life force is dimming. The Ant King's gaze reflects bewilderment, is this human? I can't perceive any limitations. Countless individuals are now curious about the extent of this man's endurance. Amidst the astonishment of the onlookers, Whitebeard bellows with anger, Squad, do you not understand the how unfilial it is to die before your father? Don't be conceited, your attack won't end me. The listeners understand the importance of the sword strike, it's Whitebeard's way of comforting Squad, alleviating him of his guilt. With this said, Whitebeard turns towards Marineford, step by step with a resolute gaze. His commanding figure stands before all the Whitebeard pirates. Then, Whitebeard's unwavering voice reverberates across the plaza, Listen to me, Whitebeard pirates. Now, the final orders are issued. Each one of you must return from this alive, safely making your way back to the new world. These words resonate like a final farewell, stirring up emotions among the crew. In any scenario, they won't forsake their captain, nor their father. Boom! The earth trembles suddenly, Whitebeard clenches his fists, his arm muscles bulging. Amidst the poignant and exhilarating melody, his unmatched hockey resonates. I. I am the remnant of the old era. The new generation lacks a ship capable of carrying me. Let's go, young ones. With the utterance of these words, Whitebeard's muscles are enveloped in a blue hue as he delivers a decisive blow. Click. The power of the Gura Gura no Mi reaches its zenith, fine yet terrifying cracks fissuring the space before Whitebeard. The once sturdy city tower is now riddled with fractures and collapses instantly. The marine headquarters crumbles into ruins beneath the might of this strike. The pirate world seems frozen, suspended in time by this impact. The air grows heavy with silence. Through the smoke and debris, only Whitebeard remains, standing resolute against the marines. His eyes hold no fear, only determination, and an unparalleled hockey. At this moment, everyone comprehends why Edward Newgate bears the title of one of the four emperors. A fearsome man indeed, but how much longer can you endure? Eisen ponders curiously. And across different worlds, astonishment reverberates. 
the long sword and the fiery fists, both piercing through the chest. Though this man's end is imminent, whence comes this unrelenting power? It flows ceaselessly, as if an eternal spring. Could this truly be human? Support me on my KOFI account and read up to 15 early chapters, https colon slash slash ko-fi.com slash aaume, amidst thousands of troops, a lone figure challenges the entire marine. Don't look back, for times are changing. In this moment, Whitebeard's mind conjures images of the good times aboard the Moby Dick with his many sons. Eating heartily, laughing wholeheartedly, these were the scenes of joy. The companionship of his family filled him with profound affection. This was the purpose of Whitebeard's life, and it was the reason he stood here now. My sons are protected by me. Whitebeard gazes at the numerous marines, at the admirals, at Sengoku. A smile gradually forms at the corners of his mouth. So, today, let's put an end to this. Marines. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara nods approvingly, a fine man. I, Uchiha Madara, acknowledge you. On the Moby Dick, Marco and the others look at the composed Whitebeard with teary eyes. They pledge to prevent such a scene from ever happening again in the future. Countless crew members are unwilling to leave, but despite their reluctance, they finally weep and choose to retreat. Meanwhile, Ace employs his flames to create an isolated space. Kneeling completely before Whitebeard, he says, You don't need to say much, Ace. I have just one question for you, am I a worthy father? In his final moments, this question is all that matters to him. Hearing this, Ace, in great pain, responds without hesitation, of course. Hearing this resolute answer, Whitebeard chuckles contentedly, kindness in his eyes. Today, Whitebeard meets his end. Not in vain. On the boat, Ace clutches his head and cries. After a while, he rows the boat with a fervor, heading back the way he came. He no longer intends to pursue Teach. He's going home. The pirates begin to withdraw, and though reluctant, Ace turns and runs back with the others. At that moment, a Kainu suddenly appears from behind. He doesn't attack, he merely shouts from the rear, once Fire Fist Ace is rescued, the entire group retreats. Whitebeard really led a bunch of cowards. Observing those who keep moving, Akainu removes his hat, brushes off the dust with a sneer, and continues disdainfully, indeed, that's how a captain behaves, you can't allow this. In the end, Whitebeard was just a relic of the past era. As these words resound, Ace comes to a halt. At the Marine headquarters, Garp's expression darkens. At this moment, he feels the urge to slaughter the opposition. This is despicable. If you can't thwart their escape, at least don't mock them. Naruto fumes, seeing Whitebeard for who he truly was. This Akainu person is truly despicable. In the Bleach world, Aizen's eyes reveal disgust. Employing strategy showcases intelligence and wisdom. However, stooping to such low and shameless words not only displays a lack of dignity befitting a strong individual, but it's devoid of any semblance of strength. In the world of fate, a girl with disheveled hair drives her invisible sword forcefully into the ground, shameless wretch. Amiya Shiro is left speechless, his antique mahogany floor is being riled up. To protect his father's legacy, Ace abandons his escape and faces off against Akainu. Shut up! This era reverberates with the name Whitebeard. With a roar, Ace unleashes an unprecedented surge of power, flames enveloping his fists as he strikes Akainu. Observing this, a triumphant grin spreads across Akainu's face. The next instant, the rock beneath Akainu's feet erupts into magma, and his massive arm, encased in thick magma, swings. The two fists collide, fire meets magma, Ace is thrown back, gravely injured. Among the Whitebeard pirates, disbelief reigns, Akainu is formidable, but Ace shouldn't have fallen so swiftly. Akainu reveals the secret, Lava Lava Fruit counters Maramara Fruit. Akainu's gaze shifts to Luffy, who is on the ground gathering cards. He now knows that this person is the son of the revolutionary, Dragon, his lineage carries great guilt. Without hesitation, he summons a magma fist, aiming for Luffy. In the next heartbeat, Luffy raises his head with a vacant expression. His focus is on the scattered red beads, on Ace aflame, and on the magma fist piercing through his chest like a nightmare. The life card before him turns to ash in an instant. 
No. Why was I picking up cards? Why didn't I hide? Luffy cries out in disbelief on the deck, then, in the next moment, tears stream down his face, and he chants a single phrase. Where is he? Where is he? I have to find him. At Marine Headquarters, Garp stands up abruptly, ready to charge out. He could accept Ace's just execution as a pirate, but he cannot stomach such a disgraceful demise. He's going to annihilate a Kainu. Sengoku appears alarmed, quickly restraining Garp, it hasn't happened yet. Garp hesitates, then hoarsely says, you are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. I need some air. Seeing this, Sengoku releases his grip and exhales deeply. Akainu retracts his magma arm. Other pirates charge furiously, raining countless artillery shells upon Akainu's location. Terrifying explosions erupt ceaselessly. As the smoke clears, Akainu has lost a portion of his left shoulder, which rapidly regenerates. A swift recovery again, it's akin to high-speed regeneration. Aizen expresses curiosity in this instant. A certain person named Akiji displayed this type of regenerative ability before. It seems even more potent than high-speed regeneration. In the Hokage world, within an underground base, Orochimaru's eyes gleam with fervor. This physique surpasses his previous experiments by leaps and bounds. The scene continues, Akainu shows no intention of stopping, launching another attack. On the brink of death, Jinbei intervenes. Simultaneously, Ace begins to apologize to Luffy. He contemplates whether his existence was a mistake. Finally, Ace whispers his greatest regret into Luffy's ear. Luffy. The thing I can't let go of most. Is not being there to witness your dream coming true. I'm truly sorry. But I believe in you. Because. You're my brother. With these final words spoken, Ace's eyes well up with tears, and he expends his last ounce of strength, thank you. So much. In this moment, Fire Fist Ace died. Boom. Ace's body slumped to the ground, a stark black hole of blood on his back. Luffy trembled all over, struggling to accept or believe the scene before him. After everything they had been through, why did it end like this? It took a few seconds for reality to sink in. Ace had sacrificed himself to take that blow for Luffy. Ace. Was truly gone. Luffy's cries echoed through the sky, his voice piercing and devoid of tears. His eyes remained dry despite the overwhelming sorrow. Wasn't this level of sadness enough to warrant tears? No. On the contrary. Every observer understood. In this moment, the world of Luffy shattered into pieces, consumed by a darkness called despair. Perhaps even in the depths of hell, the boy wouldn't experience such misery. In the Hokage's world, Naruto wept uncontrollably, unable to come to terms with the fact that Ace had saved him only to perish himself. And Sasuke, the lone survivor of the Uchiha clan, quaked with emotion. His eyes turned blood red, reminiscent of the Sharingan. Through this loss, he could empathize with Luffy's anguish. The skies were collapsing. His sorrow was immeasurable. He wasn't just unwilling for himself, but for Luffy too. Why was their fate so cruel? In the shadows of a cave, Itachi felt an unexpected surge of emotion. He wished he could return to Sasuke and reveal everything. In the pirate world, on board the Moby Dick, Whitebeard's patience reached its limit. With a furious command, he ordered a relentless search for Ace. The future hadn't been written yet, there was still time to alter the course. Grief consumed everyone. Luffy's spirit waned as he crumbled. Akainu launched another attack, only to be thwarted by Marco. In accordance with Ace's final wish, the order was given for a retreat, Luffy was escorted away from the battlefield. Akainu's expression turned icy and menacing. He desired to eradicate these two brothers. Boom! A colossal silhouette cast a shadow, obscuring the light and enveloping Akainu. Akainu froze, his pupils dilating. He recognized who stood behind him. Edward Newgate, known as Whitebeard. Inside a meeting room, Sengoku exchanged a glance with Kizaru. Kizaru shrugged helplessly. There's no stopping Whitebeard's might. I wouldn't even try. In an instant, Whitebeard's boundless rage transformed into a terrifying force. 
a brilliant white light gathered around his fist, aimed at Akainu's head. The blow came down with thunderous power. The very air distorted as Akainu found himself defenseless, slammed into the ground, his form distorted. The ground cracked and trembled with the force. The entirety of Marineford shook violently. After the punch, Whitebeard leaped high, a white light igniting on his feet. He descended with immense force. Boom! The ground caved, shattered. Akainu struggled to counter, but Whitebeard made no attempt to defend, striking Akainu to his core. Akainu resembled a beaten dog, reduced to a state of utter defeat. But Whitebeard was on the brink of death, and Akainu seized the chance. With a single strike of his dark hound technique, Akainu struck Whitebeard's chest again. In the realm of pirates, Akainu smirked, confident that this blow was fatal, more powerful than the one that took Ace. Whitebeard's innards must be charred to a crisp. The world watching collectively believed this punch to be the end of Whitebeard. Whitebeard knelt, leaning on his sword, a searing wound still aflame. Akainu wore a smug grin, believing victory was certain. Yet, in the next heartbeat, Whitebeard's eyes snapped open. Simultaneously, his hand seized Akainu. Akainu, bloodied and battered, stared in disbelief. Whitebeard, thought to be dead, stood once more. Amid shocked gazes, Whitebeard hurled Akainu, who was at his limit. In an instant, white light illuminated Whitebeard's left hand again. How? Can he still have this much power? Akainu questioned, disbelieving. Even observers from other worlds found this scene unimaginable. They couldn't fathom how Whitebeard could move. But the astonishment continued. Boom! Whitebeard bellowed in fury, striking Akainu with intense determination. The fabric of space shattered again, cracks riddling Akainu's body like shattered glass. He shattered like water droplets. Akainu's face twisted in agony, blood spewing. Meanwhile, a tremendous force radiated outward. A seismic quake rocked Marineford, the solid ground crumbled, and a wounded Akainu plummeted into the chasm. The previously collapsed marine tower split anew from an immense force. Yet, the most astonishing sight was the chasm behind Whitebeard. Marineford fractured. The battlefield cleaved in two. On one side stood the Whitebeard pirates. On the other, Whitebeard faced the entire marine force alone. This was their final farewell, a father's ultimate guardianship over his child. A surreal sense of absurdity gripped everyone's hearts as they witnessed a scene defying all logic. The sight before them went against all common sense. This was a man who should have met his demise. Why did he not fall? How could he continue to fight? It was beyond comprehension. Is his strength solely fueled by his belief? Eisen marveled at this moment. It was the first time he had witnessed belief wield such immense power. In the realm of the Hokage, Jiraiya smiled and remarked, this is the essence of humanity. In the One Piece world, Sengoku couldn't help but be moved. Even though he was a staunch advocate of justice, he had to admit that this was a formidable adversary deserving of respect. Scene continues, the battlefield showed the marines relentlessly attacking Whitebeard, to no avail. However, this man remained standing, enduring blow after blow. One man leading, an army following behind. None could break through Whitebeard's defenses. Yet, some were puzzled. For instance, in the world of pirates, many marines couldn't fathom why Kizaru, Akiji, and Sengoku refrained from joining forces to defeat Whitebeard. Instead, they left it to the soldiers below. The celestial dragons were even more furious, demanding Sengoku's removal as marshal in favor of Akainu. At this juncture, the Blackbeard pirates emerged. Simultaneously, it was evident that several criminals from the sixth level of Impel Down had joined Blackbeard's ranks. These were vile individuals capable of unthinkable deeds. Whitebeard's eyes brimmed with fury, the person before him was the source of all the turmoil that day. Without Teach, none of this would have unfolded. Meanwhile, Blackbeard gazed at Whitebeard, who resembled a flickering candle, and chuckled with greed. Teach! Whitebeard bellowed in anger and swung his left fist once more. Activating the Quake Quake fruit power, the air shattered, sending a torrent of energy hurtling through the marines, crashing into the Blackbeard pirates. Yet, the dust settled, revealing the Blackbeard pirates unscathed. Whitebeard panted heavily, 
blood oozing from the gaping hole in his chest. Simultaneously, the collective voice of all echoed in their minds. Is this finally his limit? Nonetheless, the resilience he displayed was staggering and commendable. In that moment, a substance akin to black flames erupted from Teach's extremities, spreading rapidly. Concurrently, a swirling black tornado enveloped Teach. Transparent waves surged from within, covering everything in black before retracting to the center. As the cyclone dispersed, Teach confidently emerged. Dark Vortex Suddenly, the objects cloaked in darkness began to sink. Whitebeard, naturally, did not remain idle. He summoned a burst of white light from his hand, hurtling it towards Teach. Yet, at that very instant, Teach advanced, absorbing the full brunt of the earthquake's force with his dark fruit ability. Is this the true power of the dark fruit? All these years, has he been concealing his strength? Whitebeard's gaze turned icy. Meanwhile, the pirate world pondered strategies to counter its abilities. At the very least, they considered means of defense or escape. On a remote island, Teach's expression darkened. This video not only unveiled the extent of his dark fruit's abilities, but the events shown were unlikely to come to fruition. His grand plan had unraveled entirely. The suspense hung in the air. Just as everyone thought Whitebeard was reaching his limits, an unexpected turn unfolded. Whitebeard relinquishing his fruit's power, overpowering Teach solely with the Supreme Sword Murakuma Jairi. In a matter of moments, he triumphed over his adversary. Teach, now lying on the ground, revealed his villainous face, begging for mercy through tears. Whitebeard seized Teach's throat, triggering the Quake Quake fruit power once again. The ground trembled, hurling Teach along with debris into the air. Teach, however, survived the impact but sustained grave injuries upon landing. In Bleach World, eyes inside. The same sentiment was echoed by Madara in the Pure Land. Many formidable figures recognized that this man was finally running on fumes, otherwise, Blackbeard could never have survived the last assault. Whitebeard's body quivered slightly. Pirates worldwide comprehended the reason why. The weight of age, agony, and the countless wounds sustained in this war. Yet, within seconds, Whitebeard's body exuded intense steam, his skin reddening. Against all odds, he pressed on. Whitebeard propelled his battered form, clutching Murakuma Jairi tightly, resolutely moving forward. In Teach's eyes, Whitebeard resembled a demon king emerging from hell, every step a menace. With each stride, Teach's heart sank deeper, his fear intensifying. Whitebeard delivered a mighty blow. You monster, trembling, Teach shouted and drew the pistol at his waist, firing wildly. The punch halted just inches from Teach's terror-stricken eyes, the earlier bullet serving as the proverbial straw. Whitebeard coughed blood, yet he did not waver. Observing this, Teach laughed hysterically, joined by the rest of the Blackbeard pirates closing in with malicious grins. Previously, they had refrained from firing, but now, they reveled in their newfound boldness. Blades, fists, guns, a cacophony of attacks. For a moment, the Whitebeard pirates could only witness the scene through bullet-riddled cloaks and splattered blood. Despite the marks and stains, Whitebeard stood firm. After the onslaught ceased, Teach realized in horror that Whitebeard still lived. However, he quickly realized that Whitebeard was on the brink of death. Whitebeard grappled with his memories. He recalled his moments with Roger beneath the cherry blossom tree. Recollections of his refusal to journey to Raftel resurfaced. He remembered Roger's words, the will of the D. The scene shifted to the present, with Whitebeard declaring, one day, someone will inherit Roger and Ace's will. Sengoku, the catastrophic war you feared, involving the entire world, will inevitably transpire in the future. Though I lack interest, the discovery of that treasure will upend the world. At this, Whitebeard laughed akin to Roger before his demise. He concluded with words that incensed Sengoku, one piece. It do exist. Whether witnessed live or through broadcasts. The shock reverberated through everyone. Simultaneously, Countless individuals across the pirate world were left in disbelief. One piece was indeed real. Within the naval headquarters, Sengoku seethed. He knew it was over. Chaos was bound to engulf the world once more. End here. Whitebeard's life flashed before him, 
from solitude to a family of countless members. The images were enthralling. A splendid journey. Barigado. Farewell, my sons. Following the earth-shattering roar, the mighty Whitebeard, Edward Newgate, met his end standing tall. In this pivotal moment, words began to etch themselves onto the screen. Throughout the tumultuous battle, Edward Newgate endured 267 stabs, withstood 152 gunshots, and braved 46 cannon shells. Yet, his stance never wavered, his posture unwaveringly dignified. As the wind billowed, his cloak fluttered to the ground, revealing Whitebeard's immaculate back, proof that he always confronted his adversaries, with no hint of retreat. In essence, his life as a pirate bore no stain of cowardice or flight. Ultimately, the imposing skull emblem on Whitebeard's broad back grew larger, its details becoming immaculately clear. The scene freezes here, transitioning to the final epilogue. This era. Known by the name of Whitebeard. Just like after Whitebeard's death, there are comments belonging to him. However, to the surprise of many viewers, what appeared this time was not a text comment, but a short new video. The screen dimmed at first, then lit up a little later. The sound of the waves and the chirping of seagulls overlaps. Under the sunset. The pirates are happily dividing up the treasure they just found, planning what to do when they disembark. However, a blonde young man did not participate. At this time, the captain suddenly turned his head and asked with a big laugh, Strange, pirates are not interested in treasure, so what do you like, Newgate? Okay. The young man just thought for a moment, and after a while he said without hesitation, Family. At this moment, the blonde pirate leaned against the side of the ship with his chin up, his mouth curled up like his beard years later. One Piece World, on the Moby Dick, Whitebeard is surrounded by sons who are crying. Newgate laughs and it feels good to be surrounded by family. This is the meaning of his life. At the same time, Ace desperately rowed the boat towards the direction he came from. In the influence of the future, he did not feel panic or even fear when he died. But when he remembered that his father died standing at the end, his heart was as painful as being twisted by a knife. This scene must not happen in the future. And Luffy has only one idea at this time, that is to find Ace. He couldn't accept the future where Ace stood in front of him and was punched through. Naval Headquarters At this point, Sengoku felt his head about to explode. Celestial dragons were extremely dissatisfied after watching the video, and their words were very ugly. After an indiscriminate bombardment, they said that they wanted Sengoku to make reforms, or they would replace the marshal. At the same time, Sengoku fell silent, and he suddenly felt that the justice he stood for was different. After a while, he had a choice. Maybe by resigning from the post of marshal, I can see more clearly and see farther. In the world of hunters, the indifferent eyes of the ant king Maruam have a different color, and the thoughts in his heart have changed unknowingly. Humans, maybe mean more than just domination, but how to differentiate? Shinigami world, Aizen's gaze becomes distant. After a while, his eyes narrow slightly, and a smile appears on the corner of his mouth. He remembered that there seemed to be a group of people in this world who possessed an ability called, Complete Reveal. Anyway, the experiment here is not finished, maybe you can try it out with an interesting script first. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara falls into his memories. Once upon a time, he had his best friend, his beloved younger brother. He walked carefully in the war, cherishing the hard-won bonds. However, that corrupted world eventually destroyed everything. But there is still a chance. Madara's eyes light up, and in the near future, he will finally create an ultimate world. No war. No pain. Everyone will have the most perfect eternal happiness in their hearts. Madara seems to have glimpsed that bright future. His face rarely softens, a smile appears at the corner of his mouth, and he falls into a state of serenity. Over the years, this is how he has endured in the pure land. What else can a lonely soul do? Suddenly, Madara wakes up. He looks up and finds that the screen in front of him has changed again. A gray screen with snowflake dots reappears, along with a countdown, 3. The image brightens. The next second, Uchiha Madara's eyes widen. He sees a radiant moon hanging in the dark blue night sky. There are circles of Rinnegan patterns on the moon, and at the same time, it is adorned with nine tomo, shining brightly at this moment. 
Beneath the moon, a white-haired man wearing a white feathered coat with scarlet eyes on his forehead is forming a hand seal. How is this possible? This is me. Uchiha Madara is stunned for only two seconds before recognizing that it is himself. Soon after, he bursts into hearty laughter. Looking at the scene, he has successfully cast the infinite Tsukuyumi. But then he realizes, this video depicts a famous death scene. So, he dies after that. Why does he die? Could there be side effects of the infinite Tsukuyumi technique? Madara is silent for a few seconds, but then he smiles. It doesn't matter, if he dies, he dies, success is what matters. Meanwhile, in the world of the ninjas, the villagers' faces turn pale. If they're reading it right, the man's eyes display the legendary Rinnegan. They didn't expect this video to be from their own world. But what's happening in this scene, they don't understand at all. Only a limited number of people, like Anoki and Hiruzen Sarutobi, feel cold sweat running down their backs. Though his appearance has changed, that face and that demeanor unmistakably identify the person before them. Anoki's pupils quake, how is it possible, Uchiha Madara has been resurrected. And his attitude seems extremely terrifying, just looking at the screen sends shivers down their spines. At this moment, he recalls a scene from his childhood, and the fear he harbored then resurfaces. Rain Shinobi Village, Tendo Yehiko furrows his brows. Rinnegan. What's on his forehead? Inside a dark cave, Abito wears a grim expression. At this moment, a pitcher plant rises, white Zetsu chuckles, and black Zetsu's eyes turn solemn. It desperately hopes this video won't be aired. I hope the video won't be shown, black Zetsu can only wish in his heart. The title now displays on the screen. The famous death scene, no. The world of Hokage, fact or fiction. Uchiha Madara's death. Anoki remained tense despite the title. While it's widely believed that Uchiha Madara should have met his end in that last battle, what transpired on his side just before his demise? Would there be no calamity, or would it claim countless lives? Currently, beneath Uchiha Madara's looming presence, the moon revealed an ominous glow. He simply hoped to uncover any potential solutions through future revelations. In the Pure Land, Uchiha Madara also pondered this scenario. Yet, a faint smile graced his lips as Black Zetsu hovered nearby, as long as resurrection was attainable, all obstacles could be overcome. Concerns over the accuracy of the title eluded him. To him, it seemed a reference to the infinite Tsukuyumi. After all, this illusion held no true substance, it merely affirmed his success. Within a cavern, Itachi narrowed his eyes in contemplation. As expected, the man concealed beneath the Uzumaki mask bore no resemblance to Madara. The two possessed contrasting auras, akin to night and day. Near a bonfire, Kisame frowned. As a formidable warrior, he discerned that the masked man was, without a doubt, not Uchiha Madara. But this revelation only deepened his bewilderment. In the world of One Piece, Sengoku's brow furrowed. A disconcerting sensation emanated from the figure before him. Such hockey, all-encompassing and tinged with a hint of madness. Each sign indicated that the individual confronting him wasn't one to uphold justice. Uchiha Madara. How audacious. Aizen's gaze intensified, an inkling that the person in front of him was bound to astonish. Within the Toru Majitsu no index world, Kamiju Toma clenched his right hand, sensing an impending horror about the enigmatic figure. In the Dragon Ball universe, Master Rashi blinked, too, it's been years since I last glimpsed the moon, and its beauty remains unchanged. Absolutely. I wonder how Goku would react to this sight. Scene transition, a desolate expanse of desert. A coffin emerges from the earth. In the next instant, the coffin shatters. With a voice brimming with anticipation, the day has arrived, little boy, Nagato has finally matured. A man clad in crimson armor emerges, his voice laced with excitement. Uchiha Madara in the underworld frowned upon seeing the wooden coffin. In the rain shinobi village, Nagato's heart quivered, unsure why the video's narrator made that claim. Foreboding weighed heavily on his heart. Within an underground lair, Orochimaru's excitement surged. Impure world reincarnation. What could possibly transpire in the future? To think, I've summoned Uchiha Madara. 
The reanimation Jutsu Seal Compendium remains incomplete, but it's progressing. He's certain he stands alone in this endeavor. At that moment, a bandage-clad figure materialized, astounded by the revelation that impure world reincarnation pertained to Uchiha Madara. Uchiha Madara voiced his dissatisfaction, impure world reincarnation. Not the Rinne Tensei technique. Anoki and Nagato found themselves dumbfounded. Even the second Suchikage was resurrected. Madara's skepticism about the employment of the Rinne Tensei technique left others similarly stunned. As bewilderment engulfed the Hokage's world, the ensuing scenes would rattle their very souls. Scene transition, a multitude of ninja coalition forces enters the scene. In the subsequent heartbeat, Uchiha Madara takes to the field. The tableau unfolds as one versus countless. Numbers seem irrelevant, a mockery of statistics. Uchiha Madara transforms the battlefield into a no-man's land, as ninjas are sent soaring through the air. Not a single foe brushes his clothing. Uchiha Madara's honed combat prowess takes center stage, a dance of death. Yet more terrifying, Uchiha Madara's B-level fire style, reduced to a single seal, ignites into an inferno, consuming all. It takes a collective water-style effort, involving hundreds of ninjas, to barely quell the flames. A one-sided massacre unfolds. When the elite coalition forces seize an opportune moment, Naruto unleashes a massive Rasengan. But the attack meets a towering blue barrier. Moments later, Madara invokes Susanoo, laying waste to all before him. Yet Gara capitalizes, summoning Sans to extricate Uchiha Madara from Susanoo's grip. In the blink of an eye, Naruto hurls a spinning shuriken with all his might. Is that me in the future? I seem so formidable. Naruto's exhilaration shifts to bewilderment in the blink of an eye. Madara calmly extends his hands, Sharingan rapidly morphs into a new form, intricate patterns taking shape. A shuriken of devastating potential is effortlessly absorbed. Impossible. Nagato gasps, his eyes wide and breath rapid. He struggles to comprehend Sharingan's transformation into Rinnegan. Ninja Village's Kages mirror his confusion, the suddenness of the scene, coupled with its wealth of information, leaves them grasping for understanding. In mere seconds, all color drains from their faces. Even observers from alternate dimensions share in the shock. Madara employs the Susaki seal. The sky darkens instantly. The United Ninja Alliance stands frozen, gazing upward in disbelief. Is this Uchiha Madara? Desperation sweeps through not only those within the scene but also those witnessing from the real world. An enormous meteorite hurtles through the atmosphere, hurtling toward impact. Support me on my KOFI account and read up to 15 early chapters, https colon slash slash ko-fi.com slash aaume can humans truly command an attack resembling a natural disaster. Just kidding. An illusion, it must be an illusion. At this moment, the inhabitants of the ninja world were left dumbfounded. They couldn't fathom how to counter the meteorite nor find an escape from their current situation. Is this the fate that awaits them? It's a grim sight indeed. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara clenched his hands over his chest, a smug grin touching the corners of his mouth. Utilizing a body from the reanimation jutsu has proven effective for this technique. Within the One Piece world, Whitebeard contemplated whether he could halt it with his Tremor Tremor fruit abilities. However, the issue lay in the meteorite's lethality not being solely within the meteorite itself, but rather the potential energy it carried. Even breaking it apart would unleash substantial damage. At Marine Headquarters, Sengoku's expression grew serious, the individual before him was unquestionably malevolent. Summoning forth this type of natural calamity dared to defy reason. In his eyes, none among the assemblage below would survive. In the world of the Shinigami, Aizen's eyes brimmed with excitement. Indeed, the person he had harbored optimism for was proving their mettle, this maneuver was nothing short of earth-shattering. And he possessed an inkling that Uchiha Madara's composed countenance indicated this wasn't the pinnacle of his arsenal. Within the Dragon Ball world, Master Rashi blinked, his expression calm. It's all right, Kamehameha should be enough to handle this. However, such nonchalance was reserved for the mighty. In those worlds of lesser power, all spectators quivered inwardly. Their spines tingled, and cold sweat soaked their skin. Within the world of Gintama, 
the three typically indifferent figures turned pale, their laughter fading. In the universe of Demon Slayer, be it demon or human, the previous battle suddenly appeared ludicrous. By contrast, akin to children's make-believe. They couldn't fathom how humans had come to command such a natural catastrophe. And when a person wields such might, can they still be considered human? The sky darkened entirely, the outline of the meteorite came into full view. As it drew closer, the immense pressure left everyone breathless. Ninjas were in despair. You fool. How can this be? Our strength pales in comparison across dimensions. Some ninjas even wept. Their fear wasn't truly of death. Merely avoiding death was futile. At least let it come in combat. At this juncture, such a demise held no meaning. Suddenly, a figure soared towards the heavens. It's Tsuchikich. His small, slender form seemed minuscule compared to the meteorite, yet his eyes held unyielding resolve. Was this a desperate act of self-sacrifice? Such thoughts raced through countless minds. Yet, Anoki's eyes brimmed with determination. Earth style, super lightweight rock technique. Suddenly, the meteorite's pace visibly decelerated, in the world of the Shinigami, Aizen observed, his curiosity peaked. The unusual ninjutsu in this world rivaled Kido. Could it possibly provide insight to fashion new Kido spells? In that moment, colossal sand arms surged skyward, firmly arresting the meteorite. As sand density heightened, Tsuchikage clung with every ounce of strength, successfully intercepting the meteorite. Uchiha Madara chuckled, prompt with praise, Anoki, that lad, his potential has flourished. In Iwagakure, Anoki recalled the dread he felt when Achiha Madara lorded over him during his youth. Now, hearing the other's accolades, he swelled with pride. Beside him, Kuratsuchi nudged him playfully, not bad, old man. In the desolate expanse, Daidara pursed his lips, you've really outdone yourself, geezer. Across Sunagakir, the fourth Kazakage, Raza, regarded the spectacle in disbelief. If his eyes served him right, that lad was none other than Gara. Not him alone, everyone in the village of the sand bore the same incredulous expression. Doubt lingered earlier, yet as the view zoomed in, affirmation settled in. That detested Jinchuriki not only ascended to Kazakage but also wielded such power. What lay in the pages of the future? Just moments ago, I believed death to be inevitable, yet peril dissipated in the blink of an eye. Crowds erupted in cheers, faces radiating the joy of a newfound lease on life. Anoki, beneath the meteorite, mirrored their jubilation. However, a fleeting blue aura danced into view. For those beyond the screen's confines, the picture remained enigmatic. A moment later, Uchiha Madara's voice resonated from the screen, a faint smile tugging at his lips, hee hee. So, how shall you contend with the second one? Anoki. What? The second one. Even Aizen stood aghast. Was there no end to this onslaught? In the pirate world, admirals and even Kaido's demeanor shifted. Could such a cataclysmic attack be executed consecutively? Further down in the hierarchy, Uchiha Madara reigned as a god. As Uchiha Madara's words faded, high above, a meteorite twice the size of the initial one pierced through the clouds. Before anyone could react, it collided with the first. Within the ninja world, Anoki's smile wavered. In that moment, he was transported back to his youth, gazing upon Uchiha Madara for the first time. His form shuddered involuntarily. In the universe of One Punch Man, the entire hero association was left in awe. This catastrophe had escalated to a level beyond imagination, reaching the level of a dragon threat. A meteorite plummeted towards the city, promising total annihilation and reducing it to a wasteland. Even Tornado couldn't hide her astonishment. Though she could potentially manipulate her psychic abilities to intercept meteorites, the scale of this one was overwhelming. However, the difference in size between her and the meteorite was insurmountable. Furthermore, the newcomer displayed an air of complete nonchalance, hinting at even more terrifying powers lying dormant. Perhaps only King and Blast possessed the capability to withstand this formidable figure. While observers from other worlds might have merely been taken aback, in the world of the Hokage, fear and desperation gripped everyone. This was the foreboding future they were destined to confront. Initially, relief washed over as the first meteorite was intercepted. 
but the tide turned with astonishing swiftness, shrouding hearts in darkness once more. Boom, the impact was devastating, instantly obliterating Tsuchikich. This time, no savior emerged. The colossal meteorite crashed and unleashed havoc upon the land. The resulting shockwaves reverberated for thousands of kilometers, even reaching the distant coalition headquarters. A plume of smoke and debris ascended into the sky, revealing a field strewn with the fallen bodies of ninjas. In the end, only a handful survived, those either favored by fortune or possessing powerful defensive techniques. Miracles, it seemed, were in short supply. Confronted with this grim tableau, countless ninjas within the Hokage world knelt to the ground, clutching their heads in helplessness. Merely 20 survivors remained, 000-20, simple arithmetic revealed the staggering loss. Against this person, the size of the ninja coalition became meaningless. More unsettling was the realization that this display of power was just a fraction of Uchiha Madara's true strength. In an instant, the previous three ninja wars paled in comparison, suddenly seeming far less merciless. As for the future, could anyone truly hope to endure? Most ninjas were plagued by disheartening despondency, shadows of their former selves. There was little solace to be found, only the hope that the video feed would unveil moments of triumph. The scene persisted. Madara and Second Suchikage were formed from the rubble, their bodies unscathed, devoid of a single scar, immortal. This spectacle sent shockwaves throughout the world, even those superior to Madara in power couldn't help but feel awestricken. In the pure land, Madara's eyes held a glimmer of mockery, a faint smile playing upon his lips. Senju Tobarama, this is the fruit of your forbidden technique. As the audience watched, Madara unveiled his secret, his original battle with Hashirama was aimed at acquiring the first Hokage cells. With his revelation made, Madara initiated another seal. The world transformed. The earth convulsed, birthing countless colossal trees that erupted from the ground. Each tree, thick as a massive pillar, snaked towards the onlookers like supple vines. In this dire moment, Naruto summoned thousands of shadow clones fueled by the Nine Tails Chakra, uniting their efforts to unleash a gargantuan Rasengan. This combined effort barely halted the advance of the God Tree. Even as Madara advanced, unrelenting, a brilliant light pierced the scene, for other Hokages appeared on the battlefield. In the Hokage's world, witnessing the five Kages unite in combat rekindled a glimmer of hope within the hearts of the dispirited ninjas. These few individuals represented the zenith of ninja prowess. Five against one, the odds seemed poised for a reversal. In the pure land, Madara's lips curled into an anticipatory smile, eager to gauge the strength of the current five Kages. Surely they weren't lacking in might. The five Kages, hailed as the mightiest in this era. His words marked the beginning of the conflict. Madara remained unhurried, initially wielding only the first tier of Susanoo, gradually releasing his power. Susanoo's arms swayed gently, propelling a sphere of potent blue energy that roared forth. It was promptly intercepted by Futan Kazakage and the Sand Behemoth. The battle persisted, with the five Kages adeptly balancing offense and defense. Soon, however, Madara's onslaught escalated. His advent of a world of flowering trees jutsu combined with the fearsome fire style, devastatingly defeating almost all five fighters in an instant. Thankfully, at a pivotal juncture, Tsuchika Janoki rose again, igniting his radiant power and reinvigorating the fallen. Bolstered by Anoki's inspiration, the other four Kages surged to their feet. And so, the war resumed. Tsunade unleashed her mitotic regeneration technique, showcasing remarkable recuperative capabilities. Yet, despair followed as Madara split into 25 clones, each wielding the might of Susanoo. Desperation compelled several to gamble everything, pooling their chakra for a final, desperate assault. Tsunade channeled her lifetime of accumulated chakra into Anoki. In an instant, an enormous dust release and boundary breaking technique erupted. A colossal cube of luminous white light materialized, annihilating the 25 Susanoos in the blink of an eye. Merely half of Uchiha Madara's body remained, barely escaping the onslaught. At that crucial instant, a colossal water dragon crackling with lightning materialized, swallowing Madara whole. The electrically charged waters and the sealing sands engulfed him, as the five Kages harnessed their combined strength. In the blink of an eye, they reversed the tide, imprisoning Uchiha Madara. 
this triumph ignited jubilation among the ninja ranks, kindling their dwindling spirits. In the pure land, Madara's expression twisted into a sneer. Elsewhere, the soul of Senju Hashirama shook with a rueful sigh. Yet, in the next breath, a radiant azure blaze erupted, and the so-called imprisonment shattered like fragile paper. A torrent of terrifying chakra surged forth, the azure aura ascending to the sky. Trembling, the five kages looked up, beholding a nightmare made real. The camera panned, revealing an inconceivably massive figure standing amid the rubble, a towering giant. By comparison, even the enormous meteorite barely reached the giant's waist. With casual ease, the giant drew its sword, and mountains in the distance crumbled and exploded. In this moment it was as though a god had descended upon the world. But the scene shifted again, Madara vanished. And the five kages, deemed the epitome of strength, succumbed to the ruins, meeting their end. In the pure land, Madara's disappointment was palpable. The so-called five kages proved disappointingly fragile. At that very moment, Aizen's indifference was shattered, replaced by a shock in his eyes. With a single swing of his blade, the mountain would crumble. Furthermore, there stood a colossal figure, stretching up to a kilometer in height, a representation of unmatched destructive might. I have greatly underestimated you, Achiha. Madara. Within the Soul Society, Kamamura Sajin stood agape in disbelief. In contrast, Kakujo Tenjen Myo, whom he once took pride in, seemed like a mere dwarf, utterly inconsequential. In that instance, Yamamoto Genryusai's eyes widened fully, his gaze radiant. In the world of Hokage, Uchiha Itachi's countenance underwent a drastic change. His heart raced, perplexed by the overwhelming power of Susanoo from Uchiha Madara, who also bore the Mangekyo Sharingan. He entertained suspicions that his own Susanoo might falter against this triple-bladed onslaught. Could this be the transformative effect of the eternal Mangekyo? After contemplation, this seemed the most plausible explanation. His resolve solidified further in this moment. In the village hidden in the rain, Nagato remained in absolute silence. The self-proclaimed god now bore witness to an entity beyond godliness. Within the five great ninja villages, the five kage exchanged unsettled glances, incapable of grasping the spectacle before them. The notion of unwavering determination and indomitable will was now a jest in the face of this singular being. Ordinary shinobi fared even worse. Their emotions swung from the despair of the initial meteor's approach to the hope of Anoki's successful interception, only to plummet back to hopelessness with the second meteor's descent. The five kage materialized, their emotional turmoil oscillating ceaselessly. Countenances were now etched with desolation, and some even succumbed to hysteria, laughing madly as they embraced the prospect of mutual annihilation. In the world of pirates, figures like Sengoku, Whitebeard, and Kaido fell into silence. They pondered the outcome if they were to confront this behemoth. Could victory ever be theirs? Swiftly, heads shook, the answer unequivocal, no. Setting aside the adversary's apparent immortality, the array of concealed stratagems further complicated matters. Thank the stars this isn't within our world, otherwise, there'd be no game left to play, murmured Da Flamingo, his earlier laughter vanishing. The screen continues to dim, showcasing disjointed images of Uchiha Madara. Upon illumination, a new battlefield unfolds before the viewer. Amid crumbling ruins, a man bearing a twisted scar across half his visage holds a fan, his countenance frigid. His right eye gleams with Mangekyo Sharingan, while the left boasts the Rinnegan. Like. But how can this be? Witnessing this tableau, Kakashi in the Hokage's world widened his eye, heart pounding. Boom. Kakashi was struck as if by lightning, disbelief overwhelming him. Why? How could Abito yet breathe, standing squarely against the ninja alliance? In the depths of a shadowed cavern, Abito removed his mask, his eyes exuding an abyssal darkness. Elsewhere, Kisame chortled, Itachi, the Uchiha clan surely has an extraordinary lineage. Within the walls of Kanoha village, Sarutobi Hiruzen wore a somber expression. If memory served, this individual's name still graced the memorial tablet. A bitter irony now pervaded the situation. Danzo, seated across from him, emitted a scornful snort. Third Hokage, behold. Our initial judgment of the Uchiha bloodline's malevolence was accurate. 
With urgency, Danzo pressed, we can't afford delay for future crises. Hand over the fox at the video's conclusion. Silent, third Hokage wrestled with turmoil within. The screen resumes, fast forwarding in time. Abito subdues the tentails in its incomplete form. Madara, seemingly bored, observes the clash. During this interval, he witnesses the so-called ninja alliance technique, modest in potency yet remarkable in the unity of warriors from every village. In the realm beyond, Madara entertains uncertainties. Had the ninja truly learned to comprehend each other as Hashirama had envisioned? Yet, swiftly, he negates the notion, well aware of the inherent rivalry among the ninja villages. Within the world of the Shinigami, Aizen's eyes brim with disdain. Merely a consequence of a common adversary's emergence. Seemingly absent from the ensuing combat, Madara's presence fades as the screen advances. Throughout, the Hokages of previous eras descends to the battlefield. The Tentails succumb swiftly to their sealing techniques, bolstering the coalition force's morale. And then, Madara's endurance wavers. As time marches on, destiny turns in cycles. Uchiha Madara and Senju Hashirama clash anew. Resurgent, a giant reminiscent of mythic deities looms. Simultaneously, a dreadfully towering wooden golem emerges. Susanoo's blade cleaves with an unswerving trajectory, mountains crumbling upon its wake. The colossal wooden golem, too, wields titanic power, the earth quaking beneath every step. Entwined, they wage war akin to primordial gods and demons, leaving desolation in their wake. In a moment seized, Madara propels Susanoo in a heavy strike. Swift and decisive, the wooden golem clamps the assault with interlocked hands. At a distance, the assembled ninja coalition watches in stupefaction, the conflict surpassing even their wildest imaginations. In the Hokage's world, the shinobi stand stunned by the first Hokage's overwhelming might, collectively exhaling a sigh of relief. In other dimensions, observers have grown numbed. Such battles seem but myths in their native worlds. The earth trembled as immense ravines cracked open, mountain peaks crumbled, and rivers changed course. The landscape shifted continuously, creating an ever-changing terrain. In the midst of this chaos, the surroundings transformed into an empty, forbidden zone as if nature itself was protesting. However, not long after, Uchiha Madara fell behind in the battle, eventually being sealed by Hashirama's sage art, Rashomon Gate. Uchiha Madara found himself trapped under a dozen enormous Tori gates, immobilized. The morale of the ninja coalition soared upon witnessing this sight. Even the spirits of the Hokage were lifted. For the first time, the ninjas glimpsed hope, their hearts saved by the power of the first Hokage of Kanoha, much like a savior. Deep within the pure land, Madara's expression turned smug. Despite being slightly weaker than Hashirama during his lifetime due to chakra imbalances, he knew his strength had now surpassed Hashirama's. The impure world reincarnation granted him limitless chakra, rendering him slightly mightier than Hashirama. Even if not inherently powerful, he would not be defeated. With his current state of confinement, it was evident that he had a plan in motion. But what exactly was he plotting? In the world of the Shinigami, Aizen watched with curiosity. He saw through the situation, recognizing that Uchiha Madara's ceiling was no accident. Marvelous. I anticipate your upcoming performance even more. The scene transitioned, the camera shifting focus. Uchiha Abito, somehow, had absorbed the ghetto statue and became the Ten Tails Jinchuriki. However, the details were fragmented and fleeting. Abito, in his six paths form, possessed unparalleled combat prowess that had once driven the ninja coalition to despair. Yet, it all devolved into a recording. The ending had been inverted. Abito's resolve wavered beneath Naruto's words. The tailed beasts were forcibly extracted, crashing down heavily. In a surprising twist, Abito began to introspect, apologizing and intending to use the Rinnegan's Rinne Tensei technique to resurrect fallen comrades. In the pure land, Madara didn't respond with anger, instead, he burst into uncontrollable laughter. Uchiha Abito, you're still as fragile as ever, you bastard. Ha 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 ha. Within a dark cavern, Abito's eyes trembled in disbelief. Was the person in that video really him? If so, why had he acted so foolishly? Could it be Naruto's doing, casting illusions on him? No. 
I'd never allow myself to become so vulnerable. Abito roared, a surge of murderous intent directed at Naruto. Simultaneously, the creator of the video was also perplexed. His previous clips had breezed through, but this one had his full attention, refusing to skip ahead. The situation felt distasteful, akin to a public self-execution. In the Shinigami world, Aizen was at a loss for words. What was this? It was too comical. He was witnessing a villain's conviction crumble solely under verbal influence, such vulnerability. Beyond Aizen, villains from other worlds couldn't help but mock the spectacle. Even the trembling Muzan Kibutsuji regarded the scene with contempt. The scene continued. Among the ninja coalition, excitement ran high. Uchiha Madara was sealed, and Uchiha Abito was separated from the Ninetales beast. Victory in this war seemed within reach. Smiles adorned everyone's faces as the atmosphere brimmed with optimism. Suddenly, a black tentacle-like appendage burst from under Abito, transforming into a pitch-black liquid that engulfed him. The long-awaited black Zetsu had taken full control of Abito. In the next moment, the Rinet Tensei technique was activated amid sinister laughter. Uchiha Madara truly returned to life. Simultaneously, in the dark cave, an enraged Abito lunged at Black Zetsu, but his fist struck only the ground, the enemy had vanished. It seems the tables have turned, Abito muttered, his resolve solidified as he donned his Uzumaki mask. He was headed to find Nagato. The video had changed things, turning them into allies against the looming threat of Uchiha Madara. Uchiha Madara, like an insurmountable mountain, overshadowed both of them. Any future concerns seemed trivial, death was imminent. At that moment, Uchiha Sasuke appeared, his expression proud. Amaterasu. Dark flames ignited on Uchiha Madara, but he didn't even bother to look back, sneering, such trivial flames can't compare to my power. The flames dissipated harmlessly, much to everyone's surprise. In the world of the Hokage, Itachi couldn't help but twitch a wry smile. The Mangekyo Sharingan's ocular techniques were potent, but he hadn't anticipated such swift resolution. On the rooftop in the Shinigami world, Kairaku Shunsue laughed heartily. TSK TSK, Sasuke's outward aggression has been met with someone even more adept at feigning. A classic slap in the face. Madara extended his arm, blood flowing from a bite, yet he grinned with pleasure. The taste of blood is exquisite. Though his Rinnegan had faded due to his non-transcendent state, Madara was intoxicated by the sensation of his own flowing blood. This sensation surpassed any enjoyment he derived from combat. In the blink of an eye, Madara vanished, sending Naruto and others flying before absorbing chakra from Senju Hashirama's body. In that instant, Sasuke descended from above, Kusanagi sword in hand. With a sneer, he remarked on Madara's vulnerability since losing his immortality. Does the Susanoo aid your agility? Madara proposed an alliance, but Sasuke rejected it outright, claiming that his choice was a mistake. The Kages, having regrouped after a brief defeat, returned to the fray. Naruto, Sasuke, and the Ninetales suppressed the sightless Uchiha Madara and even severed one of his arms. The coalition cheered, victory within their grasp. Yet, a white Zetsu emerged suddenly, and Uchiha Madara's arm burst forth to absorb it. Madara's expression twisted into a sinister grin, as he inserted something into his eye. Ninjas everywhere tensed. The realization hit them all at once, Madara had awoken a Rinnegan. Uchiha Madara then summoned the ghetto statue from within Abito. Gazing at the tailed beasts, he wore a smug smile. At last, a graceful battle awaits. A mysterious attack ensued, overwhelming the tailed beasts, rendering them powerless. Madara controlled them, sealing them within the ghetto statue. As the Nine Tails Jinchuriki, Naruto's life force waned rapidly, his Uzumaki bloodline the only reason he clung to life. The ninja's frustration was palpable, their doubts resurfaced. Could this man truly be defeated? The scene continued. Senju Tobarama executed a surprise assault using the Flying Thunder God technique, but Madara turned the tide, ultimately impaling Tobarama with a black rod. Tobarama appeared to listen to Madara's words, almost hypnotized. Meanwhile, a swift figure descended from above, positioning itself behind Madara. Tobarama's triumphant expression faltered as he realized he had been baited. Uchiha Sasuke stood frozen behind Madara, 
as though suspended in time. With a composed expression, Madara turned and grasped Sasuke's fallen pheasant sword. I granted you an opportunity. But alas, you made the wrong choice. Without hesitation, Madara thrust the sword through Sasuke's heart. Off screen, Sasuke was panting heavily, his body trembling uncontrollably, and his clothes drenched in sweat. The sensation of impending death was overwhelming. The sword felt as if it was piercing his heart through the screen. What infuriated him even more was the clip just before, where Senju Hashirama compared him to Uchiha Madara's younger brother and asserted that Madara wouldn't kill him. But when he turned to the screen, he met a cold, heartless gaze. In the pure land, even Uchiha Madara's soul remained indifferent. Hashirama was still too naive, thinking that someone who resembled Azuna could make Madara abandon his plans. The scene continues, the ghetto statue vanishes, and Uchiha Madara casually tosses Sasuke onto the sword like garbage. Seeing Sasuke desperately crawling on the ground, unwilling to succumb, Madara abruptly turns around. Anyone who stands against me shall meet their doom. And he no longer requires anyone standing behind him alive. Uchiha Madara steps forward and summons the ghetto statue once more. He simply walks, yet the colossal ten tails behind him flows into him like water. A cloud of dust billows into the sky. Everyone is left in shock. A figure emerges with long snow-white hair, adorned in a curved jade feather robe, wielding a pitch-black iron staff, with nine truth-seeking balls orbiting around him. The aura is overwhelming and suffocating. This is the Ten Tails Jinchuriki. Or one could say. The Sage of Six Paths Madara. The mountainous pressure seems to seep through the screen, leaving countless breathless. Aizen squints, sensing that he might not win without the Hogyoku. The opponent's current form gives him an eerie feeling, almost flawless. In the world of the Hokage, Orochimaru remains frozen in place. This body is the embodiment of his ultimate ambition. Is this the power of the Sage of Six Paths? Perhaps my plans should be altered. Orochimaru's typically pale face flushes for the first time. Surpassing even Abito's incomplete state. Hashirama, in the pure land, is also perplexed. Prevailing against the demigodly Abido before was a stroke of luck, but what about Madara, who's evidently stronger than Abido? The six-path Madara soars into the air, heading toward Abido, determined to reclaim his other eye. Unexpectedly, Abido breaks free from control and strikes backhandedly at Madara. He absorbs a portion of the Ten Tails' power from Madara's body. Nevertheless, Kakashi and Abito remain unequal adversaries. Just as Madara is about to deliver the final blow, a long-awaited figure descends from the heavens. Boom! A verdant silhouette intercepts all attacks and stands before Kakashi. Hey, Kakashi, you holding up? Hearing the familiar voice, Kakashi smiles. Though he had forcibly unleashed a wave of 5% of his power and nearly perished. The smoke and debris clear, revealing a man sporting bushy eyebrows and a mushroom-styled haircut in a green jumpsuit. Uchiha Madara seems to recognize the image but, after a few seconds of contemplation, failing to place it, responds with an indifferent smile, even with reinforcements, you're just a speck of gravel. Observing the incapacitated allies, Guy springs into action with resolve. Does this mean it's time for me to appear as a blue beast? In the world of Hokage, the faint excitement of the ninjas wanes. Anticipating the arrival of a mighty ninja, they are met with disappointment at this ordinary figure. Many formidable ninjas instantly recognize him in Kanoha, for he's none other than elite Jonin Mike Guy. While usually regarded as a potent combatant, he is, in truth, a common ninja of the village. But what could such a being achieve in a battle where Kages are impotent? Merely cannon fodder, it seems. Within Kanoha village, Sarutobi Hiruzen lets out a sigh. Oh, Guy, not to mention Genjutsu, he's only adept at basic ninjutsu, completely a taijutsu ninja. Better if he remained hidden, he might even save his own life. Disappointment blankets all once again. Meanwhile, in the pure land, Uchiha Madara furrows his brows, sensing familiarity in the funny attire and peculiar radiance from the war in land of water. After a pause, his eyes suddenly widen. In the Shinigami realm, Aizen shakes his head slightly, his expectations for this man remain low. In the world of pirates, Doflamingo chuckles, is this supposed to be amusing? It's just comical. 
Notably, none from the other worlds hold high hopes for this helper. Three words, far too ordinary. The scene persists. Guy crosses his arms, his voice resonating firmly and forcefully. Eight inner gates. Seventh gate, open. Astonishing azure steam surges forth from Guy, transforming him into a true azure beast. Just the seventh gate. Kakashi exclaims, shocked and apprehensive. The other observing ninjas display mild surprise, but not much else. Judging from the footage, this falls far short, what follows is an onslaught devoid of sense. Uchiha Madara recalls this form of ninjutsu, chuckling, it's not exactly crimson steam, but being underestimated is amusing. In the subsequent moment, Guy lunges at a remarkable pace, launching a relentless assault. Nonetheless, it appears to have limited impact, even Madara's garments evade his touch. Noticing Guy's palms and fingers clasped, Chakra surges anew. Daytime Tiger A white, tiger-like air bomb materializes, roaring at the undying Madara. Boom! An eruption of countless particles fills the air. But Madara merely steps back a distance, whereas Guy is sent hurtling backwards. Indeed, as expected. Observing ninjas in the world of Hokage, all hope has dwindled. In essence, the taijutsu known as the Daytime Tiger seemingly holds no hope either. Madara hovers in midair, gazing downward suddenly. Simultaneously, Guy's right arm fractures along with his ribcage. Despair etches Kakashi's eyes. I can't even rely on my taijutsu techniques. What now? Hearing this, Mike Guy shakes his head and manages a smile, Kakashi, it's too soon to conclude taijutsu's ineffectiveness. My youth has not faded, let's not abandon hope. The green beast of Kanoha shall no longer be. The time has come to transform into a red beast. Guy, much like his father when he was young, gives Kakashi a thumbs up and winks with a smile. In the ensuing second, he adopts a unique stance. In Kanoha, Kakashi's eyes widen abruptly. Meanwhile, Might Guy intently fixes his gaze on the screen, recalling his father's last words, and softly mumbles to himself, Now is. Now is the moment. To protect what matters most with my life. Eight Inner Gates Formation. The Eighth Gate, Gate of Death. Open. The Resounding Roar. Boom. Violent crimson steam erupts from the body. Hair resembling blazing flames. In this instant, Guy's life blooms like astonishing bloody blossoms. An incomprehensibly powerful aura emerges from the screen. In the eyes of those weaker individuals, their sight is lost in this moment, and all they can perceive is a massive beast that blankets the sky, engulfed in flames. The surroundings are plunged into total darkness, with only the crimson flames casting the sole illumination. Aizen rises from his throne at this moment, his eyes shining brightly. Zaraki Kenpachi completely loses his composure, his terrifying golden riatsu bursts forth, as though mirroring the display. Within the One Punch Man world, Boros leisurely releases his grip on his chin, a glint sparking in one eye, and he exclaims with excitement, a warrior worthy of slaughter. In the Hokage's world, eyes widen all around. Is this the mere cannon fodder you deemed worthless? Are you blind? In the Hokage's office, the third Hokage's pipe falls from his mouth, his awareness wholly captivated by a heart-pounding power. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara laughs, his excitement boundless. This is it. This unparalleled might. Are you prepared to dance as well? The Red Beast of Kanoha. Mighty Guy. The scene persists. Six paths Madara's perception undergoes a complete transformation, his strength elevated to another level, in his gaze, the fire of Guy's life blazes fiercely, yet concurrently wanes. Challenged with doubt, Guy firmly declares, you're correct, but I haven't finished waning. I'll also become nourishment for new green leaves. And as those green leaves sprout, spring arrives. It's the pinnacle of youth. When flames reach their zenith. This is Guy's conviction in his existence, and it stands as his proclamation to the world. At the moment the utterance concludes. Unseen by all, Guy instantaneously ascends into the sky. He bellows out. Daytime Tiger. Guy thrusts the air before him with a single fist. Amidst an explosion of unparalleled power, an unimaginable spectacle emerges. 
At this point, the air compresses into a visible substance, coalescing into an exceedingly dreadful impact that crashes into Six Path Madara. Under the staggering pressure, Six Path Madara's countenance twists, his movement arrested, only managing to hoist his black cudgel to staunchly counter the force. However, with Guy's roar, the impact intensifies yet again, and in an instant, Six Path Madara is driven into the earth. In a single blow, the formidable Six Path Madara succumbs. This scene leaves countless individuals astounded. Such an overpowering physique is truly awe-inspiring. Nonetheless, just as Guy is set to launch a second assault, his leg bone abruptly shatters. The weight of the Death's Gate burden manifests. The agony surpasses that of the Seventh Gate's release. Yet this man is accustomed to it. In the subsequent heartbeat, Guy strikes once more without hesitation. A guy bereft of bloodline limits or potent ninjutsu now soars through the skies with only taijutsu at his disposal. In Kanoha village, Lee sheds tears. Meanwhile, guy beside him chuckles nonchalantly, don't grieve, Lee. Before one who has attained enlightenment, sorrow and lamentation are an affront to him. Lee nods resolutely. Unfazed by the agony, guy dashes agilely through the air encircling six path Madara, his form a crimson blur. The next heartbeat. The onslaught commences. Night Tiger, with certainty, Six Path Madara deploys his black barrier to intercept, effectively stalling the impact this time. Before he can revel in her momentary reprieve, a shock comes from his rear, violently propelling him. Within the span of a heartbeat, Guy relocates and employs his legs. The next move. Kick. Within the ferocious deluge, Six Path Madara endeavors to distance himself, encasing himself entirely with truth-seeking balls. Yet just as he believes himself secure, Kakashi's Kamui ruptures his defense. In the subsequent heartbeat, Guy's fist follows. This strike no longer resembles an air cannon. Its power progresses in stages akin to the Six Paths, and it impacts the back of Six Path Madara. In this instant, the truth-seeking ball, hitherto infallible, shatters under the weight of this colossal force. Six Path Madara coughs blood and hurtles away, gouging an immense trench into the earth, scattering countless rocks in his wake. In that moment, a wave of shock swept through the battlefield. Even Six Path Madara was left powerless to defend himself. This man, once an ordinary individual, managed to completely subdue his opponent using sheer taijutsu alone. But then, an even more astonishing development unfolded before everyone's eyes. In the face of such a devastating assault, Six Path Madara rose once again. Aside from a trickle of blood at the corner of his mouth, there was no other trace of injury. Could this attack have merely caused minor wounds? The title of Six Path might not be a mere exaggeration. Could the formidable Madara truly be defeated? In this instant, even Aizen found himself unable to comprehend the unfolding battle. Moreover, the man wreathed in red steam appeared to be nearing his limit. Curiously, Six Path Madara displayed no anger, instead erupting into hearty laughter. This exhilaration reminds me of the days of battling Hashirama for the first time. Care for another round? Or have you other tricks up your sleeve? Don't hold back. Entertain me to your heart's content. This ultimate showdown seemed to be bringing Madara more joy than ever before. Even in the pure land, Madara was itching to be reborn, eager to cross paths with this remarkable opponent. Guy persisted, launching another forceful assault. Yet, this only served to further inconvenience Six Path Madara, causing no further damage than more spilled blood. Six Path Madara's laughter echoed on, would you care to dance once more? This spectacle left inhabitants of the Hokage's world in utter despair, having lost count of how many times their hope had waned. In the world of the Shinigami, Aizen shook his head slightly, he believed this man was reaching the limits of his endurance. Perhaps his demise was a mere second away. Among the Soul Society, gazing at a breathless guy, Kuriyashiki shook his head with regret, predicting, he can't persist much longer. But at that instant, Rengoku Kayajuro retorted vehemently, he won't fall. He won't yield. He stared intently at the figure on the screen, those eyes so penetrating, as though peering into the soul itself. A consciousness of a man. As if in response to Rengoku Kayajuro's declaration, the scene shifted. 
Guy abruptly hunched over, legs propelling him forward one after the other, hands firmly planted on the ground. In that moment, he resembled a cornered beast, channeling his last ounce of strength into a final attack against his adversary. Release. Thunderous impact. From Guy's form, a more intense, crimson blood steam erupted, shattering the ground beneath instantly. This overwhelming force transmuted into a gust of wind, a crescendo of music accompanying its surge. Madara's laughter became manic with excitement. Such chakra. I acknowledge you. Of all those who've challenged me in physical combat, none have equaled you. I, Uchiha Madara, acknowledge you as the strongest. In the ensuing moment, the blood-hued steam coalesced into a scarlet dragon that left all spectators awestruck, hurtling toward six-path Madara with indomitable, unparalleled force. Faced with such physical might. And, at that moment, six-path Madara made no effort to evade, to do so would be an affront to his adversary. He regarded it as beneath him. In that instant, he raised the six-path staff, distorting the space before him. Night Guy. The roar reverberated like a beast's cry. Then, in the blink of an eye, impact occurred. Guy's foot struck the six-path staff with unyielding force, relentlessly pummeling Madara with the same unrelenting intensity. The earth was upturned anew, and the fierce, crimson dragon head clamped down on Madara, thrusting him into the god tree. A massive shockwave erupted, splitting the ground and billowing smoke into the sky, resembling a mushroom cloud. Kakashi and others were tossed by the formidable aftermath. As the smoke gradually dissipated, everyone gazed upon a scene that revealed Six-Path Madara, previously rampant, now left with just half his body, fused into the god tree. Countless individuals gazed at the image, a sense of anticipation swelling in their hearts. Suddenly, the seemingly static image sprang to life. The Six-Path Madara trembled, much like someone who had nearly drowned and was finally rescued, gasping for air. After a moment, the six-path Madara, with only half of his body remaining, erupted into laughter. His countenance displayed seven parts satisfaction and three parts fear. Indeed. I was nearly vanquished by you, my friend. But in the end, I emerged victorious. With these words, his shattered form began to regenerate. Change of perspective. On the other side stood Guy, his body scorched, his veins seemingly flowing with molten lava. He remained immobile, only a faint breath marking his presence, as if he might perish in the next instant. The victor and the defeated had been decided. Even though half of Madara's body had been severed. Unfortunately, the six paths mode Madara possessed near-infinite self-healing capabilities. Following a brilliant, life-endangering kick from Guy, six path Madara claimed victory with his transformed physique. Shinigami World a flawless performance, I've witnessed a clash between mortals and gods. Aizen reclined on his throne, contentment glinting in his eyes. Kenpachi Zaraki rose to his feet. He could bear it no longer, he yearned for a brawl to release his warrior's spirit. Or else, he would suffocate in its absence. One Punch Man World The universal overlord Boros bellowed with laughter. That kick, an explosion of life, was truly magnificent. For him, the outcome mattered little, this warrior's vivid display of battle prowess took precedence. In the world of fate, Shu Ten Duji cast aside his wine gourd, feeling his blood boil. Such battles were far more invigorating than the group of servants who cowered in the shadows. Hokage World The ninja remained silent. Desperation didn't encompass their emotions now. Instead, this moment infused them with heightened morale. It was Guy's fervent spirit that ignited the flames of determination within them. What of death? Isn't a ninja's worth measured by this very notion? In Kanoha village, Guy's spirits dipped briefly but quickly soared once more. Rock Lee, tears barely held back, believed the sensei had come to his senses and hastened to say, Sensei, you mustn't kill yourself, please refrain from such actions in the future. Guy shook his head, raised an eyebrow, and excitedly responded to Rock Lee, of course, I'll do it again. But next time, I'll aim for his head. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara shivered inexplicably. Curious, why does my soul feel a chill? The scene continues. Six-path Madara rose slowly, eyeing the fading guy. 
Though you flicker like a candle in the wind, you've pleased me. To show my gratitude, I shall end you before you turn to ashes. Six Path Madara's words bore sincerity. This is respect for an adversary, a mundane demise followed by waiting for death isn't fitting for this man's manner of passing. He intended to escort his opponent into the afterlife with his own hands. In the next heartbeat, the indomitable truth-seeking ball hurtled through the air, aimed at Guy. A waiting Guy was his demise. Boom! Astonishingly, Naruto, who should have perished, reappeared, intercepting the truth-seeking ball with his own flesh. Even more astounding, Naruto tapped into Guy's heart with a single hand, yanking him back from the brink of death. While Six Path Madara remained stunned, Naruto closed the distance in an instant. His fist's force rivaled that of Night Guy's kick, and simultaneously, a shuriken wrapped in magma appeared in his other hand. Boom! Once again, Six Path Madara was hurled into the ruins, the colossal, god-tier tree that took hundreds to encircle collapsing. Six Path Madara was taken aback, if not for the Divine Tree's recent defense, he'd have sustained grave injuries. And this was merely a casual strike from Naruto. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara's countenance betrayed disbelief. Why? How had he become so formidable just through dancing on the precipice of death? Moreover, he sensed Six Path's power within Naruto. Across another world, brows furrowed. This lad, Naruto, demonstrated a staggering difference in strength before and after the brink of death. What had occurred, and why did immense power seem so readily attainable? One ought to remember, the mighty individuals hadn't advanced without enduring trials, honing their skills, ascending to their zeniths. However, this scene confounded them, engendering both puzzlement and a degree of discomfort. The mutation unfolds anew. The Six Path Madara inexplicably heard the thoughts emanating from the Divine Tree. In the next heartbeat, he unhesitatingly absorbed the shattered Divine Tree into his being. With the last vestiges of the Divine Tree assimilated, all of Six Path Madara's wounds vanished, his vitality restored once more. In this instant, Madara wore an expression of sudden understanding and inexplicable joy. It seemed that unifying the three factors would unveil the infinite Tsukuyumi. In the ensuing second, the Six Path Madara pivoted nonchalantly. Before him stood Naruto, activated in Six Paths mode. Simultaneously, another figure materialized. None other than Sasuke, who should have met his end. His aura, too, burgeoned manifold. Incredibly, his left eye had transformed into a Rinnegan bedecked with Sharingan. Just like a protagonist in a Chinese novel, acquiring might at a crucial juncture. At this juncture, Aizen's gaze chilled, scorn for this quasi-fatalistic essence reflected in his eyes. Shouldn't the fruits of labor be reaped through personal endeavor? These two individuals left him disdainful. The unfolding screen continues. The Six Path Madara, with a cold gaze, looks down upon Naruto and Sasuke, who have acquired new powers. Rinnegan, the power of the Six Paths. A moment of absurdity fills his heart. He spent a century acquiring these two abilities, devised countless plans, endured endless trials, and this is his outcome. Yet, these two young devils have gained them in merely half an hour. But this bewilderment lasts only a brief instant. Is this fair? No matter, his goal is nearly within reach. No matter who stands in his path, the outcome is death. The world of the Hokage, concealed within a dim corner. Black and white Zetsu slowly emerges from the earth. Seeing this sight, black Zetsu seethes with anger. In an instant, he discerns the source of Naruto and Sasuke's newfound power. Atsutsuki Hagoromo, you wretched offspring, mother should have never given you life. The Six Path Madara makes the first move. There remains only one seal. Yet, a terrifying ninjutsu akin to an S rank technique emerges. Sage Art, Thunderous Exodus. A brilliant purple thunderstorm courses rapidly through the air, bifurcating into countless branches. The immense power is enough to send shivers down the spines of those distantly observing, like Kakashi, the fourth Hokage, and others. In the Demon Slayer world, Musen Kibutsuji feels a tremor in his heart. He senses that being struck by this lightning would leave nothing but ash. The concept of regeneration becomes a mockery. Even Aizen's brow furrows upon witnessing the scene. He intuits that being touched by this purple lightning would pose significant trouble. 
However, in this moment, Naruto channels the power of the six paths into an obsidian staff and staunchly resists the onslaught. Sasuke instantaneously shifts to another location, dodging the attack. The six path Madara, mildly surprised by Sasuke's agility, regains his composure. Simultaneously, Naruto capitalizes on the six path Madara's distraction and swiftly approaches, brandishing the six path staff to deliver a crushing blow. Boom! Similar to the peculiar scene when the Nine Tails was vanquished, the six path staff Naruto wields freezes mid air, as if obstructed by an unseen force. In Sasuke's Rinnegan field of view, an phantom resembling Madara materializes and employs its arm to halt the six path staff. In the Shinigami world, Aizen's eyes widen in astonishment. This formless shadow that holds palpable presence yet leaves no traces is a concept challenging to fathom. Nonetheless, the Shinigami's senses are acute and may potentially detect it. Confronting Naruto's assault, the six path Madara remains unflustered. In the subsequent second, he inhales deeply, then exhales forcefully. This time, no hand seals are necessary. A violet laser bursts forth instantly. The six path Madara barely tilts his head, and the violet laser transforms into the most formidable blade in the ninja world. In an instant, the robust six path staff is cleaved, and Naruto twists his body to evade, narrowly escaping being rent in two. The six path Madara pursues immediately a shadow stealthily approaching Naruto in tandem. In the distance, Sasuke's Rinnegan perceives the unfolding scene, prompting him to hurl a dagger in an attempt to intercept the attack. However, a startling sight ensues. The blade traverses the shadow completely, and Naruto is sent flying. In the Shinigami world, Aizen furrows his brow. Yet, he reacts instantly, recognizing this as an ineffective physical assault. What an indomitable ability! The Six Path Madara smirks faintly, resuming the offensive. This time, his gaze locks onto Sasuke's Mangekyo Sharingan. With remarkable swiftness, the Six Path Madara closes the distance and gouges fiercely with his fingers. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Unexpectedly, in the ensuing second, Sasuke's figure vanishes. The grass cutter sword impales the Six Path Madara's chest just as Madara pierces Sasuke's chest. In the pure land, Hashirama chuckles ruefully. The Uchiha lad holds quite the grudge. Within the cave, Itachi can't help but smile. Madara's countenance reveals astonishment, yet his body bears no sign of injury. After assimilating with the god tree, his heart is no longer the focal point. At this juncture, Sasuke emerges from behind Naruto. The battle rages on. A raisin gan brimming with the tailed beast's power forms in Naruto's palm, while a black chidori imbued with six paths power manifests in Sasuke's hand. Under the bewildered gaze of the six path Madara, the two raise their hands in unison, launching attacks against each other. A semblance of mutual destruction. But in the subsequent second, the six path Madara discovers in shock that he's now positioned between the two, struck by both the raisin gan and chidori. The six paths and shohas might intertwine, immobilizing him. In the Hokage world, the ninja rejoice. The third Hokage stands upright, casting a disdainful glance at Danzo, his expression darkening. Danzo realizes that securing Naruto has grown exceedingly arduous. At the Uchiha hideout, Sasuke exudes exhilaration. Such power can undoubtedly annihilate that man. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara furrows his brow. He comprehends, Sasuke's Rinnegan wields the unique capacity of spatial replacement. The screen endures, just when Naruto and Sasuke deem Madara under their control, poised to seal him. Madara promptly swaps with the shadow of the limbo world and escapes. His intent is unmistakable, he aims to reclaim his Rinnegan. The process unfolds seamlessly. Kakashi, en route to rest, experiences a swift shadow passing, leaving his Sharingan gone. The six path Madara smirks, embedding the Sharingan into her own eye socket before entering the Kamui dimension. Due to Sakura's momentary hesitation, Madara successfully reclaims her Rinnegan. Concurrently, a nod to Abito, the means to undo the Jutsu identical to Noera Rin's. As Madara re emerges the next moment, his power crescendos. A potency exceeding her prior state surges forth, Madara stands resolute. 
Beside him, the shadow of the limbo world looms menacingly. Everything. Rin's death. Was orchestrated. Did Rin intentionally collide with Kakashi to break the spell and end her own life? In the Hokage's world, Abito collapsed, wide-eyed and speechless. How can this be? Before Naruto could voice his thoughts, his heart was consumed by a surge of rage, rendering his words repugnant. In that instant, reality crumbled. Abito gazed at his trembling hands, haunted by the echoes of anguished souls. My everything, my pain. All false, it's all a lie. The brutal truth stood stark before him. In that moment, all the hidden transgressions and excuses he buried within his heart came rushing back. Everyone questioned him, demanding answers. Abito's face twisted, tears mingling with his anguish as he let out a primal scream. Suddenly, Abito's body froze. Grasping at a final straw, he laughed maniacally, No. There's one truth. And the infinite Tsukuyumi. In that realm, I can still be with Rin. One unspoken thought remained, in that realm, all his misdeeds would be buried as well. In the Shinigami world, Aizen covered his face with a trembling hand, his laughter echoing. You truly amaze me, Uchiha Madara. It's a shame my world couldn't have you. Having witnessed Uchiha Madara's gambit, Aizen felt a certain camaraderie. This could be a friend to converse with. Or an opponent to exhilarate in facing. Truth be told, those soul society fools had grown tiresome. And the only opponent who intrigued him was wanted, so foolishly. Had it not been for that outsider named Kurosaki Ichigo, Aizen wouldn't have revealed himself so soon. The plan could have unfolded more methodically and securely. Perhaps as they were crushed beneath the king's resolve, their cries would ring out in astonishment, Captain Aizen, what are you scheming? Alas, the picture could not be seen. In the Hokage's world, the ninja community paid little heed to the distraught Abito. Their concerns now centered on whether ninja Naruto and Sasuke could triumph over Uchiha Madara. Uchiha Madara's power surged visibly as he reclaimed his other eye. Simultaneously, a deep resentment festered, the woman named Haruno Sakura proved herself unworthy of the ninja mantle. Indecision, a lack of resolve. Uchiha Madara would have been easy prey if they had acted sooner. The narrative continues. Haruno Sakura confronts Madara. Haruno Sakura falls victim to the Six Paths Black Rod. Haruno Sakura is repelled. Sasuke narrowly saves Haruno Sakura. Haruno Sakura's heart aches. Across the ninja world, many frowned. How could she entertain such thoughts at a time like this? Six Path Madara's visage remains ice cold, the numbers before him are of no consequence. His eyes now awoken, his ultimate dream stands within reach. Ascending into the skies, Six Path Madara conjures dark energy. Planetary devastation. A fundamental ability of the Rinnegan. Yet Six Path Madara hurls forth more than Nagato ever did. Countless mud boulders ascend skyward. Suddenly, a sight that chills all, dozens of meteor-like orbs materialize. With a flourish, Six Path Madara commands the meteor shower to rain down. Simultaneously, the ominous shadow of the limbo, border jail unnerves Naruto and Sasuke. The triumphant grin on Madara's face, he ascends higher. Beneath the blood moon, Madara shatters the horn on his forehead. A scarlet, nine-geared Rinnegan is unveiled. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara cackles with euphoria. According to Uchiha tablets, when a ninja with Rinnegan approaches the moon. The moon's eye, designed to realize boundless dreams, will open. All the pieces have fallen into place. Indeed, every record holds true. Their efforts have not been in vain. As for the alteration of future events, the course of history may shift, but he pays it no heed. Judging by their current might, as long as Black Zetsu utilizes impure world reincarnation to revive himself first, little stands in their way. Spectators from around the world watch, anticipation building. The scene unfolding mirrors the artwork gracing the cover, this must be the climax. Aizen's curiosity has reached its zenith, every action by Uchiha Madara appears orchestrated for this very moment. I've heard whispers of the infinite Tsukuyumi. Can it wield the power to obliterate worlds or transcend mortal existence once harnessed? Aizen awaits with bated breath. 
The narrative proceeds, with the advent of the moon's eye, nine gear Rinnegan patterns dance across the moon's surface, let us unite now. Infinite Tsukuyumi. Without hesitation, Six Path Madara seals the technique with one hand, a colossal phantom, larger than a planet, materializes, the blood-red moon adorning its forehead, in the next heartbeat, the moon erupts in blinding brilliance, a terrifying spectacle unfolds, the entirety of the planet freezes, as all living things are ensnared. Rinnegan reflections glint in their eyes, even those sheltered within edifices or darkness are not spared, the world, in this instant, falls deathly silent, in every corner of existence, viewers are rendered speechless. Even Eisen finds himself without words. The footage before him is staggeringly mind-boggling. Can mere mortals truly wield such mastery? A spell. Commanding the very life of an entire world. In the world of the Hokage, all shinobi found themselves involuntarily speechless. This illusion had shattered their understanding entirely. In essence, what was once known as ninjutsu could no longer be described as such, it transcended into something divine. Within the shadows, Uchiha Madara appeared to foresee a bright future in his eyes. In fight Tsukuyumi. Hashirama, you were wrong. My path is the correct one. Wood style, God Tree is emerging. Six Path Madara brought his hands together, channeling his power with unparalleled force. Suddenly, a fearsome surge of chakra erupted, causing massive tree vines to burst forth from the ground. Hanging from these vines were ribbon-like appendages that ensnared every living being. Afterward, except for a handful of Hokages who managed to escape the entanglement, as well as Naruto and his companions concealed within Susanoo, all life in the world was wrapped within cocoons and suspended from the trees. When the wind blew, the suspended form swayed eerily. The moon's luminance proved transient, eventually fading back to its original state. Simultaneously, Madara descended from the skies, gradually touching down upon the earth. On his face, a contented expression prevailed. His lifelong aspiration had finally been fulfilled. Now, only a few adversaries stood before him. And now, as the savior, allow me to end this. Observing Naruto and Sasuke's bewildered gaze, Uchiha Madara began expounding on the significance of his art. I've severed all causal ties within this world. Disconnected from human suffering, anguish, and emptiness. Uchiha Madara offered a faint smile and continued, this is what the infinite Tsukuyumi represents. In a world bereft of conflict, strife, and pain, everyone shall know happiness. I have transformed hell into paradise. As these words reached most of the spectators beyond the screen, a shiver ran down their spines, sending goosebumps rippling across their skin. This man, Uchiha Madara, had ensnared all within an illusory dream. In a sense, Uchiha Madara had become akin to a deity in this moment. I've underestimated you, Uchiha Madara. Aizen conceded, placing Madara on a comparable pedestal. Within the world of pirates, Sengoku mused deeply. Meanwhile, Akainu clenched his fists, this technique, he coveted. In the world of fate, Saimai shook his head. False beauty frequently begot cruel realities. In the Hokage's world, confusion reigned among many. They had anticipated Uchiha Madara's ultimate intention to be the annihilation of the ninja world. Yet, the truth defied their expectations, he aimed to forge a superior world. In this world, violence and suffering held no place, only dreams come true and unending happiness. But what about reality? Life was undeniably merciless, most shinobi were nothing more than tools. So. What if this were all a dream? Why did reality and illusion overlap so seamlessly? Death remained an impossibility, too. In this instance, countless shinobi began to anticipate, even resolve to follow this man's lead. The scene continued. Gazing upon the still land, Madara experienced, for the first time, the marvel of this world, a world devoid of strife, where all resided within a wondrous dream. The missteps of Hashirama have been rectified at last. Little Sakura, her expression a mix of incredulity and disbelief, exclaimed, what did the first Hokage ever do wrong? A cynical sneer spread across the six-path Madara's countenance. The ninjas of Kanoha would likely never admit defeat. In the beginning, Hashirama and I shared a common goal, to alter an era where even children knew war. We succeeded. Yet, it proved a failure. 
In the days that followed, I saw through this world. People couldn't trust each other, giving way to fear, hate, doubt, and greed. I proposed that Kanoha safeguard all the tailed beasts, yet the suggestion was spurned. Hence, the world continued down Hashirama's idealistic path. As he spoke, Madara's gaze fixed on the distant figure of Senju Hashirama. But in the end, the cycle of ninja warfare persisted. The first great ninja war, the second, the third. Countless lives lost. Within the pure land, Hashirama's gaze dimmed. The world remained as dire as ever, and even in times of peace, suffering endured, only in varying shades. I was profoundly mistaken. You are mistaken, Hashirama. Uchiha Madara's laughter was light, laced with mockery. History has shown my path to be the correct one. At this juncture, Madara mirrored the archetypal hero, conquering countless trials, nearing the realization of his dreams, a perfect conclusion awaited. Then, abruptly, a gasp escaped Sasuke's lips, his eyes widening in disbelief. A deathly hush fell over the scene. Beyond the screen, the audience stared in shock at the obsidian hand piercing Uchiha Madara's chest. You are wrong as well, Uchiha. Madara. Black Zetsu, fused with Abito, crept closer to Madara's ear, delivering a heartless mockery. You are no savior. This is far from over. Madara trembled, immobilized, his eyes agape in disbelief. Why claim Abito as a mere pawn? Is it not ironic that you alone think of yourself as special? Ah, Madara. In truth. You've been ensnared in the dream I wove for you. Impossible. What are you saying, Black Zetsu? I created you. You are my consciousness. At this moment, Madara is either unable to believe or unwilling to believe that his lifelong dream has been woven into a hoax. My entire life has been dedicated to achieving this goal. If it's not real, then what are you? Black Zetsu remains unhurried and smiles slowly. You're mistaken, Madara. It was never you who created me. It's. Kagaya. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara roars with fury. This can't be. I've never heard the name Kagaya. I watched you come into existence, and yet you dare to betray me. This is unforgivable. No matter how much he yells, the scene remains unchanged. As Black Zetsu's words fade, the god tree covering the entire planet suddenly emits a burst of energy. The humans living in their beautiful dreams are now being drained of their chakra. The six-path Madara cries out in pain, the black arm piercing his chest starts to liquefy, winding and assimilating into his body like roots. Then, the ground shatters and a massive torrent of chakra bursts forth from the earth, crazily penetrating Madara's body. At this moment, Black Zetsu reveals the true essence of the infinite Tsukuyumi. It's only for harvesting chakra and producing ninjutsu for the white Zetsu army. The so-called beautiful dream is fleeting, the deeper you sink, the quicker you transform into a white zetsu. Madara still can't believe it. He had deciphered the stone tablet left behind by the Sage of the Six Paths, interpreting it as a ninjutsu that symbolized eternal peace. That stone tablet was indeed left behind by Hagoromo. But Madara, I've outlived you by far, and I've had plenty of time. I took the liberty of altering the stone tablet left by Hagoromo. I deceived you. And you're just as much a pawn as a beto, there's no difference between the two of you. Uchiha Madara. You've lost. As the last word falls, a completely unfamiliar woman appears floating in the air. She is Atsutsuki Kagaya. The rabbit goddess from the Atsutsuki clan, the ancestor of the ninja world. This astonishing twist leaves the audience in stunned silence. They knew that Uchiha Madara would meet his end, but they hadn't expected the outcome to be this mind-blowing. If the goal was unattainable due to defeat, that would be acceptable, even if bitter. But now, the goal Uchiha Madara dedicated his life to, the goal for which he used every means and endured loneliness, turns out to be false, nothing more than dressing for another's wedding. It's truly a tragic fate. In the Shinigami world, Aizen shakes his head. What a sorrowful life. Even he, at this moment, feels a mix of complex emotions and refrains from mocking. In the world of Demon Slayer, both the Demon Slayer core and the demons in the Infinite Castle are profoundly shocked. What kind of world is this? 
Even with strength on their side, why is there such pervasive darkness, so many hidden conspiracies? Every link seems shrouded in masks, every aspect concealing a deeper secret. Such a terrifying world. Compared to this, the world they know seems naively innocent. In the world of pirates, everyone is astounded. Sengoku remains speechless for a long while. With all his insight and calculations, even he couldn't predict this turn of events for the ninjas. In the realm of fate, Diarmuid gazes at the sea from the cliff, words failing him. He's currently tasked with a significant mission and prays that his fate won't mirror Uchiha Madara's tragic ending. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara is consumed by anger and despair. He's angry at Black Setsu's betrayal. He's despondent that the infinite Tsukuyumi was a lie. For this ideal, he's treaded on the knife's edge between life and death, endured solitude, vanquished formidable foes. But now, it all seems absurd. In a hidden corner, Abito removes his mask. He's made his decision. He can't accept the fabricated consequences of the infinite Tsukuyumi. The recorded footage shows that while the infinite Tsukuyumi can indeed grant sweet dreams, its side effect is chakra absorption and transformation into a white Zetsu. But the so-called technique can be perfected. He has two tasks ahead. Retrieve Madara's body and seek out Orochimaru. It'll take another thousand years. But I can wait. Black Setsu disengages from White Setsu's form, vanishing without a trace. The screen suddenly whites out. When the image returns, it's Naruto and Sasuke who've defeated Atsutsuki Kagaya. Uchiha Madara reverts to his normal form and falls to the ground, weakened. This signifies that Madara has been separated from the tailed beasts, and the inevitable outcome is death. At this moment, Senju Hashirama crouches beside Madara. You were too impatient. Our ideals don't need to be achieved in a single step. We can entrust them to the generations that follow. Even as death approaches, Uchiha Madara musters a smile. Maybe you're right. But. I don't like anyone standing behind me. With that, Uchiha Madara closes his eyes and departs this world entirely. The screen freezes, and Uchiha Madara's final words appear. At this moment, people across the world are profoundly perplexed. What does it all mean? In the pure land, a pen and a sheet of paper materialize before Uchiha Madara. From the void comes an idea. Uchiha Madara is stunned. He's tasked with writing his own concluding remarks. Recalling his last moments, Madara closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. When he reopens them, his gaze is serene. In the next instant, he picks up the pen. The screen shifts, and his handwriting emerges. I perished due to falsehood and hubris. Yet, the so-called triumph in the ninja world is equally absurd. This is just another cycle of rebirth, inseparable from its core. In such a world, the shadows in the human heart will forever breed darkness. My name is Uchiha Madara. I will return and forge a new path. Support me on my KOFI account and read up to 15 early chapters, https colon slash slash ko-fi.com slash aaume, the world of Hokage, the last guardian. The demise of Minato Namikaze and Kushina Uzumaki. Back in the world of Hokage again. Many quickly realized that this wasn't the nine tales from the last video, right? Wasn't it reasonable and compassionate before, assisting that boy named Naruto in his battles? How did everything take such a dark and twisted turn? As they stared at the screen, shock spread among the masses. What had transpired and caused such a stark contrast? Within the world of Hokage, Hiruzen Sarutobi's heart raced, panic seizing him unexpectedly. He never anticipated that this video would be shown not just from the future, but from the past as well. By this point, many shinobi villages had already witnessed it, the video's location being Kanoha. And that rampaging fox, it signified an enormous event from over a decade ago, shrouded in secrecy. The Nine Tails Rampage Within the cloud shinobi village, the rakage's expression turned solemn, it's unbelievable that someone like the fourth Hokage could die like this. I once personally experienced the terror of facing him on the battlefield. Abito, who was searching for Orochimaru's trail, froze, his eyes filling with anguish. No need for video playback, memories from the past struck his heart like countless sharp arrows. Screen begins, 
a woman's agonized screams as the camera pans to a heavily guarded cavern. Inside, a woman wears a pained expression, in the throes of childbirth. Then the fourth Hokage, Minato Namikaze, arrives, taking his place by her side, her husband. Minato is visibly nervous, his face flushed and sweat-soaked. Even in the pure land, a fleeting smile crossed Kushina's lips. The initial agony was momentarily forgotten, a tiny bit of happiness creeping in as she sensed Minato's nerves for her. In Kanoha village, Naruto felt an inexplicable tremor in his heart, a sensation of breathlessness. After the last video centered around Uchiha Madara, he was left in the dark about more events. The woman's cries of pain once again, accompanied by a sealing jutsu forming on her stomach. The scene changes, a nine-tailed fox writhes and struggles against restraints, it's the nine tails. In the world of Hokage, many shinobi came to realize that this person was the nine tails Jinchuriki. However, the fact that the Jinchuriki was a woman took them by surprise. Naruto, too, was taken aback, already knowing from the previous video that he himself would become the nine tails Jinchuriki. But how could the future ally by his side be so malevolent and agonized in the present? As if sensing Naruto's thoughts, the nine tails within him snorted coldly. Suddenly, the camera shifts outside the cave, revealing a shocking sight. A man wearing a striped mask appears, and all Umbu guards fall silently. Hiruzen Sarutobi's eyes were filled with puzzlement, much like before. Leaving aside how this person knew where the Jinchuriki was being held, the real question was, how did he infiltrate so silently? Kanoha's barriers boasted the Uzumaki clan's Fuenjutsu barriers, and it was not for show. Their barriers ranked at the pinnacle among the five great shinobi villages. In the next moment, he understood how. After disposing of the umbu, the masked man walks through solid rock as if it were air. Viewers across other worlds suddenly recognize this ability, it was identical to Abito's skill revealed in the previous video, his debut in battle. Could it be the same individual? In the Hokage world, Kakashi's eyes widened, as if struck by lightning. One look at the distinct mask reassured him, but now, with Mangekyo's unique Kamui unveiled, the last trace of hope in his heart shattered. Kakashi, aware of the outcome, wept at this moment. Even if it meant his end, you shouldn't have taken such a deranged path. They were your mentors. How could you? Within the Hokage's office, Hiruzen Sarutobi erupted in anger, smashing the table before him with a furious punch. Blackfish. The codename spoken, an umbu operative materialized instantly. Hiruzen's voice dripped ice, a bounty of 500 million is offered for the capture of Kanoha's traitor, Achiha Abido, dead or alive. This was already the highest bounty in the black market. The previous record had been held by a ninja named Senju Hashirama, valued at 800 million. It spoke volumes of Hiruzen's fury at this moment. In his heart, were it not for the Nine Tails rampage, Kanoha would wield immense power by now. How had they reached this sorry state? Would Cloud Shinobi dare abduct the Hyuga and counterattack? Would Mist Shinobi dare steal Hyuga's Byakugan? All due to Abito, the madman. Screen continues, amidst the woman's pain, a baby's cry pierced the air. At last, without incident, a baby boy was born. Seeing the child safely delivered, Namike's Minato finally felt relief wash over him. Yet, in an instant, the masked man appeared, killing the nurses and snatching the infant. In the blink of an eye, under Minato's furious gaze, the masked man hurled the baby into the air. Minato reacted swiftly, repositioning himself to catch the baby. But before he could exhale, he noticed a detonating tag beneath the swaddling blanket. Suddenly, the scene shifted, Minato, once in the cave, now stood in a cabin. At the last moment, Minato flung away the blanket, executing a roll to shield the baby from the blast. As expected of the fourth Hokage, few can react that swiftly. Hiruzen Sarutobi sighed, pity etched in his eyes. In the Shinigami world, Aizen stared at Namike's Minato in astonishment. At this moment, he was thoroughly taken aback. In the prior video, due to the close proximity, he had assumed Minato was employing Shunpa to move with such speed. Little did he know, it was instant spatial manipulation. In the One Punch world, Oros too was deeply surprised. After countless years of battling throughout the universe, he had encountered those with space-bending abilities. Yet none had achieved this, 
jumping through space in an instant. This skill bordered on the extraordinary, as long as he desired, none could thwart his movements. At this juncture, viewers from various worlds remained puzzled, how could someone with such power meet their end? Support me on my KOFI account and read up to 15 early chapters, https colon slash slash ko dash fi dot com slash aaumi, the screen flickers, and as Minato is forced to leave, the masked man takes Kushina to a mountain stream. The power of the Dark Seal is like a rope, tightly binding Kushina at its center. And the 8 trigram seal on Kushina's stomach is now extremely loose. Sneering, the three Tomo Sharingan in the masked man's eye whirls, and he weaves a seal with one hand. In the pure land, Uchiha Madara maintains an expressionless demeanor. This technique was passed down to Abito by him, capable of activating the illusion he once cast on the Nine Tails, allowing complete control over it. In the next moment, the Nine Tails sealed within Naruto's body also displays the Three Tomo Sharingan in its eyes and becomes agitated. The chains representing the Eight Trigram seal shatter. Kushina's face contorts violently, the intense pain nearly overwhelming her senses. At this moment, the massive and fiery chakra of the Nine Tails begins to surge wildly from the seal. A malevolent aura descends, shaping the immense red chakra torrent into the form of the Nine Tails. Under the blood moon, the Nine Tails crashes onto the ground. You didn't even hesitate, Abito. Kakashi is utterly shocked, extracting a tailed beast results in the death of the Jinchuriki. Yet Abito doesn't display any hesitation. In fact, his tone when mentioning releasing the tailed beast even carries a hint of vengeance. Why vengeance? Unable to accept this scene, Kakashi can't help but roar. It was Rin who died to my Chidori, why didn't you come after me? Useless. You're all useless. In the world of the Hokage, many who knew Uchiha Abito was Minato's student frowned. Even if he was manipulated by Uchiha Madara, it had no bearing on the woman before him. And Uchiha Madara, the source of it all, observes coldly. Abito, who fell into darkness so readily, is nothing more than trash. No more than before, no less in the future. Meanwhile, in the real world, Abito curls into himself, avoiding the incessant voice that rings in his mind. The Nine Tails bellows towards the sky. The suppressed hatred drives it to madness, and the next moment, it raises its claws to seize helpless Kushina. Yet this time, its grasp finds only emptiness. At the crucial moment, Minato rescues Kushina, evading the attack. Upon hearing that Minato has secured the child's safety, Kushina finally breathes a sigh of relief. The following moment, Minato employs the Flying Thunder God technique, gently placing Kushina beside the baby. The weakened Kushina gazes at the newborn, biting her lip tightly as tears stream down her cheeks. She doesn't dare wipe her tears, yearning for a few more seconds. But without intervention, she'll never see her child again after tonight. She'll never witness her son growing up, never hear the laughter every mother desires. Sorrow consumes her countenance, trembling as she utters the child's name. Naruto. Off screen, Naruto's eyes widen as if struck by lightning. Yet that brightness fades swiftly. He seems to conceal something, forcing a self deprecating chuckle Heh, Naruto, you fool. What are you thinking? It's just a coincidence. You could never have a mother like that. Back in the Hokage's office, Sarutobi Hiruzen tenses upon hearing Kushina's words, an unnatural expression crossing his face. In the Cloud Shinobi village, the rakage furrows his brow. Naruto. Could it be Naruto from the last recording? Unlikely. Have you ever heard that the fourth Hokage left an heir? Within Kanoha, perplexed glances are exchanged, doubts soon dismissed. He's the fourth Hokage's son, a hero's offspring. If he'd survived, everyone would know. He should have perished in the Nine Tails rampage. The scene continues, Minato's usually sunny face turns to ice, he's well aware of his wife's fate. In the next moment, Minato dons the robes befitting the fourth Hokage. The camera perspective shifts as the masked man silently infiltrates Kanoha. Summoning technique. With the call, the colossal Nine Tails materializes. In an instant, numerous structures crumble, and dozens lose their lives. But this is just the beginning of the tragedy, as the rampaging and chaotic Nine Tails resembles an ancient beast. Wherever it treads, buildings crumble to ruins. 
ordinary folks either react too late or flee too slowly. Within moments, scores of civilians perish. Tanjiro can't believe the scene before him. The actions of this human are a hundred times more malevolent than any demon. In the world of the Shinigami, Aizen lowers his gaze, a contemptuous smile playing on his lips. What an unsightly soul. Ninjas react with swiftness, and the third Hokage, Sarutobi Hiruzen, re-enters the fray. Yet it's essentially futile. The numbers mean nothing against the Nine Tails, they can't even slow it. Growing impatient with destruction, the Nine Tails gazes skyward, Inyang Chakra attributes gathering. Within seconds, a purple-tailed beast bomb laden with terrifying energy condenses. Boom, the sound of bursting air fills the air as the tailed beast bomb hurtles toward the Hokage rock. Sarutobi Hiruzen's face contorts, he comprehends the might of the tailed beast bomb. He knows that if it detonates within the village, Kanoha might vanish from the ninja world. Then, in a flash, a figure appears atop the Hokage rock, the trailing royal robes fluttering. Minato arrives at the critical juncture. Illuminating the scene, Minato's hands weave seals, intricate symbols manifest in the air before the Hokage rock. The space ripples like a curtain, and upon collision, the fearsome tailed beast bomb decelerates, sinking into it. Minato's countenance remains serene, a kunai with an inscribed seal rests in his hands. Instantly, the tailed beast bomb vanishes. The next moment, the night sky transforms into daylight, a cataclysmic explosion like a rising sun surges hundreds of miles away. Such an intense energy blast could be packaged and transported, truly an advanced form of space transportation. Aizen had to acknowledge that this so-called flying thunder god ninjutsu was quite impressive, even he was deeply impressed. He wondered who the brilliant mind behind this technique was, there seemed to be no vulnerabilities in its design. Scene continues, just as Minato was about to confront the Nine Tails, the masked man suddenly materialized behind him. Minato swiftly detected the anomaly around him and instantly counterattacked with a backhand shuriken throw. However, his eyes widened in shock immediately after. The sharp kunai managed to penetrate the opponent's body as if slicing through air. And just as it pierced through completely, the opponent seized Minato's arm. In the next instant, space distorted, and the two figures sucked into Uzumaki mask and vanished. Simultaneously, in a mountainous area, a distorted Uzumaki masked figure emerged. Yet, only the masked man remained, clad in white attire. He escaped, failing to capture his target. Meanwhile, Minato had returned to the shack where the explosive tags were initially set off. Flying Thunder God technique once more. As he analyzed the opponent's space-time ability, the masked man once again distorted into existence behind him. In the world of the Hokage, most ninja had become desensitized. Could this truly be ninjutsu? Considering the previous scenes, how many times had the battlefield shifted in merely a minute? The very space that remained impervious to others had become pliant before these two, like a puppet under their control. Minato's expression was composed as he began to inwardly deduce the opponent's identity. This person must be well acquainted with Kanoha. Able to bypass Umbu and Third Hokage's personal guard, slipping through the secretive defenses of the village's backside. Aware that the seal on the Nine Tails would weaken, with the ability to command the beast and utilize summoning Jutsu. Moreover, capable of effortlessly entering and exiting Kanoha's barriers. These deductions narrowed the possibilities to only one individual. And then. There was only one plausible truth. Minato's inner monologue, you are Uchiha. Madara. After stating this, Minato's gaze held a knowing look. In the pure land, Kushina covered her face in embarrassment. Uchiha Madara stood stunned, even somewhat indignant. Wearing a mask and resorting to secrecy. Even in his soul state, Minato within the Shinigami's belly could see the scene. At this moment, he lacked a corporeal form, otherwise, he could easily deduce rooms and halls using his intuition. In this situation where everyone already knew that the masked man was a Beto, it was a somewhat comical sight. Who's to say? The masked man neither confirmed nor denied. Continuing to converse, he formed a closed loop with chained hands. The ensuing moment saw them clash and disappear. The battle recommenced. Over ten meters vanished in an instant, yet they didn't collide. 
similarly to before, Minato's body phased through the masked man's, almost ethereally. However, immediately after full passage, the masked man's chain intercepted Minato. Thankfully, at a critical juncture, Minato employed the flying thunder god to shift his position. Turning to face the unrushed masked man, Minato narrowed his eyes and dashed forward again, just as before. Numerous ninja in the Hokage's world struggled to fathom the spectacle before them, finding it exceedingly strange. Given that physical attacks were ineffective, why persist with the same approach? For someone like Namike's Minato, this was inexplicable. Could his current unease be attributed to Nine Tails and his wife? Only such a notion seemed logical. In the Shinigami world, Aizen reasoned, are you repeating the last action in search of a weakness? This line of thinking also crossed the minds of many formidable figures in other worlds. Only Abito unconsciously touched his back. Scene continues, they clashed once more. However, unlike before, Minato hurled a shuriken preemptively as they neared. Yet, it still failed to inflict damage, passing through the masked man's head like air. An unfavorable expression overtook the scene. Due to the close-range shuriken throw, Minato's balance wavered slightly. With the two now proximate, he lacked time to correct his stance. Almost simultaneously, Minato's thrown shuriken fully traversed the masked man's brain. The masked man resumed his solid form, instantly able to touch Minato's body. Following contact, Minato found himself unable to escape this time. I win. The masked man sneered. However, the ensuing moment saw Minato instantly vanish just as the masked man attempted to absorb him. Behind the masked man, Minato held a uniquely crafted shuriken in one hand and, in the other, thrust forth a raisingan. Boom! The masked man had no time to react or revert to a hollow state. Raisingan slammed into his back, driving him into the ground. In an instant, the victor emerged. In that moment, all the ninja who had confronted Kanoha in three different battles recalled their terror when faced with Minato's dominance. Shinigami world, Aizen was taken aback by the scene before him. What kind of combat awareness is this? To formulate a battle plan in just a single second. Moreover, turning the tables in the final moments of the game flawlessly. An opportunity. Impeccable timing. It's nearly impossible, really. A millisecond earlier, the masked man was still within hollow, and Minato wouldn't have emerged victorious. One millisecond later, the masked man would have made contact, and he would have failed. Interestingly, initially I thought this man's repeated attacks were meant to expose vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Yet, within two seconds of turning his head, this man executed the battle so brilliantly. The so-called vulnerabilities and flaws had been discovered already in the first attack. Aizen sat up straight, at this moment, he began to contemplate if he had been too conceited, underestimating others. Self-assurance is an essential trait of a strong individual, but arrogance is not. An accomplishment, Aizen murmured, a faint smile curving his lips. His demeanor seemed to shift again. In the world of pirates, the most surprised figure is Kaido. It was his first encounter witnessing such an intricate battle, reaching the ultimate level, akin to an art piece. After the jutsu brought them back into the battlefield, Bulma narrowed her eyes, finding the handsome young man before her rather agreeable. In the pure land, Senju Tobarama nodded, acknowledging that the fourth Hokage's flying thunder god surpassed his own. On the flip side, Kushina, existing as a soul, lifted her head with a swan-like pride. Her thoughts at this moment were singular. To witness, my husband. Scene continues, the masked man gasped and leaped backward, his eyes filled with shock. Combat awareness and timing, just now, I was utterly outmatched. I mustn't be careless. However, before he could finish his sentence, Minato materialized in front of him in an instant, imprinting a palm strike. The masked man immediately grasped that when struck by Raisingan earlier, the other party had secretly marked him with the flying thunder god technique. But it's too late. The next second, Minato weaved a seal with his hands, and intricate symbols promptly engulfed the masked man's form. Seal of Contract In a heartbeat, the reflection of Sharingan within Ninetales' eyes vanished, liberating it from the masked man's control. I've lost. Eventually, Ninetales will belong to me. The masked man contemplated silently, distancing himself, 
leaving behind the proclamation of defeat, in the next second, his figure transmuted into Uzumaki mask and vanished. Minato didn't give chase, presently, subduing the raging Nine Tails took precedence. Incredibly, with Minato absent, there wasn't anyone within the village capable of containing Nine Tails. The so called mightiest third Hokage proved utterly ineffectual. In the pure land, Senju Hashirama's brow creased. Had the village deteriorated to such an extent that even Nine Tails couldn't be managed? Uchiha Madara and Senju Tobarama shared the same sentiment Kanoha was truly decaying. However, only these two individuals entertained such thoughts, other shinobi villages bore somber expressions. At this juncture, they were fortunate that Nine Tails wasn't within their own village. Otherwise, a day akin to this might dawn, a potential catastrophe. Nine Tails begins to condense tailed beast bomb once more. Amidst the widespread panic, an immense shadow descended from the sky, landing on Nine Tails' back. It's Minato summoning a toad from Mount Mayaboku. Nonetheless, this offered a limited solution, Nine Tails remained committed to amassing chakra for the release of the tailed beast bomb. As Kanoha's ninja quivered in fear, Nine Tails vanished instantaneously. Then, a brilliant white light once more illuminated a distant mountain range, followed by an explosion. All promptly understood that Minato had relocated Nine Tails out of the village. Rescued at last that this notion materialized instantaneously in everyone's mind. As the camera angle shifted, it revealed that alongside Nine Tails, Minato had also brought Kushina. Viewers from alternate worlds furrowed their brows. Why did Minato bring his ailing wife here? Yet, in the subsequent moment, shock rippled through everyone. Kushina, already weakened, suddenly radiated an astonishingly potent aura, with a dozen golden chakra chains erupting from her back. Nine Tails, once helpless amidst a village of shinobi, found itself instantaneously ensnared. Adamantin Sealing Chains An ability exclusive to the pure-blooded and exceptionally gifted Uzumaki clan member. Now, the camera captured a baby's cries as Minato used the flying thunder god to bring his child closer. Many people were not merely astounded by this woman's power, a touch of surprise also tingled in their hearts. Minato's eyes held profound sadness, as if he had reached a resolute decision. Kushina coughed, blood tainting her words. She intended to take Nine Tails with her in death, postponing its resurrection. In this instant, despite her impending demise, she gazed at her husband with a smile. Don't grieve, Minato. Your love has made me content. Kushina's gaze shifted to the infant in Minato's arms, tears collecting at the corners of her eyes. If I were to live on. Beyond envisioning our family of three. Contemplating future happiness. What more is there to envision? The happiness she yearned for. Simplistically having their family of three together. If today had unfolded without incident. One day in the future. The weather was fine, after breakfast, Minato headed to work, tending to Naruto at home. In the evening, Minato returned, greeted his family, embraced Naruto at the dinner table, and with a smile, listened to his husband's grievances about mundane work matters. Kushina laughed through tears. Even now that the mere thought of that situation seems immensely blissful. In the real world, Abito's eyes were vacant, he knelt weakly on the ground. What have I done? I doubt what a sinner I've become. No one responded to him, and even the insects chirping faded away in this moment of eerie silence. A horrifying dead silence hung in the air, as if foretelling that his future life would be just the same, a perpetual existence in solitude, forever trapped in darkness, with no means of escape. Scene transition, in this instance, even the mighty Minato found himself unable to contain his emotions any longer and broke down into tears. Kushina fixed her gaze on Naruto, her words intermittent as she expressed a mother's deepest longing, I truly wish to meet Naruto as he grows up. What kind of person will Naruto become in his adulthood? Will he retain his cheerful disposition, or develop a tender and compassionate heart? Will there be girls who will take a liking to him? You must have been handsome at your wedding. Kushina pondered. Minato wiped his tears away, his resolution firmly set. Kushina, there's no need for you to perish alongside the Nine Tails. I intend to seal your remaining chakra within Naruto so that you can see Naruto in future. And as for the Nine Tails, that's my responsibility. I plan to seal away half of it permanently, otherwise future tragedies will befall us. 
Amidst Kushina's shocked gaze, Minato began the sealing process. That technique. She could see at once that the seal Minato was using was exactly what she had taught him. The spirits were being sealed. It was the ultimate sealing art at the cost of one's own soul. As the final seal merged, a colossal and awe-inspiring transparent phantom emerged. The Shinigami had appeared. In the pure land, Kushina's tears flowed as she uttered in a frenzy, I regret teaching you this technique. Minato. In that moment, everyone finally grasped why, despite possessing the enigmatic flying thunder god technique, Minato was destined to meet his end. Because the only one capable of ending his life was himself. He was doing this in order to resolve the repercussions of the Nine Tails. To allow mother and child to reunite. In this moment, he was willing to sacrifice himself. Kushina suddenly recollected something. She looked up at Minato in disbelief. Minato's eyes glistened with tears, yet his voice was resolute, that's right. The other half of the Nine Tails, I intend to seal it within Naruto's body. I believe he'll be able to handle it in the future. Boom. At that instant, it was as if a lightning bolt had struck Naruto's soul. Every single detail from just before played on a loop in his mind. The child of the fourth Hokage was named Naruto, and this baby named Naruto had the nine tails sealed within him. Naruto quivered, muttering to himself in disbelief, My name is Naruto, and I carry the spirit of a demon fox within me. I am. The fourth Hokage's child. In that moment, Naruto burst into tears, releasing all the pent-up grievances he had borne over the years. I have parents. I'm not a malevolent demon fox. In the Uchiha clan, Sasuke was left flabbergasted. Naruto, who had lived in isolation since childhood, who had been despised by all and led an exceedingly bleak existence, was the son of the fourth Hokage. He even recalled a time when Naruto had confided in him secretly, sharing how he sometimes couldn't even afford to buy milk. But he never dared to voice this, for he knew no one would believe him. How could this be? It was entirely beyond his comprehension. Amidst the foliage, ordinary civilians seemed to catch on, but every ninja was astounded by this revelation. Sealing the nine tails within a baby's body, wasn't that what a Jinchuriki was? And a Jinchuriki being the child of a hero. Uzumaki Naruto, scorned and loathed by all, was the son of the fourth Hokage. How was this possible? Goodness gracious! What have we been doing all these years? A ninja fell to his knees, his hands trembling uncontrollably. By this time, many ninjas within Kanoha had turned their attention to the Hokage's office, ready to confront Sarutobi Hirozen. Why had they allowed this young soul, who should have been treated kindly, to endure such wretchedness? Within the Cloud Shinobi village, the rakage couldn't help but chuckle. He sneered. To shirk responsibility, the hatred of the Nine Tails was passed on to a mere child. That Sarutobi Hiruzen of yours, he's quite the mastermind. Now he understood fully the motives behind the third Hokage's actions. The chaos caused by the Nine Tails had led to countless deaths. The grieving masses required a target for their hatred to vent upon. And Jinchuriki fit the bill perfectly. However, if the Jinchuriki were also known to be the offspring of a hero, it would complicate matters. Hence, Sarutobi Hiruzen had concealed this fact. Making the child of a hero bear the brunt of everything, in terms of cruelty, you truly are unparalleled, third Hokage. Reikage shook his head with a derisive smile, incapable of stooping to such a level. Within the Hokage's office, Danzo sneered at the silent Sarutobi Hiruzen. Even he, as the leader of the Secret of Root, had been taken aback by the third Hokage's decision at the time. Within the cave, Uchiha Itachi was equally flabbergasted. He knew the boy named Naruto. Every time he carried Sasuke by the river, he would notice the little figure, lurking in the shadows, casting envious and hopeful glances. It was as if he was witnessing something he deeply desired, something he held within his own heart. Is it all for the sake of the village? In that moment, a conviction in Uchiha Itachi's heart crumbled completely. Jiraiya gazed up at the sky, it's been a while since I've returned. Naruto must be in his teenage years now. I wonder how things are going. Scene transition, why should our son bear such a monumental burden? 
Kushina's voice quavered, knowing full well, as a Jinchuriki herself, the disdain such an existence would attract. Furthermore, I hope you'll be there for Naruto's growth. Minato's eyes held a tinge of apology. But he couldn't make the decision to subject other people's children to the life of a Jinchuriki. Simultaneously, he held the belief that, as the fourth Hokage's son, after sacrificing himself for the village, Naruto's life should not be as grievous as other Jinchuriki's. In the next moment, the Shinigami unsheathed its sword. The final moments commence. Ceiling. The Shinigami's arms extended like serpents, piercing first through Minato's chest and then plunging into the Nine Tails. After being withdrawn, a massive blue phantom was pulled out and sealed within Minato. At this point, the Nine Tails had been reduced in size by half. Minato once again summoned a ceremonial altar. The next step was to seal the remaining Nine Tails into baby Naruto. Suddenly, Kushina began coughing violently, spewing blood, and Minato hurriedly rushed over in panic. Seizing the opportunity, the Nine Tails used its last strength to extend its claws and lunge towards the baby. It would never allow itself to be sealed again. It's getting closer, closing in. I can kill the child right now. Suddenly, the screen went dark, as if unable to bear witnessing it. Just one second. Puff. The sound of piercing. The screen lit up, with vivid red blood splattering against the white moonlight, strikingly conspicuous. Everyone couldn't help but wonder. Could it be that the real Naruto is dead, and the one in the village was intentionally given the name Naruto by the third Hokage to divert attention? However, in the next second, the revealed image shocked everyone. The Nine Tails' sharp claws pierced through the bodies of Minato and Kushina. In their final moment, the couple unitedly chose to use their bodies to block this attack. They succeeded. After all, the Nine Tails was weakened due to having half of its power sealed, and it had exhausted all its strength just now. Ultimately, its lethal claws stopped right above the baby, unable to descend. A deathly silence enveloped the valley. At this moment. Clap. Minato and Kushina's mixed blood dripped from Naruto's fingertips. As though this was the last mark left by the parents on their child. For a brief moment, viewers worldwide fell into silence. It was a tribute to them both. The profound selflessness of parental love was vividly displayed in this moment. Naruto wiped away tears, hoping to etch this instant into his heart forever. The flame of life began to gradually dim. Minato handed the sealing key to the summoned toad and gently spoke to Kushina, time is running out, Kushina. If there's anything you want to tell Naruto, now's the time. Kushina choked up as she gazed at the child so close yet forever out of reach. But she quickly ceased her tears. The countdown of life had commenced, she would convey everything she wished to convey in her remaining moments. Kushina, like any ordinary mother, earnestly advised her child. Naruto. Don't be a picky eater, eat your fill every day and grow up strong. Remember to take a warm bath every day. And don't stay up late, make sure you get enough sleep. I'm not a picky eater. While some foods aren't that healthy, it's fine. When I'm hungry, Irika sensei treats me to my favorite ramen. I'm in great shape now. I'll remember to take a shower every day. Off screen, tears glistened in Naruto's eyes as he earnestly responded to every statement. This moment felt like a reunion spanning twelve years. A caring mother's guidance and a devoted son's responses. Also, make friends. You don't need many friends. A few trusted comrades are sufficient. Strive in your studies, master ninjutsu well. But everyone has weaknesses, don't give up even if you struggle to learn. Yes, I already have a great partner and the best teacher. Off screen, Naruto was already sobbing, his words blending with tears. But he was still responding earnestly. As if, somehow, the Naruto on the screen could hear. Rest assured. Kushina was frail, yet she spoke with all her strength. As if Naruto could hear her. One more crucial thing. About the three ninja prohibitions. Don't recklessly borrow money, save your task rewards. Don't drink alcohol until you're twenty and even as an adult, drink in moderation for your health. And women are part of the three prohibitions. Mom was a woman too, so I don't know much. But as long as you find a woman as wonderful as your mother, it'll be alright. 
and be cautious around Jiraiya Sensei, don't pick up his bad habits. Naruto continuously nodded through his tears, he would forever remember these words. Kushina's breathing resembled a bellows, laboring heavily. She couldn't hold on much longer. Naruto. In the future, amidst sadness and pain, you'll face many challenges. Take things at your own pace. In your own time. And always nurture a dream within your heart. Then work to realize that dream. Have confidence in yourself. And. And. There are so many things I want to tell you. I wish I could live alongside you. Kushina's tears overflowed. Finally, thousands of words distilled into a single sentence. Her declaration of love. Even though they could never be together again, her profound love for Naruto would endure. In that moment, Kushina suddenly remembered Minato, and she reproached herself instantly. I'm sorry, Minato, for taking up all the time. It's all right, Kushina. Minato replied gently, turning his gaze towards Naruto and mustering a smile, Naruto. What your father wants to say. It's the same as your mother's words. The hourglass released its final drop. With the last seal. The scene grew dim. Beneath the gentle moonlight, after the Minato couple left their ultimate protection and love, the flame of life extinguished. Following the closing comments, as the world watched in anticipation, they pondered what the video would reveal about the courageous couple who had given their lives to safeguard them. Would it be a testament to their profound love, an unwavering resolve to sacrifice, or a defense of the village's honor? Or perhaps, like the previous video, was it penned by my own hand? The faded screen flickers to life once more, it returns to the moment of Minato's and Kushina's demise, a peculiar atmosphere filled the air, different from before. The unfolding scene took a new path, carrying the story forward. Continuing on the screen, with the nine tails sealed away, the claws that pierced their chests vanished, and Minato and Kushina fell together. The adamantin sealing chain's barrier dissipated, and Saratobi Hiruzen hastened to the altar, gently picking up the infant. Lord Third Hokage, could this be? The Fourth Hokage's child. The Fourth Hokage chose his own son to become a Jinchuriki. The two approaching ninjas were taken aback by this revelation. Sarutobi Hiruzen remained silent, withholding his response. First, he gazed towards the village, then turned his attention to the lifeless forms of Minato and Kushina before him. After a pause, he spoke with determination, secure this area, and concurrently, the identity of this child shall be classified as the village's utmost secret. Anyone who breaches this confidentiality shall be branded a traitor. Remember, henceforth, this child is solely the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails. In the pure land, Kushina struggled to believe what she had just heard. Merely a Jinchuriki. Was this the outcome brought by her and Minato's sacrifice? In that instant, rage and disbelief surged through Kushina. Within the confines of the Shinigami's world, Minato wore an expression of incredulity. However, unwilling to accept this truth, he found solace in a comforting notion, that perhaps the third Hokage's intent was to shelter Naruto and raise him well. The screen continues, this time fast-forwarding, the imagery portrays Naruto's solitary upbringing from infancy to his fourth year. But by his fifth year, he was assigned a dilapidated room on the second floor, where he lived alone. Simultaneously, word spread throughout the village of the Ninetales' release. Before long, even the common folk recognized the yellow-haired child as the embodiment of the demon fox. Among the shinobi, knowledge spread that the child was the Jinchuriki of the Ninetales. In the pure land, Kushina quivered with dread, as if glimpsing the impending future. She clamped her hand over her mouth to stifle her sobs, tears coursing down her cheeks. Meanwhile, Minato was consumed by disbelief, his last glimmer of hope now shattered. Loneliness, mistreatment, revulsion, hunger, fear, cold, the malice lurking in human hearts cruelly assailed this defenseless child. Those who had lived through the Ninetales' rampage channeled their hatred onto this innocent being. Though they may not have acted overtly, their deeds far surpassed malevolence. In his childhood, Naruto even purchased expired bottles of milk. Initially, he would return the spoiled milk, hoping for a replacement, but a group of individuals subjected him to abuse, accusing him of intentional wrongdoing even at his tender age. Ultimately, Naruto gritted his teeth, 
allowing himself to be swindled by those who would sell his goods. Sometimes, he subsisted on expired food. Due to the meager relief provisions, refusing sustenance meant facing hunger. As such, he endured countless instances of stomach ache caused by spoiled food. Yet, whenever he encountered something good, Naruto would revel in it for hours, feeling he had earned it. The picture concludes with a young Naruto seated alone on a swing within the ninja academy. As the sun dipped below the horizon, he gazed longingly at children being collected by their parents. The youngsters enthusiastically recounted their daily learnings to their caregivers, who in turn praised their efforts. The chill of his home left Naruto yearning for the warmth of such familial affection. It's good enough already. The closing words of that juvenile voice left the world awestruck. This twist of fate defied their expectations entirely. Was this truly the treatment befitting a hero's son? Not even an ordinary orphan should face such cruelty. It was akin to treating an enemy. Even the vilest villains struggled to reconcile with this revelation. Hokage's World, Kanoha Village At this juncture, it was not only the shinobi, but virtually every villager who trembled. Their past deeds now revealed themselves as transgressions, piercing the conscience of all. Within the Hokage's office, Saratobi Hiruzen removed his hat and placed it upon the table, as if he were confronting his own dark future. Jiraiya, who had been wandering the world, raced back to Kanoha with an urgency born of guilt. He chastised himself, acknowledging that half the blame for Naruto's harrowing childhood rested on his shoulders. If he could turn back time, this outcome might have been averted. In the pure land, Kushina's eyes burned with anger, her heart pierced by anguish. Given the chance, she would have slain the third Hokage without hesitation. Minato, too, was consumed by regret. Was this the purpose of his sacrifice? Why had he not heeded Kushina's counsel from the start? Had he survived, Naruto might have enjoyed a different, less tormented existence. Within the pure land, Senju Hashirama shook his head, profoundly disappointed by Kanoha's course. Meanwhile, Uchiha Madara smirked, vindicated in his assertion that this cycle was mere repetition. As long as the darkness in human hearts persisted, the core of this world would remain unchanged. The world of hunters. Within a building, an elderly man rose to his feet with a heavy sigh. Human suffering proved universal, and today, his spirits were particularly low. Decades of emotions, now stirred anew. He gazed silently at the world beyond the window, but before long, the vanishing screen returned once more. Ah, less than half an hour has passed, and it commences again. In the next instant, the countdown reappeared on the grey screen amidst the snowflakes. The image brightened. Devoid of living beings, this time the frame displayed an immense rose-shaped explosion. This detonation exuded an aura of terror and a foreboding miasma, derived from the frigidity encoded within, causing involuntary shivers. The renowned death scene, top. World of Hunters, Rose of the Destitute. In the world of Jujutsu Kaisen, Gojo Satoru removed his black scarf, revealing a pair of pale blue eyes cloaked in white mist. It's odd. An explosion of this scale. But why does it carry such a powerful ominous aura? It's putting me on edge. Satoru felt a bit perplexed, yet his six eyes couldn't provide additional information. He could only sense the tremendous danger emanating from this rose-like explosion. In the pirate world, what in the world is this? Kaido, renowned as the strongest creature, felt a shiver crawl down his spine. Every cell in his body was sounding an alarm, warning him of impending doom. In the Shinigami world, Aizen wore a puzzled expression. The ominous aura on the screen was overwhelmingly strong, but he felt no personal threat, which left him utterly baffled. In the Hunter's world, the Ant King tilted his head as he read the title. The Hunter World. I recall there's a Hunter Association on the human side. Could this be my world? The Ant King, about to summon the human girl for a game of chess, paused. After some contemplation, he decided to watch the video first. Simultaneously, an elderly man standing before a window touched his chest. Netero, the head of the Hunter Association, harbored complex emotions and countless thoughts. Is the poor man's rose truly reaching its climax? The screen starts, in a starry night sky, a golden dragon soared rapidly. As the camera zoomed in, two figures appeared above. One was a powerful elderly human, 
while the other was an enigmatic creature, crowned with blood-red pupils, long earlobes, and a tail resembling a giant needle tube. Its physique was robust, with dark green and turquoise skin, exuding an aura of immense strength. The creature was introduced as the Ant King, born powerful with the purpose of world domination. In reality, the Ant King was surprised to see himself in the video. Is this the future? And who's that human? Is he the one I'll clash with next? Outside the palace, Shayapuf concealed his anger behind a calm facade. Yet, his heart roared. A king in this apocalyptic scene. Even though it must be the human who had perished, he couldn't allow such a future to unfold. In the dark continent, five beings displayed disdainful expressions in unison. Rule the world. In a desolate surroundings, the golden dragon disintegrated, and the two figures crashed to the earth like meteors. When the dust settled, they stood unharmed. Netero, with furrowed brows, broke the silence. This is our weapons testing ground, we can engage without restraint. A strange scene unfolded as the Ant King, who sought world domination, remained motionless and calmly inquired, why fight? Netero was taken aback by this sudden calmness. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Normally, a battle should have erupted by now. What the Ant King said next, however, completely astonished him. The Ant King began speaking truthfully, outlining a utopia where benevolent humans could live happily, while the wicked became the ant's nourishment. His words were clear and persuasive, striving to convince Netero. In this moment, Netero realized the Ant King had transformed, resembling more of a revolutionary than an aggressor. To conclude, the Ant King even sat down, expressing a desire for a peaceful conversation. In reality, the Ant King pondered why he had uttered such words. Although the video had altered his aspirations for domination, the immediate future still seemed in line with his original intentions. So who had changed him? Meanwhile, Netero sighed by the window. The more human-like the Ant King became, the heavier the burden of guilt for eliminating him. On the screen, Netero remained silent. Though a formidable figure with authority over thousands of hunters, he was still bound by rules. How could humans live the rule of ants? It had been an unattainable idea from the beginning. Although the Ant King blurred the lines between humans and ants, they must not be conflated, and eventually, one side would prevail. Netero realized that he needed to eliminate the Ant King before he became too human and his resolve wavered. He approached the Ant King, saying calmly, My king, this isn't easy for us. With that, Netero extended his arms, creating afterimages, and clasped his hands from bottom to top. At this moment, the Ant King's eyes widened in shock as he sensed a tremendous energy emanating from the old man before him. A golden light emanated from Netero's palm, and as darkness descended, a sun-like circle appeared behind him, rapidly expanding. In the next second, blinding golden light engulfed everything as an enormous golden guanine materialized behind him. Guanin wore a compassionate expression with two tears but possessed dozens of slender, elongated arms, giving it a terrifying appearance. This was Netero's nin ability, 100 type Guanin Bodhisattva's enhanced ability. Without hesitation, Netero swung his palm downward. First hand. At that moment, the air resounded with a deafening boom as the golden palm left behind after images, striking the Ant King with overwhelming force. Is this the power of Isaac Netero? It's truly terrifying. As they gazed upon the colossal figure resembling Bodhisattva, like a god, the smile slowly faded from the face of a red-haired man. Hisoka's eyes widened in astonishment, and for a moment, he wondered if he could withstand even a single blow. In the hunter world, it seemed as though many witnessed the very concept of death when that colossal palm descended. It was unbelievable that a man of 120 years still possessed such formidable strength. One could only imagine how formidable he must have been in his youth. The scene unfolds, the earth quaked and crumbled, countless stones shattered, and dust and debris filled the air. Netero patiently awaited, not assuming he could defeat his opponent in a single strike. As the dust settled, the Ant King showed only a trickle of purple blood at the corner of his mouth, with no significant injuries. Netero appeared slightly taken aback. Even though it was only the first attack, Netero had not held back, yet he hadn't anticipated being unable to breach the defense. Without hesitation, Netero launched another attack. Third hand. 
The massive golden guanine folded its hands together, attempting to crush the ant king within its palm. However, suddenly, its golden palm quivered, as if it were made of molten gold, and a pair of crimson eyes gleamed through the gap. Do you truly desire death so much? A faint voice emanated, devoid of any discernible emotion. In that instant, Netero sensed a dreadful premonition assaulting his mind. The next moment, the ant king extended his arms, causing the immense golden guanine's palm to disintegrate into light. Startled, Netero stepped back, but then he realized the ant king had not attacked and had resumed his seated position. One party clearly didn't wish to engage in combat but rather sought peaceful resolution through conversation, while the other was determined to fight. Heh, what's this? Playing house. Da Flamingo, in the world of pirates, sneered with disdain. Other spectators furrowed their brows. Initially, 100 type Guanin Bodhisattva had been an astounding sight, but this turn of events seemed rather dull. However, one individual found amusement in the situation, Aizen. It amused him greatly to witness a display of humanity from a seemingly cold blooded ant creature. In the hunter's world, Netero shook his head, he had no desire to fight if he could avoid it. But that was impossible. The ant king appeared nonchalant. Realize that all we can do is communicate through words. His words reflected absolute confidence, for he currently considered the other's strength insignificant. Netero, on the other hand, felt frustrated by the Ant King's persistence. This was a racial conflict, and if it could be resolved through words, there would be no need to worry. However, he soon realized something important. The Ant King appeared to be unaware of his name. As expected, the promise of learning his name enticed the Ant King. As long as Netero allowed himself to be struck, he would reveal his name to the Ant King. Off-screen, the Ant King also rose to his feet. He had never known his name since birth. Seeing this, Netero grinned triumphantly. At the same time, the symbolic chains that bound him seemed to loosen. In Netero's eyes, there was a determination to complete his mission, even if it meant sacrificing himself. Finally, the true battle was about to commence. It appears I have no choice but to take you seriously. The Ant King's eyes remained calm as an abyss-like purple aura enveloped his body. As Netero released his power, a golden radiance surrounded him. He sat cross-legged in mid-air and summoned a zen-like energy, as if a colossal lotus had sprung beneath him. In the next moment, Netero's eyes burst open, radiating a brilliant golden light. The enormous golden guanine reappeared. Type Guanin Bodhisattva. 99 Hand. In that instant, the very air seemed to tear apart. The colossal Guanin unleashed a barrage of strikes almost simultaneously, filling the sky with countless golden palm prints. Palm after palm, they formed an unbreakable chain, sealing off every escape route for the Ant King. At that moment, the Ant King was overwhelmed and unable to move. Was it a thousand palms? Or perhaps ten thousand? The count was lost in the onslaught. On the ground, all that could be seen was a formidable golden guanine descending like a machine gun, bombarding the earth. Boom! 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 The earth trembled continuously, rocks disintegrated into dust, and as Netero roared, the unrelenting guanine displayed no mercy. A palm, even more potent than before, descended. The earth resembled a quagmire, Soil transformed into towering waves, soaring dozens of meters into the air. Boom! In the massive crater, the earth shattered, revealing a hidden palace underneath, now pierced through. The Ant King plummeted into the abyss, and the colossal Guanine followed. Netero gazed upon the Ant King, his expression calm, as if he were stating a simple fact. This is your final resting place. Type. Guanine Bodhisattva shone brilliantly at that moment and the thickest right arm descended. This palm swings like a colossal pendulum, carrying unparalleled force, instantly striking the Ant King. The underground palace continued to tremble, and the Ant King appeared powerless to retaliate, resembling a puppet colliding with several massive stone pillars before bouncing and collapsing to the ground. Many humans in the hunter world were exhilarated by this spectacle and shouted in excitement. However, the three guardians of the Ant King, Neferpatu, Sheapuf, and Menthathiyupi, remained expressionless, showing no signs of panic. Several renowned figures from various worlds shook their heads, recognizing that this attack, although impressive, 
failed to inflict any harm. It wasn't that the elderly human was feeble, it was that the creature known as the Ant King possessed an exceptionally resilient body. Boom! The Ant King displayed no signs of injury whatsoever and appeared provoked by this assault. In the next instant, his body once again glowed with a purple aura, transforming into a shadowy blur to strike at Netero. Simultaneously, a multitude of golden afterimages illuminated the hall as the 100-type Guanin Bodhisattva attacked relentlessly under Netero's control. At this point, the Ant King realized he couldn't draw near. Every time he approached, the colossal golden Guanin shadowed him closely, striking him unfailingly. After analyzing the attack again, the Ant King noticed that his opponent's swinging arms were nearly ineffective in combat, yet strangely, incredibly swift. But Netero felt no doubt whatsoever. Many years ago, he had swung his arms fully, delivering 10,000 punches every day, with relentless dedication. Initially, it took an entire day, but eventually, he could execute all 10,000 punches in under an hour. And today was no different. Netero's rapid movements initiated a series of relentless attacks. In Ant King's eyes, the opposing defenses resembled an ever-changing game of military chess. Furthermore, due to his game with Kamugi, Ant King had acquired the ability to anticipate his opponent's moves, as every individual possessed their unique breathing rhythm, forming a distinctive pattern. And if one could perceive this pattern, they could uncover their adversary's vulnerabilities. In the Shinigami world, Aizen marveled at how quickly this creature was learning. Each attack wasn't in vain but instead lured the opponent to strike from different angles. Suddenly, his eyes lit up. In the scene, the Ant King was sent flying once more. However, as he soared through the air, he swiftly kicked off the ground and retaliated in an instant. An opening had emerged, and like a skilled chess player capturing a piece, the Ant King severed Netero's right leg. In the real world, the previously excited humans were now bewildered and in disbelief. Their ostensibly unbeatable opponent had been unable to touch the human's body, so how could he suddenly be defeated? Nonetheless, the facts remained unchanged. The Ant King nonchalantly shook the blood off his hands and spoke with the demeanor of a victor, stop the bleeding, then tell me my name. However, Netero refused to concede, forcefully slapping his palm against his thigh, causing the blue veins to swell, muscles to contract, and staunch the bleeding. Observing the humans who still possessed a fighting spirit, the Ant King grinned for the first time, almost making a declaration, Next, I shall relieve you of your left arm. Boom! The hall continued to vibrate as two figures of contrasting colors engaged in rapid combat. At this point, the naked eye could no longer follow their movements. All that could be seen were a multitude of golden fists, all of them mirages created by the Ant King. But the final outcome mirrored the previous encounter. Just as he had declared earlier, the Ant King cleanly severed Netero's left arm. As if assuming that the humans before him were already defeated, the Ant King resumed his seated position. However, could one fight with just one arm? Netero paid no attention to the injury, flashing a sardonic smile, and stood with one hand placed over his chest. In the next moment, the massive golden Guanin materialized behind the Ant King. At this juncture, Guanin bore a compassionate expression, with all of her arms extended in a senju shape. 100 type Guanin Bodhisattva. Zero hand. A look of shock crossed the Ant King's eyes as he realized he could not evade. He could only watch as two massive palms slowly enveloped him. The touch was gentle, akin to a warm embrace. Then, abruptly, the compassionate Guanin's visage contorted into something hideous. Her mouth stretched grotesquely wide, revealing a dark and terrifying void within. The energy within Netero's body now poured from him like a brilliant star into the black abyss. Boom! A blinding and terrifying golden torrent, brimming with destructive power, roared forth, striking the Ant King in the palm of his hand. The torrent continued to pound, shattering the ground instantly in melting countless soils. When the tumult ceased, a chasm of immeasurable depth remained, alongside cooling magma, and the Ant King had vanished. Many viewers from various worlds were in awe, this was the first time they had witnessed an attack that couldn't be avoided. Even through the screen, they felt their hearts gripped by an inexplicable warmth that made it impossible to conceive of an assault. In the Shinigami world, Zaraki Kenpachi frowned, feeling extremely uncomfortable. Aizen contemplated the situation. 
Throughout the worlds, this was the first time he had seen such an extraordinary attack. This expanded his horizons. However, in the hunter's world, everyone's concern was whether the ant king had perished or not. The energy attack they had just witnessed had clearly undergone a qualitative transformation. The scene continues. Amidst the settling dust, Netero leaned against the ground with one hand, gasping for breath. What was even more astonishing was Netero's current appearance. At this moment, he resembled an elderly man who had been plagued by disease for centuries, his once robust body now emaciated, his eyes sunken, and his flesh clinging to his skeleton like a layer of parchment. He looked like a mummy drained of its life essence. Many immediately grasped that the attack had not only unleashed all of Netero's energy but had also converted all the essence of his flesh and blood into power. Drip, drip. Footsteps suddenly resounded, and the Ant King reappeared. Not only was he not dead, but he appeared slightly disheveled and not severely wounded. Gazing at an opponent who resembled a centuries-old elder, the Ant King calmly remarked, For your sake, I will establish a special zone for humans to reside. As for the humans suitable for consumption, I will consider a selection process. So, you shall not fight alone in vain. In the hunter world, ordinary people were trembling. In their eyes, the president of the hunter association had lost. Would their future be consigned to becoming food? Many wept, and some even contemplated joining the ant king prematurely, hoping to secure their survival. Meanwhile, many hunters were disheartened, feeling overwhelmed by the ant king's power. In other worlds, powerful beings shook their heads. What an unequal battle! Was it all over? Although the human's life-threatening strike was astounding, many believed that this battle was nothing compared to previous encounters. However, at this moment, all viewers were struck by horror. I see. In the scene, Netero's eyes darkened as a tremendous malevolence emanated from his form. This malevolence was so vast that it seemed tangible, akin to a grinning skeleton selecting its next victim to consume. From Netero's lips came a voice, old and hoarse. I'm not fighting alone. Do not underestimate humans, Maruam. Netero laughed for the first time, though beneath his gaunt and horrifying visage, he appeared more like a demon. This is the malevolence within the human heart. At this moment, the underground palace seemed to vanish, enveloped in boundless malevolence, resembling hell. Netero clasped his sword fingers together, driving them into his own heart without hesitation, uttering his final words. If there is a hell, we'll meet there. Listening to Netero's gradually slowing heartbeat, the Ant King's eyes widened suddenly. For the first time, he felt the sensation of fear. The Ant King didn't comprehend why his opponent had chosen suicide, but he sensed death looming. He realized he could die here. Ant King instantly understood what Netero did. This battle. You. Indeed. So from the beginning. Netero was ready to sacrifice himself. To kill Ant King, the next second, a blinding white light consumed everything. Hidden within Netero, a small nuclear bomb triggered by cardiac arrest detonated. First, the fireball collapsed and then erupted ruthlessly in the following moment. A colossal flame soared into the sky, and a devastating shockwave devoured everything. Finally, a crimson pillar of evil rose stood amidst the scorched earth. The silence returned to the world, and Satoru Gojo put on the black scarf to cover his eyes once more. He finally understood the source of his unease. A nuclear bomb. It was such a small yet devastating nuclear bomb. He knew that the Ant King, Maruam, would undoubtedly not survive. Even if his physical body could withstand the explosion's force due to its incredible durability, the genetic damage from radiation had no remedy. It was a poison that causes gene collapse that no flesh and blood creature could endure. In the Shinigami world, Bayakuya Kuchiki couldn't help but swallow hard. This is a bomb. Compared to it, my Bankai appears minor. The commander-in-chief also widened his eyes, a look of shock evident. Being highly attuned to flames, he could clearly sense that the explosion center exceeded the temperature of his Bankai's 15 million degrees. It's unimaginable that a weak human could create such a terrifying weapon. But what's with that ominous aura? He hoped for an explanation in the video. The screen continues. A towering crimson mushroom cloud rises thousands of meters into the sky. 
Viewed from above, it appears as if an exquisite flower is blooming on earth. However, this is a flower of destruction. The core temperature of the exploding fireball reaches tens of millions of degrees, with even the outer edges exceeding hundreds of thousands of degrees. The ensuing firestorm could easily obliterate a city. Fortunately, this area, with a radius of hundreds of kilometers, is uninhabited, otherwise, countless lives would have been lost. As the flower withers completely, a massive crater emerges. The soil within the pit turns white, and the sand has transformed into glass. As for Netero, a human by form, he has turned to ash. Yet, on the crater's edge, a piece of damaged charcoal recommugens, still clinging to life. Although it flickers like a candle in the wind, the Ant King Marom survives. In the palace, the Ant King paid no attention to his dire situation in the video and instead whispered his name. Marom. That human asked for my name, and this time, I can answer. He intended to rise and look for Kamugi, but the video continued. In the hunter world, ordinary people were in utter shock, even despair. Yet in a certain council, the top human watching the video recommugined expressionless. These individuals had no fear of the video revealing tactics. Nuclear bombs vary in scale, essentially concerning how much land and how many people are forsaken. For the Dark Continent plan, both the Ant King and Netero must perish. The screen continues. As the Ant King neared death, one of his three royal guards rushed to him. By sacrificing their body for the Ant King, he was reborn even stronger. Just as the viewers were astounded by this scene, the video began to fast forward. The Ant King lost his memory due to the explosion but quickly regained it. He chose not to seek revenge against humans but instead played chess with a human girl. Their relationship seemed to transcend race, yet it recommugined ambiguous. One human and one ant, both genuinely happy. However, at that moment, the screen went completely black. The voices of the two could still be heard, inexplicably playing blind chess. Minus 7 to 2, Shinobu Shin. Minus 5 to 1, horse riding. Suddenly, the Ant King Maruam seemed anxious, Kamugi, are you still there? Yes, I'm. I'm not going anywhere. I've lost, sighed the Ant King. The Ant King continued to lose the next few rounds. When Kamugi thought he would continue, the Ant King spoke wearily, a bit. Tired. Want to take a nap. Then he asked somewhat pleadingly, can you just. Hold my hand like this. Can you always be by my side? At that moment, Kamugi's pure and gentle voice rang out, I'm not leaving. We'll be together forever. A very faint voice then sounded, finally. Can you call my name one more time? A small light appeared on the dark screen. It was a small hand groping, finally touching the Ant King's face and firmly holding his hand. The screen lit up entirely. At some point, the Ant King had collapsed and quietly fell into Kamugi's arms. As for the once healthy girl, blood flowed from her nose and mouth, her life's flame dimmed. But the girl continued to smile, as if soothing a child, and softly said, Rest well. Maruam. I'll join you soon. At the end of the screen, Kamugi embraced the lifeless body of the Ant King Maruam, smiling, and passed away peacefully. In the end, no one survived this battle. And the reason for the ominous rose flame became clear to all who watched it. Radiation. In other words, poison. Invisible poison. Even those nearby were not spared. The viewers from various worlds fell into silence. Using a nuclear bomb, was it despicable? No. As Netero had said, this was not his fight alone. This was humanity's battle against the ants. A struggle for survival. In this sense, it was humanity that emerged victorious. The screen darkens, and the final comment appears. Humans are strong because they are weak. Everyone understood that this was Netero's comment or that of a human. Then, the Ant King Maruam had his say. His ant head lit up, and a line of text appeared. When there is light in one's heart, one is no longer a cold-blooded creature. Hunter World, in front of the Ant King Maruam, one of the three royal guards, Sheapuf, lay sprawled on the ground, his arm brutally mangled. The reason behind this gruesome scene was Sheapuf's unwavering determination to eliminate the intruder, Kamugi. For Sheapuf, 
this human girl was an obstacle to the king's reign, and he harbored a secret desire to assassinate her. Taking advantage of a brief lapse in the king's attention, Sheapuf seized the opportunity as soon as the video concluded. His desperate act managed to anger Miriam. Next time. I'll end you, Maruam calmly declared, his gaze briefly shifting to the motionless eagle perched in a nearby tree. He then turned and made his way toward the palace. As he drew closer, his footsteps gradually slowed, a sense of deja vu washing over him. Upon reaching the palace's entrance, Maruam addressed the girl kneeling before him. From now on, do not refer to me as king. My name is Maruam. Pirate World, Sengoku remained silent, struggling to grasp the reality of the catastrophic explosion, a power seemingly harnessed and mass-produced by humans. Even the world government's coveted Pluton paled in comparison to this newly unveiled threat. If any pirate crew or faction in this world possessed such weaponry, who would dare challenge their dominance? Demon Slayer's world, Kagaya Abuyashiki contemplated the situation deeply. Perhaps the Demon Slayers had overlooked many potential solutions. The rapid advancement of human technology in recent decades offered a fresh perspective on dealing with souls. What if sunlight could be manufactured as a weapon? Even if that approach proved ineffective, there might be other technological means to enhance their combat capabilities. Hokage World, Orochimaru narrowed his eyes, his first encounter with the formidable power of technology. Ninjutsu. Science. Perhaps my scientific pursuits shouldn't be solely dedicated to enhancing ninjutsu. Science itself possesses limitless potential, far surpassing ninjutsu. In this moment, Orochimaru glimpsed a new path and felt a growing excitement. Abruptly, he turned his attention to the man behind the Uzumaki mask and offered a sly smile. Hey! Abito, perhaps technology can help you achieve your desires. Abito, lost in thought, murmured to himself, using ninjutsu to complement science. Shinigami world, Aizen had infiltrated the human realm with ease and combed through vast amounts of information. However, to his dismay, he found no trace of the technology he sought. Yet, Aizen remained undeterred. He knew that humans had displayed remarkable ingenuity over the centuries, and he was prepared to wait for their next innovation. After all, I have all the time in the world. I can be patient. Upon returning to Hueco Mundo, Aizen expected the screen to reappear soon. It's quite swift. I wonder if there's a world beyond mine. Anticipation gleamed in Aizen's eyes. He anticipated a scene where he would assail the Soul King's palace and defeat the Soul King himself. He wasn't concerned about an early reveal. Once the Hogyoku reached its full potential, the outcome would be inevitable, regardless of how many divergent timelines existed. The ultimate outcome would be singular, Aizen Sosuke would transcend the bounds of this world and ascend to unparalleled heights, becoming the one and only. But. In the next instant, the screen illuminated, baffling all viewers with its peculiar display. The screen was split down the middle, on the left side, a monstrous flame distorted space, its source unmistakably the Riatsu of Godii 13 Captain Yamamoto Genryusai. On the right side, an endless void of pure blackness seemed capable of devouring one soul, a Riatsu unlike any Aizen had ever encountered. Aizen's shock was evident, he recognized these Riatsu signatures. What did he feel? This was Riatsu. At the same time, in Siriidei, Kairaku Shunsui, who had been leisurely basking in the sun on a rooftop, abruptly sat up, his eyes filled with disbelief. This is Sensei's Riatsu. Teacher. Dead in the future. Kairaku Shunsui's worldview shattered in that moment. He couldn't fathom the death of the Shinigami's strongest figure, their teacher. Moreover, the Riatsu on the right, dark as a bottomless pit, eclipsed even his teacher's power. In Siriidei, Yamamoto's stern countenance showed a spark of surprise. He wasn't shocked by his own death but by the one who would bring about his demise. You're going to be killed too. Ichibai Hayasub. This marked the emergence of the title, Death Scene, No. The World of Shinigami, Thousand Years of Blood War, Death of Two Heroes. The screen starts. Within the expansive white walls, numerous ancient structures are scattered about. In the center stands a magnificent white edifice. This is the Siriidei, located at the heart of the Soul Society, 
serving as the central hub for Shinigami's political, military, and residential affairs. The scene is serene, bustling with Shinigami going about their duties, creating an atmosphere of peace. At this point, the camera starts its ascent from bottom to top. The blue sky, devoid of a single cloud, suddenly witnesses an ominous presence. The camera zooms in, revealing a man with long black hair and a beard. He carries an imposing countenance, adorned with three silver badges on each lapel and a crimson cloak. He stands aloof in the sky, gazing down upon the Syriidae. In the Invisible Empire, Yawach closed his eyes and tilted his head slightly, expressing surprise. So, my future has been revealed. But at this point, it hardly matters. In this world, Ichigo Kurosaki's body tenses, and he gazes at the figure in disbelief, his mind plagued with profound questions. Why is that Zangetsu? What is happening here? In Hueco Mundo, Aizen's countenance darkens. In the vision of the future, the Siriidei remains unharmed. Could it be that he has failed? Impossible. How could he lose when he possesses the Hogyoku? Within the conference room of the Siriidei, Genryosai Shigekuni Yamamoto suddenly emanates a tremendous riatsu. All the captains present feel as though a mountain is bearing down upon them, making it nearly impossible to breathe. The captains are left in astonishment, unable to comprehend why the head captain's reaction is so intense. At that moment, Yamamoto retracts his riatsu, fixes his gaze on the figure displayed on the screen, and utters solemnly, he's human. The king of the Quincy. Named Yawach. And I, beheaded him a thousand years ago. Resurrection from the dead. A different possibility dawns upon everyone. Perhaps the enemy never truly perished. In this vision of the future, revenge is imminent. Just as the captains reel from shock, the scene shifts. Dozens of sword-like blue riatsu burst into the sky, shattering the protective barrier enveloping the Siriidei. Subsequently, numerous figures emerge from the blue riatsu. Amidst an impending disaster, captains and officers from every division rush to confront the threat. The first to encounter the enemy is the third division. Before Kira can clearly see the enemy, a spiritual light arrow obliterates the right half of his body. Suddenly, the other division members meet the same fate. The scene transitions to seven individuals in white uniforms, set against an exhilarating musical backdrop. These are the members of the Stern Ritter, the Star Cross Knights. First is the Stern Ritter F, as not, symbolizing the power of fear. Second is the Stern Ritter E, Bambietta Basterbine representing the power of, critical strike. Third is the stern ritter N, Robert Akutron, associated with the power of, unknown. Fourth is the stern ritter I, Tsang Du, known for the power of, steel. Fifth is the stern ritter O, Driscoll Bursi, holding the power of, excessive torture. Sixth is the stern ritter H, Baz B, embodying the power of, scorching heat. And the leader of the stern ritter, Jugram Hashwolf, bearing the letter, B, and symbolizing the, balance of the world. At this moment, the leader, Hashwolf, wearing an expression of disdain for all beings, declares, tremble, Shinigami. From now on, you shall be purged by the stern ritter. His words delivered, four captains rushed to the battlefield. Bayakuya Kuchiki, Kamamura Sajin, Hitsugaya Toshiro, and Suifong. In the midst of battle, they realize the enemy's overwhelming power, forcing them to resort to their bankai. However, a shocking twist unfolds, the Sternritter easily confiscate and employ the bankai abilities of the four captains. In the Shinigami world, the captains within the conference room can scarcely believe the scene before them. This is the power to steal bankai, their greatest strength. Bankai is the cornerstone of a captain's might. How can they combat this impending threat? The screen continues. Kairaku Shunsue, who has never released his Bankai, confronts the stern ritter N, Robert Akutron. Just as the captains await the outcome with bated breath, a startling occurrence transpires. Within a few exchanges, Kairaku Shunsue loses an eye to the enemy. In just ten minutes since the stern ritter invaded, the Soul Society suffers heavy casualties. On the other front, Bayakuya Kuchiki, robbed of his Bankai, battles against the stern ritter F, as not. Deprived of his Bankai's strength, Bayakuya falls victim to the enemy's ratio of light arrow. Witnessing this, as not jeers, your Sternritter ability is fear. 
anyone hit by your attack will scream and go mad from fear. Yet, Bayakuya remains a captain, trained over many years. Despite being wounded, he retaliates with his blade. Fear, however, is an innate human emotion that can be suppressed but never vanquished. As time passes, the fear in Bayakuya's heart intensifies. But then, Bayakuya realizes that the best way to conquer fear is to imagine the people he holds dear. To protect them, no fear can deter him. At that moment, Rukia's image appears in Bayakuya's mind. She is the sole individual he cherishes. In his mind, Rukia wears a gentle smile. To safeguard that smile, Bayakuya's resolve solidifies. Within the conference room, the captains regard Bayakuya with admiration. His stoic countenance reveals no trace of fear. Indeed, Bayakuya Kuchiki has swiftly conquered fear. Yet, in the invisible empire, as Nat's eyes betray a sense of mockery. Bayakuya, fortified by his newfound courage, remains steadfast. However, in the next instant, this serene moment shatters. Rukia's visage, once gentle, begins to decay gradually. Her skin peels away, unveiling a skull. Flies infest one eye, while nerves dangle from her mouth. Rukia's transformation into a grotesque and terrifying skeleton is complete. The courage in Bayakuya's heart dissipates, his spiritual foundation crumbles. His consciousness wanes, and he falls. As Nat, representing fear, advances, impales Bayakuya through the chest, and seizes his spiritual realm. Countless flies swarm over his body, infiltrating through nose and mouth. A revolting buzzing ensues, a requiem for Bayakuya. Bayakuya cries out in agony, summoning his last vestiges of instinct, and slashes at his knot. Yet, as Nat effortlessly evades, taking the opportunity to taunt Bankai. Senbon Sakura Kagiyoshi. Suddenly, myriad Sakura petals transform into razor-sharp blades, mercilessly slicing Bayakuya. Blood sprays, Sakura petals converge to form a ring-shaped pink cloud. Ace Nat slowly descends from the ring, looking down at Bayakuya like a deity. Rinji attacks, only to be sent flying after a few blows. Observing this, Bayakuya stands once more. Yet, countless Sakura blossoms transform into a deluge, submerging him. Blood stains Bayakuya's form, his once dreaded Bankai now becomes his own nightmare. Finally, his Zanpakuto shatters, Bayakuya falls to the ground, his fate uncertain. The conference room falls into silence, a pall of shadow casting over the captains. Bayakuya Kuchiki's expression is the most grim of all. Even across the screen, Rukia's grotesque transformation renders him horrified and incredulous. In the human world, Yurahara Kisuk, the shopkeeper, is astounded. Even in the midst of the Aizen crisis, his resolve remains unbroken. Yet, before him, the enemy has dismantled a formidable captain with ease. Without understanding the mechanics at play, he is left perplexed as to how Bankai was stolen. Can this future, even if known, truly be altered? At this moment, his confidence wavers. In another part of the Soul Society, Hashwalf, leader of the Stern Ritter, reports to Yawach, referred to as His Majesty. However, this news fails to elicit satisfaction from Yawach, who nonchalantly remarks, it took longer than expected. It seems we underestimated our opponents. As everyone gazes upon Yawach's seemingly insincere demeanor, only Captain Zaraki Kenpachi and Captain Commander Yamamoto feel a shiver creeping from their spine to their brain. Is this merely a bluff? Has Yawach truly unleashed his full power? In an instant, they can only hope that the man before them is indeed all talk. His words hang in the air, the space around darkening. Suddenly, an overwhelmingly potent Ryatsu materializes. The two turn to witness a one eyed man approaching, bearing the corpses of three Sternritter members. Ha, are you the leader of this group of weaklings? Zaraki Kenpachi exclaims eagerly. The conference room erupts in excitement. Everyone recalls that Zaraki Kenpachi never even uses Shirkai, these Sternritter are merely playthings to him. Observing the screen, Zaraki Kenpachi bears few scars compared to his previous battles. It appears this fight is quite easy for him. Zaraki Kenpachi gazes at Yawach with unbridled enthusiasm. At last, someone worth cutting has appeared. Ha ha ha. The screen continues. Zaraki Kenpachi bursts into laughter, wielding his Zanpakuto, 
covered in gaps, and slashes at Yawach. Yet, Yawach merely raises his arm with a smile, effortlessly blocking the strike. After several rounds, Zaraki Kenpachi collapses, unconscious and drenched in blood. Yawach seizes him by the neck, hanging him in the air, and taunts him, one of the special combatants, Zaraki Kenpachi, is so fragile. It seems I overestimated you. Sleep, soul society is helpless. In Hueco Mundo, Aizen narrows his eyes, sensing an impending unease. In the conference room of the Suriidei, Yamamoto remains resolute, waiting for nothing. Uno Hanaretsu's gaze hints at a change as she regards Zaraki Kenpachi, who is still exhilarated. At this moment, a potent and familiar Riatsu abruptly emanates from the screen. The screen shifts, revealing the appearance of a captain on the other side of the Soul Society. Everything shall turn to ash and drift away. Ryujin Jaka The commander-in-chief roars in fury as Ryujin Jaka sweeps forth with a mighty slash. Opposite him, the stern ridder O, Nianzo Weizal, embodying excessive brutality, is instantly consumed by the raging flames, reduced to ashes within seconds. In the following moment, the commander-in-chief employs Shuenpa, hurtling towards a long-forgotten Riatsu. The immense Riatsu he exudes permeates every corner of the Siriidei. After he remembers about thousand years ago, a wrathful Yamamoto Genryusai, wreathed in ferocious flames, crashes before Yawach. Long time no see, Yawach. I shall put an end to your existence. Terrible old man. At this moment, even Uchiha Madara's face changed color. This is the only time he has felt so much pressure since watching the video. And this is just the other side's aura. In the hunter world, shock could be seen in the eyes of the Ant King. He was not so shocked even by the previous nuclear bomb explosion. But now, the instinct of the Ant King is telling him that the person in front of him can easily kill him. Shinigami World In this world, Kurosaki Ichigo was afraid for a while. He remembered that in Sokayaku Hill when Rukia was to be executed before, if the captain commander was not stopped by Kairaku Shunsue, then he might have died. In the Soul Society, there was a look of anticipation in the eyes of the captains. They have never seen Yamamoto take action. In the Invisible Empire, the closed-eyed friend Habak chuckled lightly, without a trace of panic. Screen continues, Yawach looks calm, then throws away Kenpachi Zaraki like trash. In order to protect their majesty, the members of the three Sternritter Knights U, F, and H are besieging Yamamoto. However, a shocking scene appeared. A huge red pillar of fire rises into the sky. The three people who are stronger than the captain level have been seriously injured by the heat released by Ryujin Jaka before they can touch Yamamoto. It turns out that they can't even get close. Countless Shinigamis with mouths wide open. This exaggerated strength has broken through their imagination. Maybe they are no different from the ants on the ground in front of the captain commander. In the conference room, Toshiro Hitsugaya smiled wryly. He claimed that Hyrenmaru, the strongest ice element Zanpakuto in the millennium, was a joke at this moment. He was afraid that the ice created would melt the moment it appeared. Looking at his subordinates who were seriously injured and fell to the ground, Yawach's indifferent expression was not touched at all, and he said very calmly, it's really a bunch of ignorant people. That's what happened when they broke into my battle. In the Hidden Empire, the three Sternritter members fell to their knees instantly. At this moment, their backs were completely wet with sweat, their eyes trembled in horror, and they didn't even dare to lift their heads. However, Yawach neither made a sound nor punished, but just made the three of them kneel like that. Yamamoto feels very contemptuous for Yawach to treat his subordinates so contemptuously, and he is unwilling to continue to talk too much. The next moment, the ground under the commander's feet shattered instantly, and his figure instantly came to Yawach. Holding the flame sword Ryujin Jaka, he slashed heavily. However, Yawach just raised his arm and activated Quincy's defensive ability Quiet Blood Suit to block this powerful blow. Then Yawach took off the Quincy cross on his chest and turned it into a black long sword. Seeing this, Yamamoto doesn't have the slightest idea of hiding power, he intends to use the most fiery power to turn Yawach into ashes. Boom! Spiritual pressure, which is dozens of times more violent than before, soars into the sky. At this moment, the sky lost its color and turned into black and white. 
the space seemed to be unable to withstand this pressure, and began to tremble and scream. The Soul Society's strongest Shinigami finally showed his true strength. Bankai. Zenka no Tachi. Outside the screen, countless viewers turned pale, as if they saw an endless world of flames. Obviously, there is no heat, but it feels extremely hot, and there are dense beads of sweat oozing out of the forehead. Shinigami world, countless Shinigamis are shaking. In, Hueco Mundo, except for Aizen and Okuyora, all of the Espada, S faces changed greatly. What a terrible spiritual pressure, if it were face to face, I'm afraid I wouldn't even have the heart to resist. Then Ikimaru Jin narrowed his eyes and continued with a forced smile, TSK TSK. Lord Aizen, do we really want to fight this monster? At this moment, Tozen can aim rarely interrupted. As for other Espadas, it's almost the same idea as Ikimaru Jin. With this kind of strength, attacking the Soul Society is tantamount to suicide. This time, Aizen wasn't to blame. He suppressed the uneasiness in his heart and said with a smile, It's okay, I have a way to seal Captain Commander Zanpakuto. Since Aizen says it can, it will do. Then everyone felt at ease and continued to watch. Screen continues, the terrifying spiritual pressure returned to Yamamoto's body, and all the flames around him disappeared. In his hand, there is only a sword full of scorch marks, and the rest is the same as a normal Zanpakuto. Seeing this, the head of the Sternritter on the side is a little disappointed. This Bankai, which seems to have no aura or power, seems to be a little weak. But at this time, Yawach had a solemn expression on his face, telling him not to underestimate the enemy. Then he opens Shukai release. It turns out that the Zanka no Tachi is Bankai, which took all the flames of Yamamoto Shigakuni back to the blade. It is a sword that can completely burn out anything it hits in the form of a pyrotechnic explosion. It can be said that once it is waved, everything ends. Hearing Yawach's evaluation, Yamamoto said meaningfully, You saw this Bankai once a thousand years ago. But whether the Bankai you know is the same as the current Bankai, let your body experience it for yourself. At the same time, the temperature in the entire Soul Society is rising rapidly, and all the captains feel that the water is rapidly evaporating. Uno Hanaretsu explained that if the Captain Commander's Bankai is used for too long, the entire Soul Society will be destroyed by the high temperature. In the conference room, Toshiro, Bayakuya, and other captains ignored why Uno Hanaretsu knew about the Captain Commander's Bankai and couldn't help but look at the Captain Commander who was sitting in the first place. It is really difficult for them to associate this terrifying power with the old man in front of them. Just using Bankai for too long destroys the Soul Society. This kind of strength is afraid that their all other division captains together will not be the opponent of the Captain Commander. Screen continues, after Bankai, Yamamoto used Shunpa and came to Yawach almost instantly. But with the sword it just pierced the opponent's black cloak. Yawach's face is puzzled and he begins to think quickly in his heart. According to the experience of a thousand years ago, this sword will explode with a terrifying fire, and Yawach will never be able to hide so easily. Could it be that the Bankai of the other party has really changed? However, no matter how it changes, there is no Bankai of Zanpakuto in this world that has nothing to do with Shirkai. He is sure that Yamamoto Shigakuni's Bankai ability is still aflame. But where did the disappearing flames go? Just when Yawach was puzzled, Yamamoto attacked again and swung out a sword. At the critical moment, Yawach once again used his ability to escape. The next scene of horror appears. I saw that when the Captain Commander's sword slashed across the ground, the ground instantly cracked. No. Not cracking, but vanishing to nothing. On the earth, a huge crack like an abyss, full of scorch marks appeared. This casual sword shocked countless viewers. This kind of power, this temperature, they can't think of how to defend. In the world of Hokage, Uchiha Madara can't think of any other way to resist this blow than to dodge. As for Abito, it's not that he is not confident, but from the situation in the picture, it is estimated that he will be cut off with a sword instantly. At this moment, Yawach suddenly realized. Seeing each other's eyes, the captain said lightly, as you can imagine, this is Bankai that concentrates all the heat of the flame on the tip of the sword. But unlike the Sword of Fire a thousand years ago, it neither burns nor releases fire explosions. 
just use almost infinite heat to eliminate everything you touch without a trace. It is an attack that concentrates all power in one point. It's called Zenka no Tachi East, Kaioku Jitsujin. Yamamoto looked at Yawach with a sneer, in front of this sword, even a still blood outfit is useless. Yawach still has a calm face, with a chuckle at the corner of his mouth, it's boring, what is the strongest attack, as long as it doesn't kill you without touching the sword. Having said that, Yawach wielded the black crossblade of destruction and launched an attack. But the next scene completely subverted Yawach's cognition. The blade that slashed at Yamamoto Shigakuni was neither blocked nor broken. Instead, disappeared out of thin air. Only a broken blade is left in the hands of Yawach. At this moment, not only Yawach in the video is puzzled, but all the viewers are extremely confused. What happened in the scene just now? At this time, there is a sound on the screen. Naive, don't you understand what the old man said? The chief captain shows a sly smile, the residual fire is too big to the east. Since there is an east, there must be a west. No way, since that's the case, let you see it, the next moment, an extremely terrifying flame erupted from Yamamoto. No. It should be said that it became visible. These flames are rolling and rushing, and they are draped on Yamamoto like armor. At this time, the cold voice of Yamamoto sounded again, this is, the residual fire is too big. Nishi, Zanjitsu Goki. At this moment, the captain commander, Yamamoto blazed like a god of fire. As for why Yawacha's blade disappears, it's because, the flames enveloping him, soaring to heights of 15 million degrees, can dissolve everything in an instant. After hearing Yamamoto Shigakuni's own explanation, all viewers around the world fell into silence. In many modern worlds, it is known that the sun's surface temperature is only 6,000 degrees, while its core reaches a scorching 15 million degrees. This means that at this very moment, Yamamoto Genryusai is akin to wearing the sun itself. Even if you weren't aware of this, the numbers alone would stagger you. Even the ant king Maruam, who had survived a small nuclear blast, didn't perish instantly because he had escaped to a location far from the epicenter of the explosion. And even there, the temperature only reached hundreds of thousands of degrees. To put it bluntly, even with the Ant King's defenses, if the old man gets close or strikes him with his blade, he would meet his demise. At this moment, even Saitama in the One Punch world displayed a serious expression. Although the opponent would undoubtedly be unable to match him in terms of speed, this ultimate attack still posed a substantial threat. Even without knowing the specifics, one could be certain of suffering a massive loss. In the world of Demon Slayer, Muzan had curled up in an exceedingly dark corner. Simply watching the video was unbearable, he felt his end approaching. In Soul Society, every Shinigami, in addition to being awestruck, felt their blood boiling. They had never known their captain commander possessed such incredible power, this was the true essence of a Shinigami. In an instant, Soul Society's morale was at its peak. The captains were elated but also somewhat puzzled. They could sense that the flames were the captain commander's riatsu from the opening, so how could such a mighty captain meet his end? But there was also the possibility that the captain commander perished alongside the individual with the terrifying riatsu on the black screen. This also aligned with the title. However, with this video, perhaps the captain could find a solution, sparing him from a grim fate. The screen continues, upon hearing the figure of 15 million, the leader of the knights, has walled, deemed it impossible. Because if it were genuinely 15 million degrees, it couldn't be seen with the naked eye from such a close distance. Haswald wondered if this was an illusion. But he quickly dismissed his conjecture. He realized that what he saw wasn't actual flames but rather Yamamoto Shigakuni's riatsu, intensified to the point of materialization. At this moment, the man before him possessed the most formidable offense and absolute defense. At this point, Yawach, his eyes dry and throat hoarse due to the gradual evaporation of bodily fluids, felt as if his legs were encased in lead before the captain commander who resembled a god of fire. Why, can't you do anything with your shattered blade? The captain commander clutched the residual fire sword, advancing slowly toward Yawach, his intent to kill palpable as he declared, you can try to escape, but I'll seize you immediately and end you. With those words, the captain commander's voice trailed off, and Yawach's pupils shrank, his face contorted in anger. 
With a tug of his hands, he summoned a brilliant blue sacred destruction, firing an immensely colossal spiritual arrow. Yet the captain commander casually waved it away, causing it to dissipate instantaneously. Then, the captain commander revealed a grim white fang and spoke coldly, Indeed, your sword is shattered, leaving you with nothing but a bow and arrows. Following these words, the captain commander erupted in Ryatsu once more, slashing towards Yawach. Seemingly provoked by this remark, Yawach extended his left hand and roared indignantly, don't think that Quincy tactics are limited to the cross of extinction and divine destruction. Yawach gathered spiritual particles and produced several spells within the palm of his hand. Suddenly, numerous massive blue Ryatsu beams of light materialized, their tips resembling delicate ice crystals, ultimately forming a colossal fortress radiating a myriad of lights around Yawach. Holy Sing! Sanctuary Praise! This was an extraordinarily potent Quincy master technique, combining offense and defense. Anyone who stepped into this fortress would be submerged and annihilated by countless sacred destructions. However, even this did not halt the captain's advance. I told you, it won't work. With a resounding roar. The captain leaped into the air, then descended like a shooting star, thrusting Zanpakuto into the ground. In an instant, a multitude of spirits emerged from the depths of the earth. At that moment, except for a few viewers outside the screen, the rest felt the throbbing and fear that emanated from the soul. Moments later, Yamamoto Genryusai's aged and formidable voice echoed. Undead, revel in the joy of battle for now. The residual fire shall smolder. Zanka no Tachi, Minami, Kaka Jumano Kushi Dezojin. As his voice faded, it felt as though hell itself had descended. The earth convulsed, and countless grotesque charred skeletons struggled to claw their way out from the ground. These undead, once vanquished by Ryujin Jaka, had returned from death as enslaved minions, roaring and launching an assault on Yawach. In the world of Shinigami, there is silence in the palace of Hueco Mundo. At this moment, even with what Aizen said before, the Espadas were a little uneasy. No, it cannot be said to be feeling uneasy. It should be fear. Because if the seal fails, their fate will only be a dead end, no one. It may not even be called a battle at that time, it will be a one-sided slaughter. At this time, even Ulquiora, who can return to the second stage, has to admit that he is not the enemy of the captain commander at all. So Kayaku Hill, meeting room. Everyone was numb except for Unohana Retsu and Zaraki Kenpachi. Even his own disciple, Kairaku Shunsue. The captain commander refreshed their three views time and time again. And then look at the captain commander who is still sitting in the first place with an expressionless face. Captains such as Bayakuya, this moment cannot help but give birth to the strange idea. In the final analysis, the strength of the captain commander is no longer in the same dimension as the others. Screen continues, looking at thousands of countless charred black skeletons who were once Quincy, they rushed towards him. Yawach laughed. It's ridiculous, as the leader of Shinigami, but to awaken the dead, I really underestimate the despicability of your Shinigami, Yamamoto Shigakuni. But this kind of power alone can't stop me. After speaking, Yawach intends to kill the captain commander. However, before he could meet the other party, he was blocked by the surging Skull Mountain. These skeletons exude a terrifying aura, grabbing Yawach's body tightly and crawling towards his head. Suddenly, Yawach discovered that the skeleton crawling on top was actually his former subordinate. For a time, he was choked by the dead undead subordinates, and he actually broke out in a cold sweat. The captain commander slowly moved his footsteps and coldly questioned Yawach, at this moment, are you regretting it? You regret not taking my bankai immediately. But I know, it's not that you don't want to take it, but you can't take it. If I guessed correctly, you can only take away Bankai of which you know the power of. And I have never shown Bankai in thousands of years, you can't take away what you don't know. At this moment, the captain commander once again raised the charge Zanpakuto. It's over, Yawach. You may hate me. But now everything will end. Zenka no Tachi, Kida, Tenchi Kaijin. At this moment, an unprecedented huge Ryatsu came, and the entire Soul Society lost its voice and color. This blade is a true world-altering event. And at the end of the blade, Yawach was cut in half. 
With such a scene, Soul Society suddenly fell silent. At this moment in the eyes of countless Shinigami, the sky that just lost its color was reflected, unable to extricate themselves. In the Sokayaku Hill Conference Room, the captains were dry-mouthed at this moment. Kairaku Shunsue pressed the brim of his hat, and his heartbeat gradually began to calm down. Is he dead, as expected of the captain commander, such a big crisis was easily resolved. But he suddenly glanced, and found that his teacher did not have the slightest joy, but was extremely solemn. What happened? Kairaku Shunsue's heart was pounding again, and there was an inexplicable feeling of panic. In the hidden empire, Yawach finally got emotional, the corners of his mouth twitched, and he laughed unabashedly. Hearing the laughter, all the members of the Star Cross Knights knelt on the ground and buried their heads at this moment, daring not to look at it. The mighty power covers your eyes. Yamamoto Shigakuni. The power, isn't it enough? I'm really sorry, Yawach sama. At this moment, Yawach, who collapsed on the ground, is actually apologizing. Not only did the captain commander not understand this move, but even Hashwalf, who was standing beside him, was confused. At the same time, all viewers are also extremely confused. But the next moment, a huge explosion sounded from the screen. An extremely terrifying explosion occurred in the first team building, and a huge blue beam of light composed entirely of spirits shot up into the sky. At the same time, a Ryatsu, who is no weaker than the captain commander, descends. The captain commander looks back. He saw a shadow standing in the air, the black cloak rattled, it was Yawach. And the previous Yawach who was cut into two sections turned into another person. This person is the holy character Y, Lloyd Lloyd, whose ability is called yourself. Can completely imitate a person's appearance, memory, and psychology. This is also the reason why he appeared in front of the captain commander, and the captain commander didn't notice it. Seeing that his subordinates are about to die, Yawach stepped forward and looked down calmly, you did very well. But the moment the voice fell, Yawach condensed a small sacred destruction with his fingertips, blasting Lloyd into flying ashes. The captain commander is a little unbelievable, this man is so cold-blooded to his subordinates. You shameless person, what have you been doing so far? Yawach sneered, and then asked back, what to do? Don't you know what's under the first team? The voice falls, the camera changes. Under the first team, there is a large underground prison in Sokayaku Hill, and there is a person whose mouth, nose, eyes, and body are all sealed. This man went to meet Aizen Sosuke. Inside the palace, Aizen burst out with an amazing Ryatsu, and his mood was extremely unstable at this time. And under this Ryatsu, all Espadas are on one knee. So, did I lose? But after a while, Aizen suddenly retracted Ryatsu and returned to his seat with a smile. No, it's just the beginning. After realizing that the one who just beheaded was not the real Yawach, the Captain Commander Bankai rushed to the opponent again. However, Yawach did not draw his sword. He took out a completely different black star from his arms. The black Ryatsu is flowing, and Bankai of the Captain Commander is not spared this time. Yawach said with a smile, it's not that your Bankai can't be captured, it's just that your power is so powerful that only I can control it. The next second, the terrifying Ryatsu descends from Yawach. A huge and incomparable divine destruction appeared in the sky, shooting slash shooting a spiritual arrow compressed to ultimate in front of Yawach. Farewell, Yamamoto Shigakuni. The next second, Yawach pulled out the spiritual arrow and waved it gently. The space seems to freeze under the huge Ryatsu, and the radiance of the spiritual arrow seems to have no end at a glance, and it instantly kills the captain commander. Among the ruins, Yamamoto Shigakuni, whose power was taken away, was cut off. His upper body falls to the ground. But his lower body is still standing on the ground. As if it will never fall. At this moment, all the Shinigami couldn't believe this scene. If even the captain commander can't stop this person, then is there any way to save the soul society? The Siriidei, meeting room. The captains could not accept this picture. This ability to take away Bankai makes no sense at all. Shinigami's fight is Ryatsu's fight, and Bankai increases Ryatsu dozens of times. If no solution is found, the outcome will still not change. The lowered eyebrows of Yamamoto Shigakuni, who was sitting in the first place, 
finally opened, and the old voice was steady and powerful, remove Central 46 power, revoke Kisuk Urahara's wanted notice, and recall him to the Technology Development Bureau. With this video, he is not afraid that Kisuk Urahara will not come back. And the equipment inside the Technology Development Bureau is much more advanced. Swayfong pursed her lips and said nothing, and then heard the commander say, at the same time, fully supply resources and make sure to create another Hugyoku. As for Shunsue Kairaku. After the video, you go to Hueco Mundo. After the order was issued, all the captains stood up at the same time and bowed their heads. Yes, Captain Commander. And there is a saying that Yamamoto Shigakuni did not say, that is, he needs to go to the Soul King Palace once, and that person should have the same idea. The screen is completely dark. The next three words appear. Soul King Palace. When it brightens up again, a huge golden cylindrical object floats in the air. Yawacha's figure reappeared, and in front of him was a somewhat comical monk sitting on the ground holding a huge brush. And Yawacha's mouth slightly raised, and he spoke slowly, then, can you let me pass? Ichibai Hayasu. In the Shinigami world, the captains looked extremely gloomy. Having already reached the palace of the Soul King, doesn't that mean that the Soul Society has completely fallen? While scratching his back with a brush, the monk stood up lazily and said impatiently, it's so casual to call my name, I don't care if my throat is burned. The voice falls, and the monk draws a huge seal in the air with a wave of his brush. Thousands of miles of heavenly palms. The next moment, a huge riatsu turned into a bergamot that covered the sky and appeared in front of Yawach. At this moment, the pressure generated by the bergamot actually distorted the surrounding space, knocking Yawach out like a fly. In the terrifying air pressure, Yawach opened his mouth to start singing, but his throat was burned by the friction of the air in an instant. I said it, I don't care if my throat burns. Speaking, the monk slammed Yawach into the ground with a smile. But immediately Yawach put his finger in his throat and used his ability to give himself a voice. And immediately chanted, created a big holy bow in the air, and shot a huge spiritual arrow towards himself and the monk above who were suppressed by the palm wind. In the end, he successfully escaped the suppression of the Buddha's palm with the help of the spiritual arrow that penetrated his chest. In Soul Society, all Shinigami's eyes suddenly lit up. Unexpectedly, Yawach was suppressed at the beginning of the battle, and even self-mutilated to escape. Seeing this monk's eyes turn white and lose his pupils, he exuded endless killing intent. Yawach pulls out the cross blade of destruction and wants to counterattack, and the monk also waves a huge brush at the same time. At the moment when the two weapons crossed, the terrifying Ryatsu of the two swept the entire Soul King Palace and stopped all Shinigami and Quincy who were still fighting. As if to tell everyone that this is a battle that no one can intervene. At this time, the monk jumped slightly, the huge brush was extremely flexible and pointed towards Yawach again. Because the brush is a blunt weapon, Yawach didn't think much about it and just blocked it with his arm. Looking at the brush that was easily removed by himself, Yawach laughed, is it only to this extent? But at this time, the monk looked solemn, my pen doesn't cut flesh, but name. Your arm has been cut off. At this time, Yawach found that his arms became extremely heavy. Monk continued, half the muscle, half the strength, your arm can only do half of what it was before. Afterwards, the monk used a writing brush to divide the combat strength friend Yawach into two. Of course, this also kills the name, and now the full strength of Yawach is only half of the previous one. However, Yawach doesn't seem to be afraid of losing half of his power. The next second, Yawach once again gave himself the power that was cut off. This scene makes all Shinigami despair, this Quincy named Yawach seems to have no weakness, and will never even be hurt. Looking at the monk's surprised eyes, Yawach laughed, no one can take anything from me, even everything exists to be taken away by me. But the monk scratched his head, didn't care at all, and attacked again. Kido no, iron wind kill. This is a Kido that belongs to Team Zero alone. In an instant, a hurricane like a cyan dragon roared towards Yawach. At the same time, at the moment when Yawach resisted the Qinglong, the monk used Shunpa to come to him and stretched out his arm to grab it. However, at this time, the blue-white still blood suit grew out of Yawach's body, wrapped around the monk's arm, and devoured it. There is anger in the monk's eyes, 
and after ignoring the injury and cutting off Yawach's throat, he jumps back and falls to the ground. Quiet annihilation in a mere area, stepped into the Soul King Palace, and also stepped into the body of the Zero Team. It's unforgivable. The monk waved his brush. Dye it black. A text. At the moment when the monk recited the moving words, the entire Soul King Palace and Soul Society were covered by its Ryatsu.